I'm Joey Hargis, and I'll be presenting the cases for review in today's public hearing. I would ask at this time if you would either uh, turn off or put on silent your cell phones. Uh, quite truthfully, you probably have really poor reception in this room anyway, so you're just eating your battery up. Um, so probably better just turn it off. The um, procedure will be to the uh, Coast Department. I'm representing the Coast Department. We'll, uh, we'll present our uh, presentation first on the, on the panel here by means of a PowerPoint presentation. We'll present any letters in support or opposition to a case, as well as any correspondence from other metro agencies. At the conclusion of my presentation, the applicant comes first to the table, along with any persons in support for a case. After the applicant has spoken, if there's opposition present, the board will hear from those parties opposed. And then after the opposition's done speaking, the applicant does have a period to come back and rebut any testimony that the opposition's done. Um, now in that, there are, there are time limits uh, to testimony, and the board allows in their rules cases without opposition, applicants have 10 minutes to present their case. And in cases with opposition, the board provides 15 minutes for each side of a case, and that's 15 minutes per side, not per person. So if you have multiple speakers, please divide your time uh, now before you come up here. As you sit here before the board to your right, right beside Miss um, Wolfter over there, on the end is a clock, and that'll keep track of your time. The clock will start uh, with your, after you've identified yourself, it'll, it'll run through any testimony. It will be stopped if the board has a question for you, and it'll be stop for your answer to that question. Uh, once you've started back in the testimony, we'll restart that clock. Applicants, as I talked about at the beginning, um, you do have a rebuttal period, and out of that 15 minutes you're allotted, you will want to save some of that 15, so uh, please monitor your time accordingly. If you would like a rebuttal, please save some of your 15 minutes. And if you'll just let the chairman or myself know during your testimony how much you'd like to save at the end, or if you Obviously, you're going to have some time left over. We'll reserve the balance for your rebuttal. All section numbers I refer to today come directly from the Metropolitan Zoning Code, which is Title 17 of the Metro Code of Law. Title 17 was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective on January 1, 1998, and applies to the entire jurisdiction of Metro government. I'll introduce and make a part of the record the entire zoning code, a copy of which is at my desk, and I'll dispense from reading individual sections unless the applicant or opposition requests that I read those sections. The zoning code requires that these proceedings are taped. Therefore, it's imperative anyone wishing to address this board to please come forward. I do have four seats at the table. Identify yourself and make your presentation. It should be noted that it's found if anyone's presented false or misleading testimony to this board that affects the board's decision, any approval may be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing. The board will go through all cases set for public hearing today, and after each case, the board will discuss and vote on that case. The board is vested with the power to act on these cases before us as outlined in section 1740-180 of the Metro Code of Law. The code requires that four members of our seven-member board be present to constitute a quorum. The code also uh, requires that you have four affirmative votes to grant your application. Um, currently, I have four members present, so you need all four of these gentlemen's votes to approve your case today. In the event you fail to get four votes today, and only these four members participate, your uh, case will automatically be reset for a new public hearing. Uh, new advertisements will be sent and you will appear on a new agenda at a later date. Currently that date um, that hearing will be scheduled um, August the 21st of this year, August 21st. The delay in that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this meeting space in which you're sitting uh, is utilized as our early voting site here in Davidson County, so we do not have access to any meeting space uh, or any sort of meeting space. I'll continue to work with the um, General Services Department on locating a, an alternative venue. If I can find that, I'll reschedule it uh, sooner than that. But currently we're scheduled for the 21st of August. What happened to the old Green Hills room on Murfreesboro Road? It is, it is also reserved for early voting. Uh, the Election Commission actually is out in, in Southeast, Metro Southeast, and utilizes that room for their function uh, for all elections. But this is an, the downtown early voting site. 
And mm-hmm. so I'll, I will continue to work on those dates. If I am able to achieve a location, uh, your case could be scheduled sooner. But I'll obviously we'll be in contact with all parties and public notices will be sent. But until such time, if you fail to get four affirmative votes and you only have four members present here, your case will be scheduled for that August 21st hearing again. If in the event our fifth member uh, arrives and he participates in your case and you have five members present, uh, you will need, again, four affirmative votes to grant your application. If by chance we have a tie vote, either two, four, or three against, or three, four, and two against, uh, your case will actually stay on our agenda for the next two meetings. We are back in a somewhat regular cycle of meeting. Um, We will have meetings again on June the 19th and July 3rd. Your case will stay on both of those agendas. Any of these five members present can change their vote. The other two members who are not present can watch today's tape. Uh, can look at all the paper record and become eligible to participate and then vote on your case at the next hearing. So in the event you have a tie vote and you only have five members hearing your case, uh, your case will stay on our agenda for the next meeting. It will be taken at the beginning of the the following meeting and so you will not have to sit all day waiting for those cases to clear off the agenda. Okay. Uh, The applicant or any aggrieved property owner may request a rehearing of this board within 60 days of today's public hearing. Further, the applicant or any aggrieved property owner may appeal this board's decision to Chancery or Circuit Court within the same 60-day period, but once that 60 days has elapsed, this board's decision is final and no further action may be taken. If you're an applicant and your case is granted today, it is necessary for you to come and pick up the permit for which you've applied. You can, uh, should be noted that you have two years from today's date to obtain your permit. If by chance you get approved today and you just forget to come get your permit and two years rolls around, I will be contacting you uh, to uh, come back before this board and seek reapproval. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I submit that all cases were filed in proper order. Applicants were notified by certified mails required by the zoning code. All affected property owners within 300 feet were notified by first class mail, and a legal ad was published in the Tennessean as required by the code. Uh, before I begin any preliminary announcements, the board does allow elected officials to address this board uh, before we get started today. Are there any elected uh, individuals who'd wish to address the board today? Okay. Mr. Chairman, saying that, I guess. I guess they're all hanging out at Fanfare downtown. So. Okay. The, uh, I do have one preliminary announcement, and it deals with the first case on our agenda, the Perfecting Faith uh, Ministry Church. Uh, this case was deferred until the meeting of April 3rd uh, at, at our last hearing that we had two hearings ago. Uh, In that case, we had only four members participate. The fourth of those members are not present today, which would normally mean I cannot have a hearing. However, uh, we did discuss at that hearing that if we had this event occurred, we would have a new hearing today. And and this board and myself are willing to proceed uh, with a brand new hearing dealing with these four members, uh, potentially five if he arrives in time, to hear your case. Um, So I have that announcement today. if, Mr. Chairman, if that works for you guys. Uh, all parties in that case, I know this was a deferred case, and I see many of the faces here today. In your testimony today, do not refer to, at the last meeting I said, because these gentlemen may not have been there, so be sure when we testify to this case today, we're talking as though these folks have not heard this before, okay? Um, so we will treat this as a new case, and then these gentlemen present your testimony to just like, you know, Things you said from last time, do bring those into your testimony, but please don't refer to them in the, you know, last time I said or those types of things because obviously these gentlemen may not have been here. Um, Mr. Chairman, I recommend we do that for expediency to all parties. Um, The alternative would be we would have to defer this case until the next hearing. Hopefully I'll get the four members who participated last time all here. I think it's better for all parties involved that we come to a hearing today, potentially a resolution. Um, Mr. Chairman, that's all I have as far as administrative issues uh, with you today. Um, Members of the board, I will tell you that we do have, uh, back on a somewhat regular cycle, we do have a very large agenda next meeting on the 19th. And we do have a hearing before the 4th of July on July 3, and that will be our last meeting until August 21st. Again, unless I can locate 
a acceptable alternative space for us to use. Okay. With that, the um, board has a consent agenda. A board member reviews the record in each case in today's hearings, and if, in their opinion, the applicant meets the criteria for the application they've requested and they feel that testimony in the case would not alter material facts, they recommend the case to the remainder of the board for approval. I'll now enter into the record those cases that have been recommended by Chairman Whitson. And if you are here in opposition to any of the cases I call, and only opposition, please raise your hand and I'll remove the case from consent and we'll hear it on its regular order on today's agenda. And the first case recommended for consent agenda is case on page two, middle of page two, case 2014-34, Brooke Usher and Henry and Marsha Usher, uh, owners of the property at 510 East Bend Drive, requesting a variance in side setback in R8 to allow the construction of a new carport to the side of the existing single family residence. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 34 on East Bend? Case 34, final call. Mr. Chairman, seeing none. The uh, narrowness of the lot necessitates the need for a hardship in this case, and you recommend this case to the remaining members of the board for approval. The uh, next case recommended for the consent agenda is at the top of page three. Case 2000. Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you. I, I did have that note. Uh, the applicant on case 34, the condition is that this carport may must remain open. Is the applicant present or the applicant's representative case 34? I'm pretty sure he is because I talked to him right before the hearing. I'll make sure that that's included. Um, Again, for the record, case 34 is with the condition that this carport is to remain open and not be converted to a garage. It's to remain open. The uh, next case, case 2014, again, at the top of page 3, 2014-30 Franciscan Construction, LLC applicant Karen Vickers, the owner of the property located at 2121 12th Avenue South, requesting an item D. It's a addition to a non-conforming residence to construct a new second floor addition to the rear of the detached single family and a new addition to the uh, front of the detached single family. Is there any parties present in opposition to case 36 or have questions or concerns? On case 36, uh, 2121 12th Avenue South. 2121 12th Avenue South. I'll get the uh, volume turned up in here, sir. Sorry about that. Anyone, not, anyone else there at the rear not able to hear me? Case 36, seeing none. This is a, an existing um, non-conforming second residence on the lot. Uh, the request is to add a second floor addition to this building. And with that, this board recommends um, approval of this case. Okay, the uh, next case recommended for consent uh, is at the top of page four. 2014-40, Mark Harbin, the appellant, Leco LLC, the owner of the property located at 1120 Menzler Road, requesting variances in provisions two through four in the IR district. Uh, this appeal comes to you as a use of a 25,000 square foot, 269 square foot portion of an existing building for a recycling facility. Um, this case was approved in 2012 um, by this board with a uh, condition and a stipulation that it was for an 18-month period only. Members, that 18 months has expired uh, or is about to expire, and this gentleman's approached you to renew the permit without said condition. This is referred to the board under section 1716.110, D2 through 4. Are there any parties present in opposition or have questions or concerns? Case 40 on Mensler Road. Final call? Mr. Chairman, seeing none. Um, you recommend approval with that. Uh, the same order will be entered uh, with any and all conditions from last time but for the 18 month provision. Okay, the uh, next case recommended for consent will be at the top of page five. 
Ms. Sharon Piggott, the applicant, Richard Kidd, the owner of the property located at 120 MacArthur Ridge Court, requesting a variance in the side setback in RS 7.5 to construct a 194 square foot addition to the side of the existing residence. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 43? Case 43, any opposition? Seeing none, the uh, irregular shape of the property and narrowness of the lot are the hardships in this case and necessitate a need for variance. And finally, uh, Chairman Whitson recommends case 2014-44 at the bottom of page 5. Mark Hayes, the appellant, Mary Bates, trustee, the owner of the property at 5616 Morrow Road, requesting a variance in street setback to construct a new two-story single-family residence. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 44? Present. Okay, we do have some folks here in opposition. We'll hear that case in its regular order. And you are opposition, not the applicant? Okay, Good. I just want to make sure. Okay, Mr. Chairman, for the uh, benefit of the record and those present, the following cases have been recommended by you and a motion made to consent the following cases, 34, 36, 40, 41, and 43. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? I have a question. Sure. Excuse me. It's okay. If a board member voted in opposition to one of the cases as his own consent today, can no. It? Well, if, if you're opposed to a case being on consent, we'll hear it in its regular order. No, I'm, I'm just going to vote. No, uh, can I go on the record voting no against the case? Without, I don't want to hear it. There's no point in hearing it. So. No, sir. Our, our rules: if if there's any no vote to a consent item, we'll need to hear it in its regular order. He could abstain. Right? You could abstain. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll do okay. the abstaining route. The abstention. Which case would you like to abstain from, sir? That would be uh, 2014-41. 41. Okay. Record rule flag. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 40. 40. 40. Number 40. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, only because I had voted in opposition to that first go round. In the prior case. Consistent with that. That's okay. Fine. No problem. Mr. Harper, you are obviously now in the room present. Um, you would be our fifth <coughs> uh, vote in that. Do you have any oppositions to case 40? I know you came in just to shout late. Okay, seeing none, um, members, that is your consent agenda with the notation on case 40. So case? that I'll second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have a motion, we have a second. All in favor of the consent agenda with one abstention uh, on one okay. case? Okay. Passes. Okay, if you're, here. if you're here for cases 34, 36, 40, 41, and 40. Three. Your cases have been approved. Uh, you are free to go. Be sure to follow up with the Coach Department beginning on Monday to obtain the permit for which you've applied. Uh, you're also welcome to stay with the rest of us if you like. Uh, okay. That's not okay. Always offer. No one ever takes me up on that offer. <laughs> ever. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll begin uh, today's hearing, and, and I'll call the applicants in the case, case 2014-31. Uh, if the applicants will come present, come forward. Any parties in support? Pastor. Um, as, as they take their seats, I'll read into the record the case before you. It's case 2014-31. Uh, Perfecting Faith Ministry Church is the appellant and owner of the property located at 210 Battle Road, requesting a special exception in the AR2A zoning district to use a portion of the church for a daycare center for 75 children. Referred to the board under section 1716-170C, the applicant have alleged the board would have jurisdiction under section 1740-180, item C. Again, as I talked about, uh, all parties here present on this case, this is a new hearing. Um, and we will proceed as, as, uh, as such. And if, if you don't mind, I'll step back to my table and I'll pull up the photographs and such and display those to the board and then I'll turn it over to you guys. There is opposition present, Mr. Kibbett. We'll have uh, 15 minutes on each side. And for the folks in the back of the room, is there an image displayed on those television screens above your head? I was afraid of that. Mm, 
we have been absent from these premises for about seven weeks now. So um, let's see if I can get those synced up for you. If not, if those do not come up, uh, please, if you would, uh, direct your attention to the front of the room. Drop for the folks on television. I'm going to drop the lights up front just a little bit. Good? Good. We're in the back. Okay. The lights are going to come back up. This is the um, subject property in question. It's uh, on case 2014-31. Again, Perfecting Faith Ministry Church. It is in the AR2A zone district. Uh, typically, this board hears cases for new constructions or new churches in a, in a zone district. AR2A is one of the um, unique zone districts where this board has uh, does not review the constructions of a church. So, remember, sitting here, you may be, I don't recall this church. You would not have seen it. Uh, AR2A permits churches as a matter of right in the zoning district. This is the uh, aerial photograph from approximately a year ago showing the um, subject property in the church facility on the site. The request by the applicants is to use a portion of this church for a daycare center as a class 3 daycare center for 75 children. The zoning code describes institutional uses such as churches and schools and daycare center, I mean excuse me, community centers as being preferred locations under the zoning code um, for daycare facilities at which part normally access would be required off of Old Hickory uh, and not on Battle Road. So for clarification purposes, that is why there's not a variance off of Battle for the driveway. This is the subject site, and the proposed um, playground area would be located, I believe, off this wing of the church. Is that correct, Pastor? Okay. They are providing a fence playground in this area, referring back to the aerial photograph. That structure would be the portion used playground located here. Uh, parking areas that you've seen off front, this site plan's a, a little dated, shows a proposed parking addition that does exist now on the ground. Um, again, showing some photographs of the subject property looking from their entrance on battle into the subject site. These are the parking areas that you saw on the site plan. Um, <coughs> playground areas would be located to the rear of this structure. Here. I'm going to leave the uh, site plan up. Uh, members of the board, for the record, we have received members. You should have in your packet a copy of a um, petition. If you don't, I'm going to pass that around to you. Uh, this it was emailed to the board members, and I believe Miss Hughes should have sent that over to you. If not, I'm going to send you the the official one over to you. Uh, we received one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven letters in opposition, one letter in support from the district council person. Um, the Public Works Department takes no exception to the request, um, and the Planning Commission had um, recommended approval subject to satisfying all the conditions. Uh, the existing tree line, their conditions, they recommend the existing tree line shall be maintained and supplemented where necessary to a C standard buffer. Uh, again, the urban forester's here. If you'd like to have any questions about landscape buffers, he can, an expert can answer those questions to you. Uh, with that, again, members, I'll turn this case over to you guys. Um, gentlemen, to your right will be the, the time clock that you'll have there. The uh, buttons in front of you, it should be a, the far right button on each of the microphone buttons. If you'll hit that, there you go. Turn your mics on. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. The clock will begin after you identify yourselves. There is um, opposition present, again, uh, for opposition or any uh, appellants. Um, be sure to divide up your time before coming before the board. With that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you all. Okay. My name is Dale Jones. I'm the senior pastor of Perfecting Faith Ministries, and um, we're, we're requesting this um, this variance today because our parishioners would like to have the daycare at our location. Um, we have currently the allowance of 450 people there at our church Sunday mornings. Obviously, we have about 400 people showing up. Um, and that allowance is not restricted to Sundays. It's, it's for any day during the week. Um, during the week, we currently have about 20 people showing up on site at any given time. So we have the allowance for 450. On a weekly basis, um, we, we see about 20 people. Uh, the increase of 75 
uh, if, if you would um, look at 75 individuals coming to that location uh, in the morning and leave in the afternoon, that'll take it up to about 95 um, folks coming in. Again, we have the allowance for 450. Um, and we, we have uh, met with um, our community and, and spoke about um, this opportunity for our church. And we have listened, and quite frankly, uh, we understand their concern, and their primary concern is the traffic. Um, but we, st we fail to understand the logic between Sunday morning with, with um, 400 people and Monday through Friday with um, 90 cars coming in that area. Um, currently, they, they, they do have some issues. But if you look at um, the, the chart which we have, um, coming off of um, Hickory, Old Hickory, and going on to Battle Road, we are the first um, driveway. And so you come on and you go into our uh, sanctuary or into on, onto our parking lot, it is the first driveway. You don't go further down. Now, you, you may have people coming from Burkhead, uh, from Burkhead going on to um, Battle Road. That is a possibility, but the majority of our, our folks um, are coming down um, from that road. Uh, the proposal for, from the community is that we consider um, coming off of Old Hickory onto, um, onto our property. Um, that is quite cost prohibitive for us to do that at this point. Um, and we've gotten quotes, uh, it's upwards of um, almost $70,000 to do that. Because a part of um, uh, what will have to happen once we do that, we would have to do also a walkway or sidewalk along that, that uh, path as well, which is a requirement. Uh, we propose that um, for, for people that are leaving um, our location, uh, that we put up a sign to have them to exit to the left rather than going down um, Battle Road, that they'll come out from our facility and exit to the left so that they'll they'll flow right back into Old Hickory. I think um, most people will comply with that. And again, it will not in interfere with, with the community as again, we're the, we're the first driveway coming into Battle Road. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Philip Hammonds. I was here at the initial meeting. Um, prior to that meeting, we did have a scheduled uh, community meeting. We notified uh, those that we were required to um, minimal attendance, but uh, Councilman Duvall was present. Uh, he was in support. We uh, talked to him and um, one other neighbor in terms of uh, what the plans were, what the expectations were, you know, to hear any concerns. Um, as a as Pastor said, um, you know, in both, we had a second meeting. Um, it was a recommendation of the board, and we felt it necessary. Our assault and opposition that was here uh, wanted to come together again. So we had a second meeting uh, to hear those concerns, and we heard all of those. Um, we did the. Um, you know, looked into the cost of the second driveway, which again, with the restriction in terms of the landscaping, um, might sort of eliminate that option anyway, besides it being cost prohibitive uh, for us. But, um, you know, one of the things that came out of that meeting was the sign that might direct um, um, patrons leaving to exit left on Battle Road toward Old Hickory Boulevard. Also, one of the things that, um, that we found in terms of uh, our work to establish daycare was that if you look at the nearby subdivisions, they're already north of our church. And so a large majority of the community that we would serve um, would not even come up Battle Road from the Burkett Inn, uh, which would be south of our, our church. So um, Apple Valley, um, Cane Ridge Farms, and there are several other subdivisions on that side of Old Hickory Boulevard, which would probably make up the majority of our patrons for the uh, facility. But uh, we did, um, you know, again, uh, wanted to hear the concerns. We listened to those uh, very spirited, but I think very focused conversation. I think that uh, we've uh, addressed all of those as best our ability and feel confident that, um, you know, the accept we, this will add to the community and it's what the community needs. And I think that um, it will be definitely beneficial to the community as a whole and, um, and all that with respect to uh, some of the concerns of the opposition. I've got a quick question. Do you, um, you're asking for a permit or uh, 
for 75 children. And can you? And I think you said you have 450 folks that attend your services. And so, can you tell me how many children you have now, and why you chose 75? Some of the letters of opposition uh, state that you know they wish that we wouldn't grant this, but if we did, that you know we would lower the, the number of children allowed. Can you tell us how many children, wh why you need 75? Um, that number wasn't stipulated by us. It's according to uh, DHS and I believe the Marshal, Fire Marshal Code. And so 75 um, is, a, I believe, the standard maximum. Actually, once we um, have DHS come for final inspection, that number could be lessened um, due to the amount of furniture in the room. So uh, 75 is the absolute max based upon the square footage of our um, youth wing and uh, the proposed daycare. And how many children do you think initially you would have participate in this service? Um, I think on uh, any given um, Wednesday night service or a Sunday service, I think we're probably in the neighborhood of about 40 to 50 kids. I have a quick question uh, for our council. If, if you could just briefly tell us the standard uh, that, that we are using for this. Sorry, I totally missed the question. Asking you. Are you ignoring me? I was Sorry, asking if you could uh, if you could explain the standard by which we are uh, reviewing this today. Sure, it's it's actually listed as a, a special exception as opposed to variance. Which, if you go back to the code at uh, let's see, it's Title 17, Part 16, 150 gets into the general provisions of special exception reviews, and then specifically for daycare centers, that's codified a couple of sections over 17, 16, 170, subsection C as in cat daycare centers. There's uh, four defined classes of daycare centers, and the classes are defined by the number of children served or or schooled in that daycare center. This is class three, but between 51 and 75 individuals. Um, as has been accurately stated, 75 serves as a cap in that scenario, and depending on what uh, DHS, DCS, the state regulating agencies determine, it could be a lesser number than that. But 75 is that hard and fast top end number for this size, uh, class three of daycare center. Um, I have two questions. Are you willing to um, accept the conditions suggested by the planning department? In regards to the landscaping? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And then the second, um, I was involved with a school one time where they could only take a right. And what really helped was having a teacher at the end of the street to signal them to go left. And I love your sign idea. I think that's a great idea. But could you also have a teacher out there on a daily basis? Because it really does kind of create uh, a stigma to taking a right. So I, I don't, I mean, you've got, you've got employees there. I wonder if you could have somebody at the end of the road asking people to go left or watching. Sure, I don't, I don't see any problem with that at all. Okay, thank you. What would your proposed hours of operation be during the week? Uh, standard daycare hours typically from uh, 6 in the morning to um, 6 p.m. That Monday through Friday? Monday through Friday, or rather 6.30 a.m. to 6 p.m., excuse me. Do we have any other questions? Not present. Okay, then you've got eight minutes for rebuttal. Opposition will speak next, and then you have eight minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Chairman, the uh, board will hear, now hear from those parties opposed, and I do have four seats if you'd like to come up if there's more than these three gentlemen. Again, gentlemen, to your right is your clock. Um, the clock will start after you guys introduce yourselves and present your testimony to this board. And I'm Richard Downs. I live at 324 Battle Road. I'm Paul Sanguinetti. I live at uh, 353 Battle Road. You ready? Um, first, I wanted to address a few things that they had brought up. One about the sign. I believe the sign was brought up by the church. We had talked about the driveway going out on the old hickory. 
the 75 car, the daycare, this exception allows them to have 75 children. That is 75 people, 75 cars, bringing them in the morning and then turning around from the church and leaving. That's 150 cars within 20 minutes there. Same thing in the afternoon. So we see the possibility of close to 300 cars there coming and going up and down this small two-lane street that's really not big enough for two cars. The other thing about turning left and going out on Old Hickory, that doesn't stop them in the morning from coming off of Burke and coming up Battle. If you'll notice on the picture up there on Old Hickory Boulevard, there is no red light where Old Hickory runs into Old Hickory and Burke it up there. The cars back up there in the morning right now already from that intersection all the way back almost up to our road here. So I can imagine, you know, another 300, another 75 cars in the morning trying to get out of there. They're going to turn right. They can go down the end of that road there and hit Old Hickory there very easily. That Our traffic is our main concern here. And that is, it's a small road. We all get out and walk and, and, and congregate on the road, but it's got to the point where cars going up and down through there are bad. But I also want to bring up some issues here that is per y'all's code. <coughs> One is on the, uh, the, under item G, traffic impact. The applicant shall demonstrate how the proposed use will not adversely affect the safety and convenience of vehicle and pedestrian circulation in the area. We would like to ask, if nothing else, that y'all ask for a traffic impact on Battle Road there, for, mainly due to the size of the road and, and the condition of the road. The second thing here is under, uh, See that. Under preferred locations, um, that the minimum street standard be waived on the connection coming into Battle Road. We feel like it ought to go into Old Hickory. Uh, under item eight, no, let uh, Senate C, they care center a lot of butts and it's common street fronts with a uh, non-residential multifamily zone district. I don't know whether it meets that or not. Um, under item E, under religious institution, there should be no vacant property adjacent. And I'm assuming that this is for uh, the daycare for the church. No, sir. Uh, stop his clock, Steph, if you don't mind. Um, Item E, dealing with the religious institution, is not for this board because that deals with the church use itself, okay. uh, not accessory uses to the church. And, okay. Uh, churches are actually don't... Because there's a lot of open yes. land there that's grown over and all right adjacent to the daycare there. Yeah. That, that would come into play if, if this were a zone district that this board had to review a, a new church being constructed. They would take anything under Section E okay. into account. You know, our, nobody here is against daycare. I think it's a great thing, but we're just against all the traffic going up and down our road. Request that a traffic study be done. And if nothing else, what we have asked is that, that class three not be given. Let's, let's do a class one for up to 25 students and see how that goes. That would lessen, they could have a daycare, it would lessen the impact on our street. So what we're requesting, what I'm requesting, is that we go from a class three to a class one. Thank you. That's exactly, I think, the view of everybody on the street. We would like to see it, I mean, try it out first. Why go gangbusters at class three? Let's start at class one, and if that works, then maybe class two later. You know, it, we're just concerned. It's a it's a nightmare now going to work and coming home from work in that uh, area where you go to O'Hicker Boulevard to get to Burkett to get to the interstate. There's no light or anything, so it's really a, a, a hardship. And if you have, well, like Terry said, 300 cars and, uh, you know, 150 in the morning coming and going and 150 in the evening, it's going to be a nightmare. This is a little two lane, no shoulder. All the mailboxes are on the right side, so it's a very uh, rural road. And that's the main concern, I think, of everybody is if we could just 
come back to uh, the one class, you know, for 25 and, and see what that does. And if there's no problem there, well, yeah, let's go up to two and, you know, and not just put it all at once. Um, I, that's that's I. But the only thing I have to add is that um, the proposal adds all of this traffic, all of what is already a peak time in our, our neighborhood. Yeah. I don't know why, but for some reason, we seem to have a deluge of cars driving down Battle Road first thing in the morning and again at night. Yeah. Uh, I really don't see any reason for it because there's no place for them to go but Old Hickory Boulevard, which is already a state highway that has connections at two of the major intersections. So for some reason, Battle Road is getting an awful lot of traffic it should have been getting to be begin with. And now we're talking at adding um, dedicated traffic to it to service the church's needs. We don't really feel like that Battle Road is a connector road or should be a connector road you know, for the church to go through there. Appreciate it. And, and as far as the sign and having someone stand out there, you can start off with good intentions, but so-and-so may not stand there every day, you know. Uh, that, I mean, you know, if you're short and you don't have enough teachers, then obviously that's where you would not have someone. But agreed. All I was going to point out is that if we grant it with a condition and the condition's not met, then you have the opportunity for an enforcement action. Doesn't necessarily come up in front of this board, but it, it comes to the codes department. I have two questions for you. First one is where do you come up with 150 cars? Well, no, no, no. You got 75, it's going to be coming to the church, it's going to be going down our street in the morning. There's 75 students. Well, plus now, the it teachers. It may not be, plus the teachers and, yeah. and whoever else is up at the church. You know, it may not be 75 start off with, but that's what they asked for. I seem pretty sure that within a few weeks it will be 75 students. So we got 75 going up there to the church. And then we got another 75 as they leave the church, turn around and coming right back down our street. So that's the possibility of 150 in the morning. 75 up, 75 back, up and down in front of our house. Same thing in the afternoon. So that, that would just be the maximum if, if every if they maximized their the number of children and every child came in one car. We, we that would be the the, the, sure. the, the the full worst case scenario is what you're talking about. Yes, sir. Okay. We, we have a feeling that it, that may happen pretty quick. My other question is, is that the main concern you have? If, if there were exiting or access from this facility directly to Old Hickory Boulevard. That'd be great. Any problem or any objection with this thing at no, all? No, sir, other than for the child safety that's in that yeah, car. But I think that would be that would be, that the, would be the way to do that it. That would be the ideal situation. If they could put some kind of, Hickory. you know, like a loop, you know, where they didn't have that backup um, to uh, battle. Because battle is, and like he said, it's a cut through street. So there's a lot of people cutting through on top of us trying to get to work and trying to come home from work. Um, it's a, just a traffic situation. I think that was, again, I can't say what was brought up at the first time, but that was one of the things that was suggested is that the access go out up there in the corner up there to O'Hare Boulevard. So there's yeah there's several options you know if you could if you could move it to zone, to, to the one class one or if they could do that so there's yeah you know there's a lot of different things that you could do is is there a there's no stop sign on Old Hickory that's just a uh, battle has to yield to stop. Old Hickory that's yes. exactly right yeah the stop, sign. the stop sign is at the corner there is no stop sign in front of the church all the way down to where Burkett and Old Hickory tied together. And there's nothing there but a stop sign. We were supposed to get a red light, but the red light was moved up to October Wood, so we don't have a red light at the end of over here. So everybody just sits there. It's because hard. Burkett is catching everybody from Williamson County coming across to 24, and everybody from Rufford County is going across is going over to Williamson County. And it's just, it's almost impossible to pull out of there. People just get tired of waiting and take a chance, you know, to pull out there. So. Wait, traffic backs all the way up. You got Apple Valley and uh, Cane Ridge, those communities down Oh Hickory. So they're trying to get to Burkett to get to the interstate, you know.
Any other questions? All right. Uh, proponent, you can come back up. Mr. Chairman, before we do, are there any other parties in opposition who'd like to speak? Make sure you have opportunity. Okay. I have a question. Um, if they, I think I heard you say that you usually get 40 children on Sundays and Wednesday nights. Is that right? Mm -hmm. well, does it make sense? I mean, you saw on the consent agenda one of our other cases where we granted something subject to a time limit for 18 months. Would it make sense to the church at all if we did make this a class two, cap it at 50 kids, and put some type of time limit on it, and then we have got a period of time to see how it works? I mean, it would be a pretty big leap to go from zero to 75 kids. Is the church amenable at all to making it a class two instead of a class three? Well, how long would that period? Uh, I'm, I can't speak for the whole board, but I'm, I'm thinking... 18 months and then if, if there's no problems then you come back and what happened today was a consent agenda item um, that wouldn't keep them from let's say in 12 months if if things grew for applying again within right. that time frame this is only a suggestion but we're trying to facilitate something here that is workable for you and the other party Um, I think that, um, you know, as we kind of, as we're making preparations, sort of the um, uh, the costs and expenses and, and things of that nature, um, it might uh, negatively impact us with that. Again, we still don't know exactly until we get past this point what the actual cap will be because DHS could still say that your, that 75 will be minimized based upon the amount of furniture that you have in your room. And also, we don't know exactly what that number is in terms of, you know, students enrolled. Um, yeah, I guess that, that was what, you know, but I mean, I understand you know what the chairman's saying in terms of you know if you have 50 folks now and it, it, I may this may be a wrong assumption on my part but it, it feels like that not all 50 kids would be part of your daycare because some kids would have other daycare and it may be convenient it may not be convenient and uh, so you're starting with maybe 30 kids maybe 40 maybe 20 and so uh, the, the question would be what what could you live with in, in terms of giving this a, a chance in order to uh, acknowledge some of the neighbors' concerns and knowing that uh, hopefully in the next year or two that, that those concerns will be uh, heard by people outside all of our control that, that can, can help with stop signs and traffic and traffic calming and other things that that are, are problems that they have and problems that you're having to deal with. It's not really your fault. I mean, it's not your fault that... You know, there's traffic on that street. The city hasn't done anything about that street, and you should have a right to have a daycare. Um, but it's in an environment that that your neighbors don't like. So I guess that's the you know, what what can you guys live with but in the short term? Are, are we assuming that the children are coming from a limited pool? I mean, the the children you're talking about on Wednesday and Sunday are are your congregants' children, right? Right. And so, and are you are you limiting the? The enrollment to people that are members of your church? No, no, we're not. And um, and so, you know, again, on Sunday, Wednesday, you know, we, we will see, you know, Sundays uh, about 300 cars on Wednesdays, perhaps about 100, 150, you know, if those are, are 40 um, kids. Um, here's my concern with, with, with the limitation. My concern with limitation is that um, th there is still construction going on, residential construction going on around us. Um, if there's increase because of that construction, there's no way for us to tell. And so in 18 months, um, they may see an increase that has nothing to do with us right now. As it is right now, they're, they're experiencing traffic that has nothing to do with us right now. And so my, my, my concern is that in 18 months we come back and we say no, when it has nothing to do with the traffic burden that, that we are actually doing. Maybe um, from the increase in residential areas, according to our councilman, they're looking at doing um, more housing around the area. Again, I'm concerned that, um, again, we'll be penalized for something that we're not doing. 
Just for the record, I was not assuming they would all come from the congregation. I was just trying to meet the burden of the traffic impact. And my, my example did assume that, so I, that, I apologize for making that assumption. But wouldn't it be fairly simple to put a counter within your property that you could count and show, well, we only had this number of cars coming here oh, yeah, rather we, than blame the... Yeah, we, we can certainly do that. Um, but again, you know, 75, um, uh, the cap right now, um, we, we have the ability, you know, should we have church every day, 450, right? I mean, I, I, mean, I understand the issue, but right now um, we are allowed 450, right? And we're saying let's go to 7, 750, or rather um, 75, I, again, I understand the issue, but we're currently allowed 450. Right. But how many churches do you can you cite to me that would have 450 people coming in there every day? That's two well, totally different uses for that facility. So. No, I get that, but but uh, are we restricted to Sunday mornings? And the answer is no. Should we have a revival going on for the full week? We will be allowed to have 450, and we have had revivals um, on on uh, at our location. Right. I understand that, but then pure logic tells me that there are not as many people on the road on Sunday morning as there are during the week because for no, obvious reasons. So to, I, that, to, to, to me, totally that's a that. thin argument on your behalf. I'm sorry no, my, to say my, that. My, my point I'm making is that um, during the week, we can have a revival Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and we have had that. Um, Again, I, I can I, I agree, but that's a limited thing. That's not a year-round, everyday occurrence that we're talking about here <laughs> of uh, giving you the right mm -hmm. to increase that traffic every day of the week. Mm -hmm. And that's what your neighbors are concerned about is how that's handled. So that's, that's all I'm saying. And uh, Mr. King, um, I think if I could to, uh, to address that concern, because I live in Cambridge Farms, which is literally right around the corner um, from the church. And so I frequent um, Old Hickory Boulevard um, very often. It's not advantageous to me to use Battle Road as a shortcut to get anywhere um, because the interstate, I have to go o o Hickory Boulevard. And even um, our parishioners, which are in multiple areas of Nashville and surrounding counties, again, the majority, I would say, come o Hickory Boulevard right into our first drive. And so I think that um, to, to address that concern in terms of the traffic, even those people during the week that might be using Battle Road as a, a cut through in whichever direction, if they already have children, they're transporting them somewhere else because there's no daycare facility in that area. So the need is there. And so I think, I think we're assuming that we're gonna add traffic when we actually may not be, number one, based upon the majority of the constituents in the immediate area and their location and proximity to the church, but also that traffic that may already exist if they're passing uh, through Battle Road to get to a child care facility. So help me with the orientation. When you, you talk, you, you, a lot of the folks have mentioned the interstate. Uh, so just as we're looking at this map on Old Hickory, is the interstate, would you take a left on that map? You see where Old Hickory Boulevard goes to the right? And, it and goes you to see that yellow line? That's, uh, that's Barrett. That's, that Burkett. That's Burkett. So where they intersect, you, you continue along Burkett past Old Hickory Boulevard. So you to would get take to a left interstate. to get to the interstate. Right. Yes. All right. So so if if I were on Old Hickory wanting to go to the interstate, I probably if I were going to the interstate, I wouldn't go to Battle because it would right. take me all the way down and then I have to go all the right. way back up. Okay, that's I wanted to just get that orientation. What one of the uh, well the main issue obviously from the opposition was was traffic and they uh, mentioned a traffic study uh, have you have you commissioned a traffic study or would you be willing to commission a traffic study a traffic study was done um, when we when we applied to build that church and uh, and so you know it was deemed that that the traffic that that would be coming to the church the 400 the capacity um, it was okay, and so that there was no need for us to to expand the, the road or anything else like that, or, or to put a turn um, lane in. Who so did the traffic point. study? Um, 
I don't have that information. But was it an independent it. person that does that for a living? Um, I, I think, Kevin, you may can help me with that. Yeah. I think but the it was city a traffic did. engineering. Yeah, I think the city did it. Oh. Well, I, I, you know, uh, just as Mr. Hammonds yes. sorry, uh, mentioned, you know, there's there's all kinds of assumptions that can be made, and uh, a traffic engineer would would take those assumptions into account uh, in a study. And I think that it would I think it would be to your benefit to have a traffic study uh, uh, because when, once we have a, a professional. Uh, recommendation document, then we're not uh, disputing or arguing, you know, specifics or scenarios that could or might happen because the the study would be based on some scenario and uh, and you know if the opposition wanted to do a traffic study, they could too. Then we could argue between those, but once once a professional uh, document is in as an evidence, then that's sort of what we can go on. And people are often surprised uh, at how little traffic impacts in the big picture. Uh, you know, talk about 75 cars, you know, is a lot of cars, but if there are a thousand trips now, or 500 or 200, those are, 75 has a different impact on each of those type numbers. So I think that would, I think that would help your case, and I think it would it would help us in determining the validity of the of the traffic issue. So th there was a proposal earlier about um, doing class two. Um, then, if we do that, could we come back in in twelve months? Um, and revisit this. Yes, that that was part of my thought pattern. Was we see how it goes. I mean, we the assumption was when I heard your the idea that you tossed out was it that we could put a, a time limit on it to say, hey, you'd, you'd have to come back in 18 months or two years. But if you wanted to come back in six months, you could because things really were growing, then you could just say, hey, I need we need this sooner rather than than later. Is that actually? I'm, y yes, that is exactly what I said. But I've actually kind of rethought that proposal. Um, which I guess we can do a discussion. And my thought was really grant class two, and then they can come back to increase to yeah. class three, not that they're in danger of losing class two in 18 that's, months. That's a better okay. Okay. And, you know, this is just a suggestion, as I said before, but it seems like it has support over there and maybe some others. And it seems like a reasonable. You know, you alternative. Know, in, in the spirit of um, you know working with our neighbors, they will will go with the class too, and um, and then you know at some point if we can come back to the board and, and resubmit. Do you have anything else to present? I just want to say, please don't misunderstand my question because I I'm all for it too, but I think the main concern is the traffic thing, and that's, sure. we all have to be cognizant of that. So sure. Um, I like the idea of the compromise, but I'm uh, I'm a little concerned that we're uh, we're leaving uh, some vagaries on the table as far as what standard we're going to be using in the future, because uh, it seems to me that uh, right now there are two distinct uh, impressions of what the traffic situation is, and I don't see how that's going to change uh, in any amount of time if uh, if people if some parties think. In 18 months, yeah, it's going great, and the opposition thinks still bad. Because well, even if you know, well, I can foresee that even if they don't do this child care, right. traffic's still going to be bad in 18 well, months. One of the th I'm sorry. I mean, I'm I'm certainly not. Well, my thought pattern would be class two come back in some period of time, 12 months, 18 months. I'd bring a traffic study with me because David, like you, I don't think the traffic's going to be near as bad as people think, but that's just me up here doing that. So I, I think a traffic study would make sense. I just, we've already deferred this once. May I ask a question? Um, 
I was wondering on what conditions, you know, if we were to, if, if, we, if you grant it based on class two and then, you know, ask that we come back with a traffic study, what would we compare that study to? Because what, what, what would be an acceptable, you know, criteria in terms of, okay, you didn't negatively impact the traffic. And so my, my concern is that we'll be in the same boat in terms of not really knowing if 50 kids or 50 student capacity or 75 student capacity, you know. Wouldn't at that, wouldn't um, that point you would say, here's the traffic now, yeah. what, what is the, the impact of adding 25 more students? That, that's what, yeah. that's all, it would, that would be the, yeah. the impact. So I'm not a traffic engineer, but oftentimes if you call them out before you did this, they would have a base and then they can kind of build into their model, you know, 25 and 50. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think at that point you would be saying, I, I want to increase my capacity by 25, and then the, the study would be what, what impact does it have to increase it by those 25 students. Okay. And so, I'm well, sorry well, if I... Well, there's still, the, yeah, there's still the question of how does the first 25 impact how has the first 25 impacted traffic, and then how will the, the next 25? So I think we have to define what we're asking for because we're we're leaving them. I mean, so far we've I just mentioned three traffic studies. Well, we're we're, it's possibly, we're probably bouncing into discussion, but my thought pattern, and again, I'm this is not what I said the first time, but potentially grant the class two, not with a reversion at all and so in 18 months if they want to go to 75 they can come back and ask and I think David Taylor is exactly right when you say at that point the traffic study is trying to figure out what the difference between 50 and 75 is because we're not yeah we probably ought to I'm sorry do y'all have anything else you'd like to say okay then I'm going to close the public hearing and move to discussion Thank you, gentlemen. I like your idea. I think it's reasonable, and you know, this is a daycare once again, and daycares, because of the Metro Council and the code, are allowed in these areas. We have to just determine their impact, and obviously, traffic is a is a big issue. So to, you know, basically cut this by a third initially, and have the burden back on them if they ever want more than 50, I think is a a good compromise. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think it. I think it. It. It uh, respects uh, and at least uh, hears the concerns of the of the neighbors, but at the same time, uh, is is uh, responsive to what we see may be the existing demand and is a good start. So I'm I'm, I'm comfortable. I may have misunderstood, but did, didn't he say class two? Yeah, maximum of fifty. Oh, okay. So we are talking about maximum of fifty, not okay. Okay, I just want to. Okay, so vaguely hearing a consensus, I'd like to make a motion um, that we approve their request subject to the following five conditions, that they be required to meet with the Planning Commission's recommendation regarding buffering, that they be maxed out at a class two, which is 50 kids, Three, that there be a sign at the entrance saying turn left onto Battle Road. Four, that um, there be a traffic monitor at the end of that same drive um, suggesting that people go left. And I find that the special exceptions uh, the, the requirements of the special exception found in MCL 17.16.150 and .170 have been met. I guess the fifth condition, which I forgot to say, is that they can come back after 18 months with a request to increase to class three with a max of 75, and it would be just a suggestion that at that time a traffic study might help them. So or didn't we say any time they, they could come back any time? Any time. Any time. They don't have to oh, wait 18 yeah, months. You any, just said 18. Yeah, I did, and I blew it. Um, any time is fine by me. That, that, when, that when, when they come back, if, if when or if they come back to request an increase that they are advised to have a traffic study? I, I would think that's a suggestion more than yeah. a requirement. I'll second. 
Okay, we've got a motion, we've got a second. All in favor? Before we vote, I got one simple question here. Simple minded as I am. How did we come up with 50 all of a sudden? How did we go from one to two instead of three? How did we? Well, cla th mean? they were requesting class three, which is 75. The neighbors were requesting class 25, were requesting 25, which is class one. So, and, for lack of a better word, we're splitting the difference. Well, and, and, the, and they said that they currently have 45 kids that come on Sunday, okay. which, which says that if not all those kids participated, and again, that was assuming that, that it's just that it's just their congregants that, that come to the okay. daycare, which they said that's not necessarily the case, but it was, it, it felt like that there was potential demand for more than class one, which wouldn't really necessarily be fair to the center, and yet class three isn't really fair to the neighbors uh, without more exploration, so that's where two was kind of thought of as a compromise. So really, there was there's only four conditions then. Correct, right. Mr. Chairman. Also, within your rules, this board has adopted as standard conditions upon all child care facilities uh, additional conditions, and I, I guess I don't normally incorporate that in your motion, but I, for all parties here, um, no, these are standard conditions this board places on all child care facilities. Um, hours of operation are from 6A to 6P, Monday through Friday only. Fence playgrounds required uh, to be attached to the structure. Um, and there are no dogs on the premises or no swimming pools or any swimming facilities allowed. Those conditions are have been in this board's rules long before any of the U5 sat on this board and potentially probably 25 years now uh, as additional conditions that this board will place upon them. Okay, it, so I guess there are five conditions. <laughs> so we, well, and are, are, are we sure we don't want to re request a traffic study if they come back? Uh, to, to, to me, that was just a suggestion. I, I hate to see people be forced to spend money, but it certainly would ha help their case whenever, well, see, I, when I, and I, if they decide I, to I think we're. I think it leaves the board in a position of, of listening to deciding which of the two parties is correct, if either, on, on something that can be professionally determined, you know, to, to an acceptable standard. I agree. Because we're just going to be back in the same spot. I'm all for a traffic study. I mean, and, and I would strongly suggest they show up with one next time. But, I mean, yeah, I, I just don't like to make people, force people to spend money. But, but having said that, for this board member who will be on it, for a while, <laughs> uh, I would very much like them to come home with one. But if you want to make it a condition, I'm not sure I really. To the extent it's a question about condition versus suggestion, I would note that if there is a request, whatever it be, 12 months, 24 months from now, by the applicant in this instance to come back and increase their grade to class three, it will be another special exception request under the same set of criteria, at which time the Board of Zoning Appeals could make a condition that they present a traffic study that meets with board approval or make that at that time. If the board is not inclined to make it a condition today, it doesn't preclude them from doing so at a later date. Uh, I think the suggestion is, is probably noted by everyone at this point, but to the extent you're worried about making it a condition, uh, you're certainly not precluded from doing so when they come back, if they come back. Right. But when they come back, it would be post facto. They would have to apply, come to the board, and then we would have to vote and approve it. And here, here's a condition, then we'd have to come back and hear it again. Saying if it's conditional, if they come back for an increase, they come back for the traffic study. Uh, yeah, if if a friendly amendment would be would be allowed. But that's not obligating them to to do it. To presently do a traffic no. study. No, I'm fine with that amendment. I am too. They were doing. Okay, I think we've just put on our sixth condition. Um, but. Uh, Okay, I think we've got a motion. We've got a second. Got a motion, got a second. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Any opposed? Passes. Clarity of writing your order tomorrow. Um, you are requiring a traffic study upon resubmit. Should they choose to resubmit? Right. They, need to they could always choose to never increase come back, but the if number. They do come back to increase the traffic study. Okay, we'll do. Okay, with that, board adopts on vote of five and zero. Was that correct? It was correct. All right.
Well, they would do that anyway after all. With the... It was too much. And I really appreciate it. I mean, there's plenty of time for... Another thing, I wouldn't have your job. You can have it today. I'll trade with you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the, uh, we'll call the next case the, is the applicant present case 2014-33, Miss Patricia Williams at 519 Frida Villa. Miss Williams, are you present? All right. The applicants are present. Are there any other parties besides Miss Williams here in support for her request? Okay. All right. Do have a gentleman here? And a show of hands of those parties here in opposition to case 33. Okay. You two ladies, uh, as you saw in our last hearing, um, Obviously, they're together, but you, you all will have 15 minutes amongst yourselves. Y'all may work out some time frames of who's going to speak for how long uh, when your time comes. But with that, I'll turn over and and start the request. This uh, this request members comes before you by Miss Williams at uh, 519 Freda Villa. She is requesting a variance in the height of a fence in RS20 to allow, it says, to install that fence is erected. Um, so this would be the legal use of a six-foot solid fence along Saunders um, Drive to enclose the backyard. Refer to the board under section 1712040E, letter 26A. Members, we don't get very many of these appeals, so let me read that section into the record for you. Um, 1712-040 is our permitted obstruction section of the zoning code. This is a section of the code that are exceptions to our setback rules. Uh, for members of, for the purposes of clarity for everyone, the codes department does not require a building permit to erect a fence. However, the zoning code does place certain restrictions on uh, privacy and, and chain link fences. Number 26 specifically says that um, under the title screening walls or fences, the maximum permitted height measured from finished grade level on the side of the wall or fence with the greatest vertical exposure shall be A, and this is the section here dealing with solid fences, the maximum height within the first 10 feet shall not exceed two and one half feet in height along the street right of way. Open fences such as chain link or those of a similar nature, and examples I've got noted in my boards are picket fences or those types are permitted to be six feet and can go to the right of way. Uh, along the remainder of the front setback cannot exceed six feet in height nor eight feet in height in the rear or side yard. The um, subject property that you see here is at the intersection of Frida Villa and Saunders Avenue. I did say Saunders Drive. This is Avenue. You see the subject property here. And going from this aerial, the, the fence has been erected along the uh, side of the residence and enclosing the backyard in this area, and you'll see this in the photographs in just a moment. The issue, the part of the fence that is at issue is the part that is within 10 feet of the street right of way. As you'll see in the photographs, would be this portion of the fence along Saunders here. The, po the portions of this part of the fence that run parallel with Frida Villa, so long as they are outside of 10 feet from the, from the right of way, they're actually conforming. So the majority of this fence is conforming. Essentially, from what we've what we've seen on our visit out there, this fits this fence sits just inside the right of way of Frida Villa. I mean, of uh, Saunders. Saunders Avenue is a 50-foot right of way. Um, I'm not a licensed surveyor, but uh, taking some measurements from my own from the center of the travel way out there, this fence is sitting approximately 30 feet from the center. Which, if you subtract 25, assuming they paved it in the middle, um, they're approximately five feet off the right of way. So it'd be this portion of the fence along Saunders here, uh, just that bottom right photographs the view of the opposite corner of Saunders. Uh, this is my truck and the view from the uh, adjoining property owner to the south. That parcel, as you saw in the area photograph, has a loop drive. Um, Public Works commented in their in their um, email to you that they took no exception to the request. They are asking the Coast Department to require a building permit for this fence. They would additionally like to see um, this fence for their review as part of the permitting process um, as it relates to the site visibility distance from that neighbor to the south. So, how, so that fence is five, you're saying it's five foot out of 
compliance? Yes, sir. It's five feet inside of, of what's It's allowed. in the right of way. It is not in the right of way. It's five feet off the right of way. Off the right of way, okay. yes, sir. And the code All requires right. to be at least 10 feet off the right of way. Um, Which is one of the reasons why they're here. Yes, that is why they're here. And it's, uh, is the height okay if they... If they got outside of 10 feet, the height is fine. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm clear on that. I'm, I'm confused by public works requests. They're now requesting a building permit for what's already been built? Well, they, they would like, if this board agrees um, in granting a variance, they would like another look at it as it relates to potential site visibility from this driveway, which you see my truck parked in, which is the adjoining property owner south as it relates to how Saunders Avenue curves back to the right toward that four-way stop, they may um, post some additional signage at that intersection warning drivers of a driveway here. Um, so it's, it's more tied to their potential signage at this intersection, uh, not so much of public works. Obviously, if the, if the fence were in public works' is right away, it would have to be moved. Um, so it's sort of twofold. They want to make sure it's out of their right way, A, and B, if, if you all grant a variance, they would like to resign this intersection to warn drivers that, of a driveway at this intersection. So who's going to determine if it's in the right of way or not? Public works will, ultimately. So why don't they just do that? Oh, they are going to it, just sort of the process of it because there's no normally a building permit required for it. Uh, it comes to them via complaint process as it did our office. Um, it gets turned in on a complaint. So why don't you just complain to them and have them survey it? Well, as I'm, I'm, told, I'm not trying no, to be a smart answer. Not, not at all. Um, as as a, it, it, it's a parallel case. See, this case is before you as the board. We currently in our office in the Coast Department has a property standards violation case on this fence now. Um, as part of that violation process, they are permitted an opportunity to fix it administratively through this board. If they do not bring it into compliance, we will go before a judge, and, and the judge will order them to have it moved or removed if necessary. Um, but they have to be afforded their administrative remedy first, and that's this board. And, and Public Works is asking us to do what? Public Works is asking you to do nothing um, at all other than the comments they've sent you, uh, which I believe they say take okay. no exception, but they'll catch it on the permit. Uh, they've asked us that pretty much this case and going forward when we have fences that are in violation potentially of a street setback that they'd like a building permit attached with it so they can track it as well. Okay. I think I understand. I hope that clarified that somewhat. Uh, corollary to David's question, if we defer this and Public Works has a complaint, will Public Works make its determination relatively quickly? Public Works is, is sort of in the same vein as is they're, they're not bound by this board, but they are subject to them utilizing all their administrative revenues before they really get involved in bringing an enforcement action from their side, too, if there's an issue. Meaning the Public Works can't go after someone who's been granted a variance by the board on a fence. They can't then subsequently. Now, they could if there's clearly some uh, potential intersection issue. but So if... But public, we could grant this variance, and public, public works, works could, could still, still say, say we're not sure if it's it. in the right of way or not. We'd like to survey it. Right. I just, I, I'm telling you, just from my view, looking at the distance between these two poles here, this this telephone pole and this one, and knowing the right of way is 50 feet, mm -hmm. I, I do not believe it's in the right of way. I do believe it's inside the 10 foot setback. So just, I didn't mean to muddy things with you guys. Public Works is involved in this process. They have sent you something saying we take no exception to it. I just, for, for purposes of getting everything out on the table, I want you all to understand that Public Works is also involved in this process. Uh, but it is not in any way restrictive upon you or vice versa. So next time it will not be so clear uh, as to muddy the water. Okay. Joy, I will yeah. disclose that I have driven by and looked at this property. So. Okay. Thank you, Mr. King. The record reflect Mr. King has visited the site and looked at it. Members, too, uh, you are always in, entitled under state law to visit sites. You just can't do so together. Uh, do it independently of each other and disclose it at the hearing as you just did. Okay. With that, I'll turn the, um, the, the hearing over to the appellants in this case. And, um, sir and ma'am, you'll have 15 minutes to speak. Your clock's over to your right there, and it'll begin after you make your introductions. We'll turn it over to you. After they're done, the opposition can then come forward and present their testimony, and then the applicant will have a period for rebuttal. And with that, I'll turn it over to you all. Mm -hmm. Speak. 
The reason that oh, uh, please introduce yourself for the board. I'm sorry. Introduce yourself. Your name. Oh, and I'm uh, I'm Miss Williams' husband, Clifford. Clifford Williams. And when we put the fence up, we did have a survey done so that we could get the fence off the right of way. We paid uh, six hundred dollars for that survey. Matter of fact, survey stakes were there. Uh, before the fence ever went up. And as we were putting the fence up, it uh, we only got a complaint after the fence was completed. So it wasn't as if we went ahead with construction uh, and knowing that we were going to need a variance. It was only after the fence was completed that there was an objection to it. Uh, we need the fence where it is because we are proposing a garage in our backyard and if we move the feet, the fence in that 10 feet, then it's going to infringe on that space, which doesn't allow us to use our property as we would like to. Uh, if we take it down to two and a half feet, uh, my yellow lab is back is taller than two and a half feet uh, and also the other issue is is uh, we have had two riding line mowers two push mowers an edger and a trailer removed from that backyard are you talking about stolen oh yes sir and they were chained up they come in cut the chain take it so we're not only trying to have a place for our dogs but we're also trying to secure our own possessions and obviously without a garage I don't have a place to put those uh, other than to chain them up under the carport and that was as close to the house as I could get it and they were removed from from the carport the trailer was removed from the far side of the backyard and my wife is also handicapped so with that fence being able to open the door and put our two Labrador Retrievers outside on their own accord is, is going to help her immensely. Uh, because I'm working and of course I'm not there to see to their needs during the day and my wife has to take care of those animals and uh, she's just not simply able to hold on to a, a 92 pound dog. So, uh you said you had it surveyed, but but it's not the survey that's in our package. This one is from the 70s. Do you have do you have that survey? Oh, we had a fence survey. Yes, sir. So are are you saying the fence is is on the right of way or on on your side of the right of way? It is sitting on private property. It is inside of the right of way. Right. I, I guess what, what Joey had said was that it, that the rules are it has to be 10 feet within the right of way, and he's saying it's five yeah, feet within the right of way. No, so that's correct. And and we found out about the ruling actually after the fence was installed when they came out and said it has to be back an additional 10 feet. It's already up. And the odd part is, is folks, I started at the corner. Mm -hmm of the yard and worked across the very back of the property first, but yet there was no objection posted until it was completely up. What was there before you put up this fence, this chain link fence? There was nothing. There was nothing. There was chain link fence down one side of the yard, which mm -hmm. adjoins my neighbor behind me. Uh, and her chain link fence around her backyard. So what was the real reason you put up this fence? Uh, obviously, I'm trying to keep my possessions. I've had too much equipment stolen out of my backyard. Uh, it's, it's, it was on the news where Metro Nashville Police Department said, lock your trailers up, put them in secure places. They even had a number if you'd had a trailer stolen that you could call. So this has been a universal problem. And so that was the reason you didn't have a chain link fence or a fence that you could see inside that wasn't solid? Exactly, because... With, with what I have in there, they can drive up the road and write up their shopping list and come back and get it. And I need a, I need a fence that they can't see through, and I also need a, a, a fence tall enough that I can retain my dogs 
and I really, if I move that fence back 10 additional feet, I will no longer have enough room to put the garage where I would like yeah, to. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure where you're getting the 10 feet. Joey said several times that it's five feet. Uh, it's just five I'll feet. Have no, to, I'll have to tear that fence down along Saunders and move it back. Ten additional feet from Joey. How many people? Yeah, I mean, you, you said five. And I would love to see his survey because that would answer the question for me. But okay, so we don't we don't know, but <laughs> your, your your guesstimate based on your being there but not surveyed was that was, it looked like it was it was about five feet off the edge of the right way today. But, Sir, I'm, I'm going to bet a dollar to a donut you don't have that survey with you, but could you get it to Joey because that would answer a heck of a lot of questions. Sure, we can contact the surveyor, uh, but he surveyed the right of way, and from there over, it's private property. Now, that's great, but I understand the building code says even on private property, it has to be 10 feet inside of the right of way line. Now, that's where the issue lies. I understand. Understood. I, I understand that. But right. I think it'll help us figure out whether you're asking for a two foot variance or an eight foot variance, you know, because Joey's looking at it, you know, he's just doing it with his eyes. But if we know where the right of way is, we'll be able to figure out a lot better the size of your variance. And, and a two foot variance is a lot more acceptable than a nine foot variance. Well, actually, it's, it, it exactly matches the old survey that you're looking at because the survey, the metal pins were still in the ground when the surveyor got out there. So uh, he drove up the stakes. I, but the, the survey doesn't say where the fence is. Are you saying it's I ran on the right, it right along that line. I did not curve the fence. The fence is actually farther in in one point because there's two water meters that are on the Saunders side and rather than put the fence over the water meters, I moved the fence back to leave those meters accessible from the roadside. So I'm actually in on the property right there. So when you okay. look at the right of way that's drawn out there, you will see the points on that. If you pull that original drawing you had up, if you look, you see the straight line that comes from uh, from the front yard straight across, and if you look, you'll see one with a broken line that curves. My fence actually runs along the straight line. Joey, is this an issue of the fence that, height? That straight line, and then the back driveway, and then it goes down, and it goes to the very next point, which you see... Uh, where it's giving you the uh, the 79.73, that 79.73 feet up to that point, and then if you notice, it goes in a straight line. If you look at the photos of the fence, you'll see the fence is lying along the same plane. So you you built that directly on this line? Yes, sir. So that answers my question. There is he's at zero setback. The issue is height at this location. Um, Mr. King's question to me, as Jim was talking, was, is this a height issue? It's, it's both. It's one or the other. It's a, a fence this tall has to be 10 feet back, which would be a variance in how tall this fence is. Or it could be a setback issue. A fence this tall must be 10 feet off that right way. Um, yeah, if it's so over two and a half feet. Yes. Six and one, half a dozen the other. Now, for, for records purposes, a chain link fence is fine. No problem, because it's open. I can see through it. No, no issues there. Do we have any other questions or? Yep. Okay. Um, you'll have 11 minutes and 34 seconds for rebuttal, and the opposition's up now. All right, guys, if you'll swap places out. Ready? Oh, please. Okay. <laughs> My name's Kim Winters, and I'm the one who lives in the property that he was showing with the circular drive, so I'm probably the one that's the most affected by the fence. And um, 
every time I go to pull out of my driveway, I cannot see, but you know, you can see how far, and I have pictures that I brought that I took myself, um, how far I can see if any traffic is coming or not. Um, and so I feel like, and there's most mornings I have to pull up and back up and pull up and back up two or three times to be able to, you know, to pull out because I'll think I can go and then there will be a car coming and I have to back up. Um, there was not a four-way stop there when he put the fence up and there was a school bus that came through there every day that had to turn left off of Frida Villa onto Saunders and could not see because of the fence to turn left and plus <laughs> all the other traffic coming through there. So the city did come in and put a four-way stop there which helped all the people flying around the curve there. But um, you can't even see the four-way stop from my driveway. Um, my daughter and grandchildren live in the house right next to me, so they don't have much further that they can see when they're pulling in and out of their driveway. Um, also, in those pictures there, you will see that when he's talking about all his valuable possessions that he's worried about being stolen, you can see what his backyard looks like, all the stuff in it. <laughs> so, um, and, I, and I've never had anything stolen from my house. I have a riding lawnmower in my backyard. Um, so I don't know how he had all that stuff stolen. And his dogs are very sweet. I love his dogs. I want his dogs to have a fence to be able to, you know, to run around in. But if it was a uh, chain link fence where you could see the road, would be much better. You've circulated pictures to us, yes. so I was a bit confused. Those pictures show the things he's keeping in his backyard yes. today, yes. not the building materials for the fence. Yes. Some of those were taken in August, but some of them were just taken in the last couple of days, and it's no change from August. It's been like that for two years. Okay. Members, as it relates to those items, I, I did speak with... Um, Sorry, ma'am, I didn't get your name before the hearing. That is an issue, certainly, that that can be addressed by the Property Standards Division of the Coast Department, really not something you guys have any control over, um, any kind of storage of material. or I just didn't want, for the record's purposes, I just want everyone to Yeah, it's just that he was talking about all his valuable possessions that he was worried about getting stolen, and you can see that there's not much there to worry about being stolen. Do we and, have, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so uh, I, I really didn't want to come here today. Um, I don't want to be a bad neighbor, but it's just sort of ridiculous. Do we have any other questions for the opposition? Okay, sir. Uh, uh, ma'am, the way Chairman, you, there, there's one other person at the table. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Jeez, ma'am, I apologize so much. <laughs> I, I thought y'all were together. I apologize. That's all right. Uh, my name is Nancy Campbell, and I live a couple of houses up. Uh, basically, what I wanted to complain about, the gentleman told me before the meeting that you all don't ever control that, but I would like to reiterate. Uh, I don't see how he had anything stolen. He's got so much junk in his backyard, he couldn't possibly have missed anything unless he cleaned up his yard. But that's that's all. I'll go to the other proper department to get his junk cleaned up. Joy, do we have... Do you have a, a scaled image that you, you, you can measure approximately on? Uh, I, I, mean, I, have the I have this survey in, in the record. Let me see if, it, if the graphical scale came with it. Um, I was I was curious if you could get an idea about the distance between the utility pole that's I think at the bend in his fence there by the street and the the curved driveway of Miss uh, Winters. Cause that, that's approximately how much distance between this pole and the, and the fence here. No, I mean from her driveway. Are you sitting in her driveway? Yes, that's my driveway. So I'm, I'm curious what the, the line of sight is from there to approximately where the utility pole is, because that, that's, that's a picture that she submitted also. Mm -hmm. I know you have magical powers. Well, not so much. Um, I do have a lot more tools in my own office than I do in this room to find things out. Um, 
So you're wanting though the distance from this about where you are to to, to that area. pole, right? Okay. Yeah, I can probably find that out. This is great television, by the way. I'm sure the folks at Channel 3 are loving it. Guys, while I'm looking this up, do you have any? Better than radio. Um, do y'all have any other questions for the applicant's proposition? Do, do we have any other questions for the opposition? Yeah. Okay, then I think we can bring back the uh, applicant. Um, uh, that you, that, please come. Okay, the first thing I would like to dispense with is the materials that are stored in the yard. If you'll check, you see I have an active building permit for that. I also have a storage container that somebody reported as a trailer with no wheels, which it is not. We called before we did that, talked to building codes to ensure that we could have that on site. And we do have an active building permit and those materials are for my garage that I would like to build. And until we get this settled, obviously I don't want to start a garage until I know that I'm going to have the space available. Can I, can I ask a question, because um, I don't think we're as concerned about the materials in your backyard. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to know, though, where your garage is going or where you would like it to go. Is a better the garage, question. if you look at the drawing, you see the blue line on the drawing, the one you're, the, oh, you've yes, got yes. up on the screen there. <laughs> yeah, the one that was already there. It went back. Okay. If you look over to the property line uh, there, yes, sir, the garage will go down into that corner, and if I move back too far, I won't be able to get into it. Uh, and right now, I've got a drawing, and that's a proposed 30 by 40. So by the time, as you can see, the lot narrows as you head north, and so it would it would be detached yes it's a it would be a detached garage okay <laughs> mr harper to answer your questions about 150 feet roughly did you hear that mm -hmm. okay. thank you thank you do we have any other questions for the applicant i do under the uh, hardship, explain your hardship for this request, please. It says well, well, because of the curve on Saunders, I need the fence to be built at height. <coughs> What's the curve got to do with the height of that fence, hardship-wise? What's the curve has to do with the height? I'm saying what is the hardship? Explain the hardship that you're asking for this variance. Uh, well, first and foremost, I wasn't aware that I could not put up a six-foot fence. And there was no objection raised until after I'd hand-dug all those holes and put the fence up. <laughs> and secondly, I need the height because, uh, as my neighbor said, she'd never had anything stolen. Her backyard's not visible. She doesn't live on a corner lot. And actually, <laughs> my fence is actually going to protect the view into her backyard, which is extremely small because it's only the width of a driveway and the house sits along and takes up virtually the whole lot. Uh, mine, however, doesn't, it being a corner lot. Um, and I just can't keep things secure there. And also, I have two large dogs that I need a fence that height to keep in because uh, my dog's back is over three feet from the ground to his shoulder and a two and a half foot fence is not going to keep him in, nor my female. 
You still have not answered my question. What is your hardship? The hardship? Well, if I move the fence in the 10 feet, that means I've got to, I've got to tear this fence down all the way along Saunders after putting in the work and the effort and the money and then move it back 10 feet. So that's, that's a, to me, that's a, that's a lot of work. Is that a hardship? That's a self-imposed hardship, sir. What is your hardship? Can, can, can I'm, I'm not help? sure I understand. Can, can, I, can I help him just a little bit? Because, uh, uh, I mean, and I'm, I understand your question and appreciate your question. I think it's a good question. Variances are only granted under Tennessee law based on some hardship with respect to the property. It can be narrowness, it can be a creek running through, it can be old trees, but it is some physical aspect of the property that means I couldn't build my fence here, I had to build it here because of topography. I mean, it's gotta be some, and, and, and though we're sympathetic to dogs and and desire to build a garage, all of that, it's not a physical hardship with the land, and that's Dick's question, well, and it's a darn good question. Well, well on, on the uh, application or the hardship sheet, it, they do mention the topography. On this sheet, it says uh, the yard has significant slope in the starting on the second line. Well, I I visited the site. And I disagree slopes. with that point. But go ahead. <laughs> The, the topography of the map is held by the, the map. It is in a what do I want to say? I don't know. The map itself holds the topography well, the, so the, that it, obviously it the doesn't. House, where my house is situated at the front of the lot, that is a lot higher elevation than it is at the back. It's a continuous drop. So that's what makes the entire backyard so visible from that... Mm -hmm from Saunders Avenue. And even at six feet, coming from Saunders northbound, uh, which would be coming up behind my house, you can still see into the backyard. And, you know, a two and a half foot fence is not gonna keep people out of there. Uh, and that's that's what I need to do. I need to I need to secure my possessions. I can, if need be, I can go get the police report where I reported a missing lawnmower out of the backyard. So you know they can't. I understand police can't be everywhere all the time. So I did my part to try to secure the backyard so that I could keep my possessions. Do you have anything else to add? No, sir. So if we don't have any other further questions, let's close the public hearing and open discussion. You know, I, I was looking at the view from the, the neighbors, Miss Winters driveway. And, and in fact, here at the four way stop, you can see the driveway. So I'm not sure that the height of the fence or moving the fence back. I mean, you'll see more of it, but yes, sir, you can't say I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The, Okay, okay, no problem. And the, yeah, public hearing is closed. Dave. And sir, ma'am, you, you guys can go ahead and back out of the table there, please. Uh, so, it, as far as that goes, uh, I don't, I don't see that really as a, especially since the driveway loops around the to the other side, but. I just I just don't know that it, that it's affected anyone's sight line. Uh, I mean, it's more than if it weren't there, sure. But you, if you just use the uh, utility pole as as a marker, that that's 150 feet to that. And I don't know what the speed limit of this is, but I'm guessing 
150 feet is, you know, and that's minimal. That's just our minimal guess. And, and you can tell from her photograph, you can actually see beyond the, the telephone pole. So I, don't, I just, just wanted to point that out. My concern is we have a building code and we have avenues to remedy that and seek variances on that, which is what this body does. And we have requirements for that. And I do not see a hardship whatsoever. I've been by the site. I've looked at the site. They can fence the backyard in. They keep the dogs in. There are plenty of ways to do that without a six foot solid fence down the road. I, I, I can't support this. It's, if it, there's a hardship, it's self-imposed, but I can't support that. Uh, Dick, actually, I agree with you. I mean, because you can you can move 10 feet back and have a six foot solid fence. And the, the hardship to that is not being able to build the garage you want. And the reason I was asking where it goes is because is because there seems to be a heck of a lot of room for a garage. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, I mean, I agree. And, and it seems like that there's, I don't know, it feels like a little chicken and egg here of in terms of process and uh, coming to us to ask for a variance before it, it it goes through the normal process. I mean, I guess maybe they could have gone either either way, but yeah, the, the hardship I don't see. You know, I, I was trying to think back over the last couple of years of, of fences that have been approved, and and the circumstances I think were very different. Um, the settings were different. The issues were different, um, and, and this one. You know, I, I don't see, uh, it just seems like it's a very large piece of property and I don't see the, the hardship other than uh, the unfortunate amount of time it would take to move it, which I, I certainly respect. But in terms of what we're obligated to do by our rules, I don't see a, an avenue to do what they're asking us to do through the rules that we're bound to, to go by. Okay, um, I would make a motion that we disapprove the request for a variance based on the fact that there are no physical characteristics of the property that require uh, not that require that you invade the um, ten foot setback, and the hardship seems to be self imposed, and there is injury to the neighboring property, and there is the potential that there is harm to the public welfare. I'll second that. Got a motion, got a second. I, in, in, in a discussion, I, I would like, if you please indulge me just a moment to pontificate. Uh, this this is a, a reoccurring problem uh, because there's what seems to be an obvious disconnect between uh, enforcement and permitting. Uh, you're not required to to have a permit, yet you are subject to the to the uh, the punishment, if you will. And ignorance of the law is no excuse, I, I, I grant you that, but I don't know why the council in their wisdom or, or at a minimum codes uh, in their ability to do some sort of outreach to uh, fence building contractors, uh, something has to be done because we're going to keep getting these. People are doing this in good faith and, and then are forced to come and ask uh, for variance and they have to come with a hardship when the reality is it's like they just didn't know and it's it's not obvious whereas in everything else that we're asked to review there's a mechanism before they start to say you know you might want to look at this rule and uh, I don't know what it, what it is but maybe it's a, a sign stapled on the boards at Home Depot uh, of the fence panels or something but something has to be done because this is costing the city money and it's costing us time and and I know just in what they're paying the five of us to do this is just cost us a, a ridiculous amount of money. <laughs> that is the end of my pontification on this issue. Actually, I very much agree with that. I mean, you need a permit for almost everything else. I'm not sure why there wouldn't be a permit for fences because we are getting a lot of these cases. But back to the motion. I think we've got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes. Chairman, I had to step away for just a moment. Who was the motion and second? Really? I was pontificating to you, Joy. No, I'm sorry. Where were you? Uh, that's, uh, it was my motion and Dick's second. And did you hear the motion? Yeah, I did. Okay. I just didn't hear who said. Thank you.
I think that's why you left, so we wouldn't have to hear that. Okay, Mr. Chairman, um, I had a so that case is uh, denied uh, on vote of five and zero. Five and zero. Okay. And can we take a five-minute break? Can I before you do that? I have an I have an app case that has something uh, emergencies come up and they need um, to defer till a, another meeting. Um, so I'm going to call. Um, if there's opposition, um, this appeal is an item A appeal, which is typically an appeal between the codes department and the applicant. I want to make sure there aren't any third parties here uh, that are involved. From the standpoint of the codes department, speaking for them, I have no problem with the deferral given the situation that's arisen with this applicant, and I don't want to keep them any longer than I have which to. Which case is it? This is case number uh, 42. Are there any other parties present on case 42? interested parties at all. Mr. Chairman, the applicant needs to defer uh, one meeting. Uh, I, and from the department, we would ask that you take this case first next time. Um, yes, that's fine. Absolutely I fine. That. I do need a motion and second on that, please. We've got a motion to defer till the next meeting and that they be first on the agenda. I'll second it. Got a motion, got a second. All in favor? All right. Uh, all right. Any opposed? This case will be heard June 19th. It'll be the first case. It'll be at 1 o'clock. Thank you, ma'am. And um, good luck to you. All right. With that, the board stand in recess. Uh, we'll return in approximately five minutes or so. Forty-two. Yep. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll get back started. Uh, the board is now back in session. Mr. Chairman, when we left, we were we had just deferred case forty-two to next meeting um, due to an applicant needed to run from us. Had something. Emergency come up. The uh, next case I'll call is case 2014-35, uh, Lowen and Associates, LLC, the appellant, LandDevelopment.com, Incorporated, the owner of the property is located at 768 East Argyle, requesting a special exception uh, in the 8th Avenue street setback as well as Argyle, the height requirements at the rear and the street and the variance in the driveway location in CS UZO to construct 12 single-family townhomes uh, consisting of two buildings referred to the board under section 1712035 D1, 1712060 F1, 1720160 A2, and 1712020. The appellant has alleged the board would have jurisdiction under section 1740-180 items B and C. The, the um, applicant's present. If you'll come forward, please, gentlemen. Thank you. The uh, subject properties you see here are in blue for some strange reason. They're usually in red, but um, these are the two parcels. Uh, these parcels, actually, this property map, these parcels are going to be combined if they have not done so already. I believe they have. This is the uh, subject site, which you see on the area photograph at the intersection of 8th and Argyle. Um, give you some landmarks just to the northwest of here is the uh, city reservoir up on the hill. Um, just slightly, that large empty track of land is the reservoir park. Uh, Wedgwood would be to the south, I believe two blocks. Uh, the nature of the quest, and I'm sending before you a copy of their landscape plan too, if Stephanie, if you'll pass that down to the members. Um, the site plan showing the landscape, yeah. Mr. Dale's got some others coming around to you as well. Um, this is a special exception in the street setbacks off of Argyle and 8th. A, um, also a special exception uh, also on the rear setback now of a 10-foot uh, setback there. That's along the eastern property line. And a variance in the driveway distance from the intersection at, at 8th Avenue. The, um, as it relates to the, the uh, variance on the driveway Interception. We sent this to Public Works. Public Works takes no exception to the uh, request, and they will obviously look at it on the permitting side. Uh, that having been said, I've actually talked to a traffic engineer. They they really take no exception to the request, and they mean it. I said, well, why don't you just put your approval? And he said, well, we still need to see it on the actual permit side. Um, so, but that having been said, their office actually, uh, if they do agree with it, ultimately they can waive that requirement altogether. But. Um, so this board will need to make um, some motion on that as well. Um, this is looking at the subject property. Uh, you'll notice in the photographs, um, 
and the day I shot this photo, I got soaked. It it rained pretty much all day. So some of the photos you'll see will be quite dark. Is that um, your umbrella? That is not an umbrella. That is actually a crochet. Love that. Uh, of, is it yours? No, I, okay. I have no such talents. Um, but someone has crocheted on the fence a couple of places. Pretty neat, but um, that is my sign. I did put that there. This is looking from 8th Avenue into the subject site. And then views um, west, um, standing in, inside the site fence itself, looking uh, to the west, up toward Reservoir Park, up on the hill there. The reservoir sits back in that area. Views north of the subject site, and then from East Argyle. Uh, then a view along 8th Avenue. Um, and then the um, subject property there at the south, at the intersection of East Argyle and 8th on the opposing corner. But uh, this is the um, this is the um, site plan submitted by the applicants. You've got the landscape plan, uh, members. Since it's been a little while since we met, um, let me just go over briefly the two things you're to consider in these special exceptions. On setback, uh, an applicant shall demonstrate to the board that. Uh, the proposed building setback shall not create an adverse impact on the adjacent properties nor detract from a strong pedestrian friendly environment. And as it relates to the height of the structure, um, that the applicant shall provide to the board that the proposed building height shall not create an adverse impact on light, air, shadow, or wind velocity patterns due to the configuration of the buildings relative to the uh, permitted height standards. Uh, in addition, the applicant shall demonstrate that the proposed building height contributes to and does not detract from a strong pedestrian friendly streetscape. So those are your standards of review in this case. And with that, I'll turn it over to the appellants. Uh, before I do, though, are there any parties present opposed to case 35? Okay, do you have some parties present? Again, you'll have 15 minutes to present your testimony after the appellants. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to you guys. Joey, what, what was the height? I understand. I don't see height on the because they are uh, penetrating that front setback. They're automatically violating the sky plane. The sky plane starts at the setback. Um, the overall height of the structures are not in violation of the permitted height here in CS. You are allowed to do up to 30 feet in height at the setback. I uh, don't believe these structures are going over 30 feet in height, but that height portion is because they're encroaching out front. I'm uh, one of the people here representing the applicant on this. Jim Lowen is the architect. Uh, that The height thing sort of confused me a little bit, too, because our building is only 30 foot high. But now I understand, since we're within that front setback, uh, that's, why, that's an automatic violation, I guess, of the height. Uh, I guess what I would say about it is a special exception case. I think the main thing that you're looking at are the street setbacks and probably the rear yard setback. And uh, actually, I mean, this is a, a, an area that uh, it's emerging. Uh, this was uh, it's a CS zone property, and so this is an adaptive reuse, trying to introduce building stock, you know, within a walkable distance of downtown. Um, and these are just more or less townhome attached units, um, and I think they're very, uh, will probably be very affordable units, and something that could, would be very successful. But the shallower setbacks actually. Uh, create a better streetscape and help to promote activity and walkability, uh, both of which critical goals of the uh, Nashville general plan. So the, the setback here doesn't detract from walkability. It actually enhances it and creates a, street, a streetscape. So uh, and as far as the rear setback is concerned, um, I guess our burden would show that it has no negative impact on adjacent property owners. As I understand it, uh, we would be allowable to put a uh, reduced buffer there, which would have a 10-foot concrete concrete wall, which is our 10-foot wall, which we're actually proposing to do. And I think the proximity to the building to that wall is, is going to be, uh, will not create any burden to the adjacent properties and should have a negative impact. Um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, the architect's here. He can talk or answer questions about the building itself. Um, Tell us about your community meeting. Uh, well, we, we did not have a community, community meeting. We sent out a letter to the surrounding neighborhood that we were given uh, the addresses for describing the project. Joey? Yeah, we're gonna have to do. Under your rules and applicants, you're required to hold a neighborhood meeting. Um, pretty much this case has stopped at this point. Um, 
and it goes back to we've had court cases in the past dealing with this community meeting the court has determined and deemed that this uh, meeting is a mandatory meeting and this board cannot act on any request until that meeting occurs uh, so as secretary of this board I'm gonna put a stop to this hearing now um, and this case will be deferred and the applicant is required to host a neighborhood meeting here and I and I, and I realize that it may have inconvenienced all the folks present uh, but this board by uh, previous court cases is precluded from hearing this case until this meeting occurs. Um, and so jo jo Joanne, it, it would, since we are deferring it, it sure would be nice if the planning department is met with two beforehand to meet some of the concerns that they have in there. Certainly, and and I advise the the, um, the um, yeah, and, and if, if hypothetically appellants to meet with the planning commission staff. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, this doesn't occur frequently, and I apologize. Uh, but this hearing is over. Uh, we will continue the public hearing to be over, uh, to be open. Uh, folks can still submit evidence or letters or questions or concern into the record. The record remains open. Um, the applicants, as long as you still have that that letter, that mail list, uh, will ask that you send out that notice uh, host a neighborhood meeting and provide us proof thereof before I reschedule you and I'll leave it to you all to set the date we won't mandate but as soon as you have it wherever I'm at in the cycle I'll put you back on the agenda yeah we apologize I, I think this is probably one of Jim's first uh, I guess has not probably been appeared before the board before and probably didn't understand exactly what needed to be done I think he knew he, had, he needed to notify the public and whether or not he actually had to have a face-on meeting I think was confusing to him Indeed. so we apologize for any inconvenience uh, we will talk to planning we have talked to them uh, we we're prepared to talk about that but when we come back uh, we'll do that well and also just a suggestion invite mm -hmm. your council person too, as well as the th people within three sure absolutely absolutely yeah appreciate it very much thanks thank you and Joey, the next case, case um, 037 on 3627 and 3629 Woodmont Boulevard, I'm recusing myself. Um, someone from my law firm is representing this client, the property owner, so I'm recusing myself. Okay, Mr. Chairman, the uh, record reflect um, Mr. Ewing is recused from this case. Um, for matters of housekeeping on the prior case, um, just for everyone's purposes, the, the hearing is still, the public, um, the record is still open, so folks can still submit records. I will schedule them. Um, our notice requirement has been met in this case. Um, this is a, a flaw in the applicant's submittal, and so we'll just defer it until they correct that flaw and get it back to you. Okay. Uh, with that, case 35 is deferred to a later date, and I will notice that. Uh, I do recommend to the applicant hold that meeting as soon as you possibly can. We only have uh, two meetings in the next month uh, remaining, so just as soon as that occurs, I'll reschedule. Okay, Mr. Chairman, case 36 was approved on consent. We're now at case 37. Um, this is an item A appeal. Mr. Jonathan Sundock is the appellant. Aaron Hetrick, owner of the property at question located at 3627 and 3629 Woodmont Boulevard. Uh, the applicant, Mr. Sundock, is requesting an item A appeal. That is an appeal of the zoning administrator's interpretation of section 1712030C2, which I will read that into the record. And talk about it for you in regards to reduced setbacks on side streets. Referred to the board under section 174180A and 172030C2. The applicant has alleged the board would have jurisdiction on section 174180. These appeals are um, somewhat different than our usual two two party appeals. There are actually three three parties and potentially more involved in this appeal. Um, so the process will be first to um, I'll explain read the section into the record. Um, talk just very briefly about what the uh, coach department talks about that means. I'll then turn it over to the zoning administrator. He will have 15 minutes to present uh, any testimony he wish to give. He can do that from, from his seat here. Um, give me one second. Sir. Um, then I'll turn it over to the appellants, Mr. Sundock, and his uh, counsel uh, for 15 minutes. You, sir, being the applicant, you do have a rebuttal period, so be sure to save some of your 15. Uh, the, the third party involved will be the owner or any other interested parties. You'll have 15 minutes. You do not get a rebuttal. Um, so your time is, is the 15 minutes as well as any other parties 
who wish to speak. For Mr. Sundock, if you have other parties who wish to address this board, uh, other neighbors or something, that does count toward your 15. Um, so work that time out with your folks accordingly for you guys come up. And Julie, uh, could you, for the benefit of everybody involved, yes. uh, maybe go over the issue? Yes. That I we only have four voting members. One second. Um, Mr. Chairman, let me read into the record section 1712030. C2, the code states um, at this, this is under street setbacks, uh, letter C. Number two says, uh, is a two part paragraph. The first part is not at issue here, it's the second, but I'm going to read the whole for the record. Uh, when the rear setback of a corner lot is oriented toward the rear setback of a neighboring lot, the required street setback along the side common to those two lots may be reduced by 50%. The second sentence is what is at issue. A corner residential lot created by Platt prior to the effective date of the ordinance codified in this chapter, and I'm adding these words, that date is January 1st, 1998, may reduce the required setback of table 1712030A. Again, that table is the setback table by 50% along the street running parallel with the side of the residential structure. So again, do you, do you all understand the, the last paragraph I read? And I'll be happy to reread it uh, if you do have any questions. Because that is that second part of that paragraph is what is before you today. Okay. Members, do you have no more questions for me? Um, I will turn it over to the uh, zoning minister. Yes, it, Mr. Harper. You might want to mention for everybody involved again that there's only four people yes. voting and what that means. Again, we have four members present. Um, four members are participating. Um, the appellants, Mr. Sundock and his counsel, you'll need all four votes to grant your application. In the event you fail to get four votes, we will reschedule for the next available hearing. As you heard at the beginning, it's right now August 21st. I'm efforting a sooner meeting. I can tell you no sooner could I get you here um, than August the 7th anyway, um, just given notice and, and such. But I am trying to make an effort to, to hold a meeting so we don't have such large agendas each time. Um, but you won't need all four affirmative votes to grant your application today. All right. Um, I guess with that, I'll turn it over to the Zoning Minister. Mr. Herbert, you're on the clock. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I have prepared a memorandum that uh, was distributed to you all um, yesterday or the day before. Um, and I won't rehash all of that. I'm sure that you all have read it. We've got... Um, um, attorneys here on both sides to argue uh, both sides of this issue. Um, also want to let you all know that I've, that we've got David Klein here from the uh, mapping division of the planning department. Um, and David, would you stand up so they would know who you are? Um, David maps horizontal property regimes and maps all the, uh, the properties uh, for the county um, and has a lot of practical um, knowledge on with respect to this issue and horizontal property regimes um, uh, together. Um, the issue here is um, whether or not um, the corner lot in question um, was created by a plat before or after 1998. Um, initially, uh, the property was subdivided um, and a plat was recorded in 1935 that established the underlying lots. Um, in 2013, a horizontal property regime was created to essentially make condominium development here. And so the horizontal property regime um, dictates um, what the estates are uh, in this property. In other words, what it does is it shows um, structures that will be residential structures. It delineates where the common areas are on the subject property and can designate wherever any other limited common elements uh, may be. Um, so the issue here is, um, was this property, this corner lot created by Platt before 1998? So is it the 1935 Platt that originally created it, that divided the dirt to create this property? Um, is that the controlling Platt? Or is it the Platt that was filed along with the horizontal property regime um, in 2013? 
If it's the latter, it's obviously um, been platted after 1998, and the, um, the corner lot would not be entitled to the reduction of the side setback uh, by 50%. Um, this is something of, of a novel legal issue. Uh, I'm not aware of much, if any, law is on the subject. Um, I would say that um, um, to listen to the lawyers on both sides of this, and um, they're going to be prepared to argue um, one for and one against. Um, so the bottom line is, is what plat um, is, uh, controls here? Um, it's my position that the horizontal property regime, the plat under the horizontal property regime, um, does not create lots. That the lot was created by the subdivision process in 1935. What the horizontal property regime does is create estates in property. It doesn't divide dirt to create lots. That's my position on it. Now, I'm going to hand it over to the attorneys and let them argue both for and against. If you all have any other questions to me, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Okay, I believe the uh, appellant can come up. Members of the board, my, my name is Ron Purcell. I'm with the firm of North Purcell and Ramos and Jamison in Nashville, Tennessee. I represent Mr. Sundock, who is an affected property owner. Uh, Mr. Sundock's property is immediately behind the property on Woodmont facing on Gracewood. Uh, and uh, Mr. Herbert did a great job in confining the issues to what it is. It's a very narrow issue that we're dealing with. Uh, the issue is, which is the controlling plat. If, if the 1935 plat is controlling, then the statute is operative. They can reduce the uh, side setback by 50%, no question. If, the, uh, if it's not controlling, and it's the plat that was filed with the, filed with the Horizontal Property Regime Act, uh, then it occurred after 1998, and they can't reduce it by 50% on the side setback on Gracewood. The, um, the premise uh, of our position is that this is not a lot that was created that they're, they're building on. And I would agree with Mr. Uh, Herbert as it relates to the issue associated with the Horizontal Property Regime Act, which was originally enacted for the purposes of being able to convert apartments to condominiums without having to go through the planning process. Uh, it's been expanded <laughs> since its original creation. Uh, but in this particular case, there are three lots that constitute the, the lot that is being utilized to uh, build these two duplexes. Uh, the, the lots under the 1935 plat are lots one, two, and three going from Grayswood to the east. They're all about 20, a little over 25 foot in width. Uh, and when it's our contention that when they filed the Horizontal Property Regime Act, what they did is, is created a de facto partition of lot number two because they have these structures overlapping the boundaries of two lots. So the, you're either having a de facto subdivision as, as it lets to lot two, or by way of this Horizontal Property Regime Act, or they're not permissible to build because on one lot that was created by the 1935 plat, lot one, it's only 25 feet wide. So if they're gonna build a structure on that and they're gonna have a 10 foot setback, which they could do as long as they build on that one lot, the, the building would be 10 feet wide. Five foot interior setback, 10 foot uh, side stage setback, we got a 10 foot in width. That's perfectly permissible for them to do that. Don't dispute it. But that's not what they're requesting at, at the uh, approval of and not what was approved by uh, zoning. They approved two residences being constructed on three lots with both residents overlapping lot number two. And, and our contention is that's a de facto subdivision, a partition of that lot. Therefore, the, the, the plat that was recorded with the Horizontal Property Regime Act creating this PUD, in essence, had a, a subdivision to it. And since it had a subdivision component of it, it is now the operative plat. And since it occurred after 1998, they don't have the option of reducing it by 50% on the set, side setback line. That's pretty much the substance of it. And I'd like to reserve the rest of my time, at least for any questions you have or for rebuttal. 
And then, let me also add that I'm Mr. Sundock. Uh, we also have a number of neighbors who are in our neighborhood who are substantially interested in this matter. Um, the legal argument is important, obviously, but. In addition to that, the 10-foot setback that's, propo that's proposed would be a substantial variation in the neighborhood. So there is a tremendous consequence to Grayswood Avenue and our view up to Woodmont that would result if this is not stopped in terms of that setback. If I could, I just wanted to ask the folks who are here uh, who are from our neighborhood to stand. This is a fraction of the people who, and I really very much appreciate them being here, and it's a fraction of the folks who are very much interested. In fact, um, the Neighborhood Association president is here, and we're going to uh, reserve some of our time for her to speak. And well over 20 or more um, letters were sent in uh, for, your, for your information in opposition of what this developer is seeking to do. Chairman, if uh, these are the appellant, so they need to speak now before rebuttal. Or at least identify at themselves. At least yeah. introduce yeah. themselves. Yes. If there's anybody they, else that you want to speak, they should come up and introduce themselves. If you themselves. want them to speak Just on right. rebuttal. Yes. Let's, I'd like to do that, please. Just for the purposes of, of the record. I'm sorry. Can I ask just a procedural question? And, and I'm going to apologize right now. Mr. Sundot, yes. I'm not going to recuse myself no. either way. But didn't I represent you at one point? In, you and I have worked together yes. on a matter. Okay. I, but I don't remember what it was, and it's been a while. I actually <laughs> now do, and, and I just... I'm not going to recuse myself because I haven't helped Mr. Sundock on this matter whatsoever. And in fact, obviously, we haven't worked together. But you were my client at one point in time, so I'd like to put that on the record. But it's not on this matter, so I'm not recusing myself. I just wanted it on the record. Uh, the, the other thing uh, about the rebuttal issue, beyond introducing uh, anybody that you want available for rebuttal, yes. anything they want on record uh, should go now because rebuttal is reserved for items brought up in opposition only. So uh, we don't allow uh, new evidence to be entered upon rebuttal unless it was mentioned in the opposition, if that makes sense. Uh, understood. Thank you. Jane, go ahead. Go ahead. My name is Jane Kelly. I'm a property owner within this neighborhood. I'm diagonal to the property in question. I'm also here today as president of the Wimbledon to Woodmont Neighborhood Association. This association opposes setbacks of 10 feet along the side of these proposed buildings. Um, if you look at the code, it actually says that the setbacks may be reduced by 50 feet, may be reduced. Um, and so we're asking that they not be reduced by 50 feet. There are other reasons why why the Neighborhood Association opposes this site plan. One is the character of the neighborhood. This neighborhood was established in 1940 most of the homes are existing today. What the site plan shows is putting four separate homes on this one plot of land. Whereas when you look around the surrounding properties, it would be wildly out of keeping with what you would see. We also oppose this um, site plan because of safety. Um, if you look, and, and I think one of our neighbors is sharing with you some pictures of this intersection. This property is along the corner of Grayswood Avenue and Wimbledon, uh, excuse me, Woodmont Boulevard. Caddy corner across Woodmont is Lynbrook Road. Already, when we try to exit our neighborhood on Woodmont Boulevard, we are sitting at a stop sign and coping with uh, the increased speed on Woodmont. It is already a daunting task to turn onto Woodmont. And if setbacks are reduced along the side, and if they are also reduced along the front, which is proposed in the site plan, it would dramatically uh, complicate vehicular safety. Additionally, um, this connection between Grayswood Avenue and Lindbrook Road is the only connection of two local streets that cross Woodmont between Hillsborough Road and Harding Road. This means, and you would see it if you came to see our neighborhood, day and night, pedestrians, strollers, bikers are using this as a safe crossing. Within the community plan, the transport 
transportation plan shows that a greenway is planned along Sugar Tree Creek. It would be the only crossing on the other side of Woodmont allowing people to safely come down to Sugar Tree Creek Greenway and access Green Hills. And if we're looking for other ways to promote pedestrian safety, I think it would be important to consider that. Finally, there's no accommodation for guest parking in the site plan. Already on Grayswood Avenue, those of us who live there, we depend on our front yards for guest parking. Um, with reduced setbacks, it would not allow for guest parking for these four homes that have would essentially eight garages. Where are their guests and their construction visitors uh, park? They would be parking down along Grayswood already where we're utilizing our own front yards for that. Thank you so much for listening for my comments. Um, yes, I'm, I'm Mary Margaret Peel. I'm Mary Margaret Peel and I live at 3615 Woodmont Boulevard, which is two doors down from the property in dispute. Um, as you know, using the horizontal property regime, the owner of 3625 has subdivided this property and plans to build four 26-foot wide houses, um, move them almost 30 feet closer to the street and 10 feet closer to the side. Um, I used a comparable view of things that were on Glen Echo that have been built that are 26 feet wide. They're actually on more property than the Witherspoon property, but they are a demonstration of 26-foot wide wide houses. You also see that they will go up taller. I don't know if 30 feet is the limit. Does somebody mention 30 feet in the previous uh, case? But anyway, uh, they will be closer to Grayswood. They will be closer to Woodmont. They will be more than twice the height of the building that's there. And Grayswood slopes downhill. So the visibility is even more exaggerated. Plus the drainage from these units is even more exaggerated. So um, that's um, that. And then also most of the property along Woodmont is at least 70 feet from Woodmont, and this is going to be 40 feet from Woodmont. So I know Woodmont setbacks are a separate issue, but that was what I was showing. That This is sort of incorporated all in this one. Uh, chart. And if I might just add, I have letters, uh, emails from 12 additional neighbors who could not be present today um, that should have been submitted in time for, to be on record, but I have copies of those as well. Thank you. I, I apologize. I can't see very well. Is oh, I'm sorry. Is, yes. is the top picture the, the house, <coughs> the, that this, house is going to go away? And the yeah, other. this is going away. That, that's what these are. Okay. Uh, so it's that top. Okay. That's, I know that's exactly. the Wichita property. That's a sample of 26 foot wide houses. That's the view from the back of 26 foot wide Okay. Okay, but I'm, I'm just trying to ID the oh, property yeah. and yeah, I'm out. Okay. I, have a, um, I, I gave those pictures to Joey to oh, yeah. add to the record. Okay, yeah, that's, that's the property. I'm sorry, I just okay. see you. Yeah. I've got a question for Mr. Purcell. That, um, the house that's there now that is, I guess you'd given us an exhibit, a site plan. That, that was a site plan that was attached to the uh, right. building permit application. Okay, and so it has numbers of it has, on the the 25 feet sections that um, Mr. Herbert was talking about are numbered one, two, three, four, five, and six. And mm -hmm. is it all six of those now that make up the current where the current house is? Uh, no, I don't think the current house e exists over all six of those lots. It, I think it takes up maybe four of them, uh, may get into the fifth lot, but it's it okay. doesn't go all the way to uh, six. Okay, but it does it does cross over. In, it, it crosses in, over some, some of the property boundary lines. Okay. And they're not consolidating those six <clears throat> lots. It would remain six lots, it, one of them. It, it appears to be remaining six lots according to what their application is. Okay. I'm sorry, do we have any other questions? No, I want to be sure we're actually not waiting or listening to the merits of anything other than the interpretation of whether or not the, uh, as our administrator said a minute ago, is applicable, right? And Mr. King, you hit it on the head. The Metro Code basically with these item A appeals requires you in this instance to say, did the zoning administrator act in error? I don't think acted arbitrarily as part of the allegation at this right. point, but just is he in error in his interpretation? So the basis of the discussion today is to which side is correct in the, the interpretation of the, the zoning code, right? Okay. So, it, yeah. Okay, so if we don't have any other questions, I guess now we would 
hear from the original applicant and I guess, yes, the next group. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. And the purposes of keeping everything on track, this is the, um, the third, the owner and the owner's uh, council. Um, these gentlemen will have 15 minutes to present. You do not get a rebuttal, so this is your, your time to speak. Uh, that clock's over to your right. I'll let you keep track of your own time. Hello, Adam Lefevre on behalf of Aaron Hedrick, the property owner. I'm going to start with the item A issues and get into some of the extrinsic evidence that was just raised. But to start with, just the legal interpretations. Uh, Mr. Purcell's argument, the last portion seemed to sum it up in the end. He said that the lots are going to remain. For the appellant's or applicant's argument to be correct, you have to show that the plat that was filed in 2013 as an exhibit to the HBR supersedes the underlying 1935 plat. Mr. Purcell just stated again that the lots remain. If you'll look at the plat, Joey, can you put this up? Do you have that? If you look at the proposed building there, you can see the underlying lots are still remaining. That plat doesn't negate, wipe out, extinguish any of those lots that are still there. And this issue has been addressed by the Tennessee Attorney General, and that opinion is attached to Mr. Herbert's letter that he issued to the board. The Tennessee Attorney General opinion said that the HPR subdivision of land does not constitute a division of land. It just constitutes a division of the usage rights in that land. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, if if um, if I were to go down Woodmont and I were to look at this, and I'm I'm acting like I'm speaking, I'll speak just for myself. But sure. I think it was it's reasonable for me if I just went down Woodmont and turned around and looked at this house. I would say, and you said, "What well, what is this house on?" I'd say it's on a lot. And now you tell me it's on five lots, and. Um, Help me understand the difference between, and in the picture it looks like you're taking the five lots and you're dividing them into two lots. Um, and it, it almost feels a little like you're kind of taking the best of both rules and, and applying them to, to me. And, and I'm just saying that's how, my, how it look on the surface. So tell me, in kind of in, in your legal opinion, why is that? You know, why are we saying, well, lot one is, is still a lot and therefore I can build a lot uh, or build a house on lot one and lot two, but still consider lot one a, hot, uh, a lot. But if you looked at the existing piece of property, it's really five lots. I mean, it, it all of a sudden is really confusing. And Right, and the ownership is the issue there. You can't convey lot one or two with these horizontal property regimes. They don't own the dirt. They own the usage rights. So that structure that you see, the rectangular portion, is literally all the person owns. They have usage rights with the diagonal lines that are in that uh, plan that's recorded there. And so you might say that, yes, it looks like it's sitting on a lot, but it's not conveyable property that it's sitting on. Uh, were you finished? Or sufficiently confused? Yeah, I mean, that... I, it's, it's, if you look at the diagonal lines, those are the limited common elements that are associated with each unit. Now, when one of those units sells that property, they don't sell a yard, they sell the usage rights in the yard. So it's not a lot that they own the ground, like you're thinking, when you look at it and say, okay, that house is sitting on a lot. They don't own the ground, they just own the structure. So what was the, pro the property that, that was bought comprised of what numbers? One, two, three, four, five, and six, or just one, two, three, four, five? One, two, three, four, five, and six is originally 3625 Woodmont. Had one address, contained six lots. My client bought it and file two separate HPRs, one on lots one, two, three, and one on lots four, five, six. So when you when you bought when you separated those that one lot into two, did you not create a new lot? No, it's not a new lot. It's there was no division of dirt. The ownership of the lot still remains at thirty six twenty five. The whole point of an HPR for my client is to avoid building six separate houses on each one of those lots, which my client has the right to do. He would rather build four houses instead of six. So it's a way, instead of putting minimal 1,800 square foot houses on each one of those lots, to build what is proposed as a 2,800 square foot house. 
Yes. So why not replat into four? Because then you lose your setback. If you replat, you lose the setback requirement. And this isn't novel. This has been interpreted the same way since 1998. If I can <coughs> hand you these. This is the neighbor directly across Grayswood. Exact same thing, horizontal property regime, setback requirement was cut in half. This is the exact same thing that my client's doing here. It's, it's not novel, it's been interpreted the same way since 1998. Would you like to what see this? It? Yeah. Well, in, in General Summers uh, 2001 op opinion, do you, do you know the specific case I mean, w tell me the relevance between the, the uh, opinion and, and this case one more time. Yeah, the relevance is, as Mr. Herbert, as uh, Mr. Purcell, pardon me, stated, he alleges that this exhibit plat that was filed with the horizontal property regime redivides the 1935 plat. The opinion clearly states that an HPR is not a subdivision or division of land. Is that is that one HPR? Is it? I mean, because it sounds you're, you're telling me that you're doing two. What we're here with is one, two, three. That's one HPR. Four, five, six is another HPR. The appeal only lies on the side setback for the HPR covering lots one, two, and three. Right, but the the, the original lot was one, two, three, four, five, six. Correct. Mm -hmm. And has been since, do you know when? 1935. So when so when that lot was created in 1935, it was one lot that's one, two, three, four, five, six. And it sounds like you're pre dividing that into two units. Four units. No, well, I mean, you got one, two, three, or you said two HB. I don't remember what two the Two horizontal property is. regimes, yes. So you're dividing that one lot into two of those. And I'm asking you, is that, is that not right? It's, it, it's well, according to the, we're according taking six lots yeah, and running a division down through the center of the six lots. Right. And which so is you're already the original The original lot that was created in 1935, and you're dividing it into two. And the question is, is that creating two new lots or not? Uh, according to the Attorney General's opinion, it is well, not. It's I'm not a sorry. division. I, I think you two are talking past each other. Can I, can I try to? Sure. In 1935, six lots were created. One house was built over the six lots. Right. Okay. And Mr. Well, yeah, but just um, to Mr. Taylor's question, I think the verb that you use where there may be some misunderstanding among all three, the board and all the affected parties, is the word divide. I think the word divide, as council here is describing it, has to do with the notion of subdividing property, whereas I think the picture that you see before you demonstrates the defined uses of the property under the two hor horizontal property regimes, one kind of designating common areas as I understand the drawing, one defining um, ownership or living space as it would be in the other. So when you use the term divide, I think that's triggering a series of definitions for the lawyers who say subdivide property which is what's discussed in the Attorney General opinion that was attached as Exhibit C in the Zoning Administrator's memo. Um, I, I feel like I understand where you're going with it, but I think that's where there may be some confusion as to that term. Um, if, if we understand your question to be one of how do these uh, two distinct usage areas, how is that not a subdivision of land, that, uh, that's kind of what I understood your question to be, but I think that may have been where there was some uh, confusion. I hope that my now I, complete eradication of clarity has uh, you know, helped. Well, so, uh, so it was it was never idea. one property. It, it was never one piece divided into two pieces, as as the diagram shows. It, it as he was saying a minute ago, it was six divided into. A, I don't know if "divided" is the right word, but uh, rearranged into four. Four units, correct? Units. Mm -hmm. Is, is there? Uh, there's, there's also something else interesting. On Woodmont, at this point, there were originally four numbered addresses that were left open for this piece of property. Uh, each one of these units, each one of the four, has been assigned a specific address. So those addresses, it's a strange gap in Woodmont Boulevard, but those addresses were reserved there. The addresses skip this piece of property. And each one of these units, again, is now 36, 23, 25, 27, and 29. It's rare that you have a piece of property where the addresses are reserved like that. And 
And who reserved those? What back when was that decision was made? Back in 1935. So that would have been the city? Or Are there examples in, on Woodmont where uh, houses were built on any one lot as we're defining them? And I'll define them as the examples of one, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, this um, that I showed you here, this one that I brought up, the neighbor across Grayswood, that sits on lots 9, 10, 11, and 12. But none, none from 1935. I'm, I'm, I'm asking when. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of you know, of when they divided these 25 by really long. 150 you know, approximately. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm just trying to get a sense of of what ended up happening when houses got built, and maybe understanding the difference between. I, I can only speculate that people wanted larger yards back then. That's no, the I mean, I, I mean, but, but, the, but I, I guess there's, I mean, I just ask, I'm not trying to be argumentative. I'm really trying to understand the situation. Yeah. But there's not an example, or is there an example of a home built on a, just a, a single 25 foot? Oh, in 1935, is there a home on one lot? I'm not aware. Well, or even in 2008, is there one, or 2003? I mean, there's not one now, even the one, the two houses you mentioned are built on three. So, I mean, there's not, there's, there's. I guess I'm just trying to, to get a sense, is it reasonable to think that, that a home would be built on, on a single number well, one? I don't want to answer for him, but I mean, someone had that intent as evidenced by the subdivision of these, of these plats. I mean, when it was laid out, somebody decided to put them in 25 foot increments for maybe so that they would always reason. be always be combined and, into bigger and I, I, yeah, I would suggest that probably economics drove the fact that people could just just like in my neighborhood from the 40s a house burns down the neighbor will buy it so that there's not another house built there so they can have a bigger yard right and this in this stretch of woodmont was the first paved street in the city so it was a subdivision back then it was right it was pretty far out to the extent of the city so right in front of these, this house is again where they started platting these lots one through six. That was new areas of the city limits. It's the first paved road. So it was very deliberately done, lots one through six. Can, can I get you just to speak, because it's not a concept that's intuitive to non-real estate lawyers, mm -hmm. is um, the idea of an estate, what an estate in the property is? Yeah, the estate that we all typically think of is a fee simple estate, um, and I don't. I know most of you know this, so I'll, I'll repeat it. But if you own your house, you typically own a fee simple interest in the in the house. You own your house, you own the land, you own everything on top of it. When you're in a horizontal property regime like this, or like the other plan I showed you, the neighbor across Grayswood, you own the house and what's in between it, but you don't own the land. You own the usage rights in the land. So, for example, if you can look at the plat that my client has proposed, you see you have unit one and unit two, and the corresponding diagonal lines are limited common elements that are reserved for that unit. Now, when that unit sells, he doesn't, or it doesn't sell unit two plus the land around unit two, it only sells unit two plus the usage of. The limited common elements. So, who who remains the owner of the dirt? The, who is the owner of the dirt? Uh, under a horizontal property regime, there are a couple things that have to be established. You have to file the master deed, which everybody has seen. You have to start an association, a uh, homeowners association, which everybody's seen. And there's a couple other requirements. Uh, you have to file a plat. The homeowners association is technically the owner of all that land. Okay, so you when you when you convey one of these properties with a deed, you'll be conveying unit two of Woodmont Manor phase two, a horizontal property regime. So you're not conveying unit two and the yard, you're only conveying the unit and the usage of these limited private elements that are on the plat. Okay, does that answer or do you need me to elaborate more? So so the homeowner association, will that will there be a different homeowner association for one, two, three? 
There, with the proposal, again, we're just here on lots one, two, three, but with all six lots, there are two associations. There's a Woodmont Manor one homeowners association. There's a Woodmont Manor two homeowners association. Can I answer my question about division where I got my, my non-lawyer language mixed up. <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, so it, uh, yeah. So it, so in, in common sense, practical purposes, the place where there is one home now will be two separate homeowner association owned entities. Correct, and that's common throughout the city right now. That's, that's, mm -hmm. That was what I wanted to know. Right. And I'll leave the item A issues for a minute and address uh, some of the extrinsic issues that were raised by the applicant and the witnesses. I, I'm afraid that some of the witnesses are misinformed the front setback of these houses is going to be 75 feet off of Woodmont, or the building structure is going to be 75 feet off of Woodmont. Uh, the witness that was at the microphone uh, prior to me coming up here said that most of the houses in Woodmont are about 70 feet off the street. This one's going to be 75, so right in line with that. Um, there, I've read the letters that were presented to the board in opposition to my client's development, and most of them, it almost looks like a cut and paste, but the template says, when you come up to the stop sign at Woodmont and you're looking left and right, this will make it hard to see traffic. These structures are gonna be 75 feet off of Woodmont. It's not gonna impede anybody's view looking left or right down Woodmont Boulevard. Am I, can I, I'm, am I reading this wrong? Because I see 47, am I, and I don't see all that well anymore, but I see, what's that? Yeah, that's to the property line, not to the street. So it's the right-of-way. So the, the front of these structures, if you leave the edge of the street, will be 75 feet from the edge of the street. Approximately. Approximately. You're talking edge of pavement, correct? Edge of pavement, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. So there's another, there's a, there's 30 feet between the property line and the edge of, I give or take 25 feet, say. Is that correct, Jim? Approximately, okay. yes. Okay. And which, even which, the side setback we're talking about on Grayswood that will remain approximately 25 feet off the pavement from Grayswood. So although it's a 10-foot setback, it's actually 25 feet off the street. N neither of which is an issue. The 25 feet off the street is, is the issue. Well, depending on the interpretation that we yeah. Correct. choose. Correct. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the numbers aren't necessarily germane. It's, yeah. it's which the, uh, definition of uh, of this hunk O property. So presently, there are six lots there, correct? Correct. One house, one dwelling. One house, correct. Going across four or five different property lines, correct? Going across um, 160 approximate feet, yes. But if you're looking at the present house that's there right now, you can't see any of these lots. It's right. just one house on a piece of land. So the house actually crosses a property line? The lot lines. It crosses the lot lines from 1935. You have, you have the property line of the house and then so the individual lots. Will the lot lots lines. ever combine into one? No, they have not been combined into one. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, what's on the screen for you is the 1935 plat and the, you've heard the testimony one through six, it's these lots, block C of the Woodmont Acres plat, and there's the date of recording, August of 35. And so if you'll look at, Joey, does that say Stokes? It does. Stokes Avenue is, is actually Grayswood now, but okay. at the time of recording, it was Stokes Avenue. Right. Okay. So if you look at lots one, two, three, my client's proposing to build two structures on that. If you look across Grayswood at, I think, 12, 11, 10, uh, you may have said this, and I just want to make sure I heard this, but mm -hmm. one through six were bought 
and, and that was defined as a, as, as a, one parcel. As one parcel, mm -hmm. and and I'm sure ownership has changed, but it's always been that same definition. The one parcel, lots one through six, as far as I'm aware, since 1935, has been conveyed as a whole. Mm -hmm. Point of personal privilege, and I'm mm -hmm. not cutting you guys off at all. I'm, I'm planning on asking our friend from Metro Mapping up to answer any questions we have before rebuttal, if that's fine with the board, because that is a resource available to us that might be able to answer those questions. I think this is a very unique case, so I think maybe not only he, but we can get the governor or somebody to talk to us. To. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a unique case, and it, it's occurring a lot in Nashville right now, mainly in... 12 South and Sylvan Park areas. The exception to what my client is doing is in 12 South Sylvan Park, you'll have somebody buying one of these lots and forming an HPR on one lot and trying to build two houses on one lot. So if you drive down Carruthers or Halcyon or some of those streets, you actually see these little shotgun houses that are very narrow and they go back. And they're building two of those on one of these city lots. My client's proposing to build two of them on three city lots instead of two on one city lot. So we are in reality seeing the birth of the proverbial theoretical blivet, aren't we? It's been there for a ten, while. This is pounds of well, it, it's not new. This has been going on for a while. As as I said, the the neighbor was in 2008 when they did the exact same thing with a little different configuration of the buildings. So it's not like this is a 2013 or 2014 issue. It's been going on for a while. Do do we have any other questions here? In the, yeah, this is their last. I, I kind of. He still has. What, no, he they, doesn't have a rebuttal. I, 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 kinda, well, I mean, he still has time left on his clock. But he can talk now. Yeah. Well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Herbert's letter was informative when he referred to a horizontal property regime and related it to an overlay, because that's essentially what it is. When you look at the plat from 1935 and you look at the horizontal property regime plan that's filed, it's an overlay. You can still see the lots below what's filed as the HPR. And so it doesn't affect the division of the land like a plat, it's like an overlay. Yeah, I understand that. I guess what I'm struggling with is that, that it, it seems like the spirit of, 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 the, of, of using the word lot would apply only to one if you were gonna build within the confines of that. And that's what I'm struggling with. It's, it's almost like you're, well, you're wanting, you know, there's something about it that, that doesn't feel right, and I'm trying to figure out why. But it, it does feel like that, you know, you're, we're, we've called one through six a lot, we called one through three a lot, then four, five, six a lot, we called only one a lot, and it seems like a lot's whatever you want a lot to be when it suits your own side's needs. Well, and that's what I'm trying to, a to lot struggle of, with. Right, and a lot is what's defined on the plat. Like 1935 defines lots, lots one through six. There's no other definition of a lot anywhere. The 2013, and we call them plaid, but it's really just a formality. It's a lowercase p in the HPR statutes. So it's there are no new lots defined. There are new houses, but there are no new lots. The lots remain. Let me ask you another strange question. Sure. You're familiar with the term adverse possession. I am. Why would that not apply on these six lots here if that one dwelling was on all of that? Why would that not be now one lot, per se, by adverse possession? Well, somebody has to make a claim for adverse possession. I mean, if, if my client technically wanted to claim on his own behalf that the house there adversely possesses six lots and it now should be one, he could do that. But he doesn't want to make that claim. I mean, somebody has to make a claim for adverse possession. It doesn't just happen automatically. And just going back, the, my client has the right to build six separate small houses there, but he would prefer not to do that. He would prefer to build four 
larger houses because the size of the houses that he's proposing to build are more in line with what's in the neighborhood, 2,800 square feet instead of 1,800 square feet. They're more in line and if you build two houses on that lot, you're gonna have to have uh, two houses instead of the four that are proposed, you're gonna have to have million dollar houses and those don't sell very easily right now. And again, it's, it's a way to put four on it instead of six on it. I don't know enough about it to ask anything else. I'm sorry. So <clears throat> if, if you did build the three individual, or three houses on those three, Pre-established lines. Thank you. Um, These setbacks would be what? If you built three on the three there, what would the yes. setbacks be? I don't think plans have been drawn with that, and I don't know what the required setbacks would be if you built three houses on three lots. On the one side, it'd be the ten foot that we were talking about. Because right, we right. Pre-established Right, on the gr thanks, Jack. On the yes. Grayswood right. side, you would still have the ten feet because you'd be going back to the 1935 plan. So you'd still it's have a completely ten likely step. that I did not ask that question right. correctly. I'm glad he understood what I was saying. But yes, okay. Do we have any other questions? Perhaps David Klein could shed some light on it too if he wants to come up and talk. Well, that's actually yeah. what's my next move, if possible. Is that okay with the board? And then we'll save uh, the applicant, or not the applicant, the appellant for rebuttal after Mr. Klein. Mr. Chairman, before you ask Mr. Klein, um, I just want to talk with our council. Under your rules, you are allowed to ask anyone any questions at any time. It says that verbatim. And my question for procedure was, do we put Mr. Klein on clock? And the answer is no. He is not testifying on either party's side. You've asked him. Um, you're you're quizzing his knowledge. So. Um, and just for all parties, he's not timed on this one. And one of the distinct reasons, because I think he is an absolute neutral party. I mean, it's, it's so. Uh, I will start if nobody else has any questions. Okay. Mr. Klein, how many lots... How many lots are we looking at? And when there was one house on it, how many lots were there? There were six lots there on was... one tax parcel of land. Okay. And let's say, and I have no idea, that house was put up in 1944. Mm -hmm. Is there any procedure by which it automatically becomes one lot? No. Okay. And if they are, if the applicant, I guess, is able to build four structures. How many lots will there be then? I would look at it as still six lots underneath and four separate ownerships of property as in the horizontal property regime. And how many tax parcels? Uh, four, one for each unit and two separate ones for what we would call the common area, which we don't wait for the HOA to come in. We put it in ownership in common under the name of the condominium, and we look at it as undividable interest. So each party would own 50% of that common area, and they couldn't convey that out to anyone else. And what the assessor's office does for those parcels is they don't generate a separate tax bill. They'll go out, value the land, and then assess it equally if that's what the regime says, at 50% interest. Okay, my next question is, I mean, because I'm not a real estate attorney either, um, but I think of condominiums, as probably most lay people do, as a big building divided up, looks like apartments, but it's really condos. Yet the applicant is asserting that this is happening more than once in town. Is is that accurate? Even yes, though it layman, is. Like, 
I mean, you don't yes. think of it that way? We see more of this than we do uh, subdivision plots. And do you have any opinion of why that is? Um, I think it's easier. Uh, it's good for infill. It's easier to get that through. Um, and it's, it's just what the market seems to be going towards. They're doing it because they can. Correct. Yes. I mean, it, it seems. It, I mean, it seems to me like it's 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 the kind of a, a way to get two houses on one piece of property without having them connect, which some of the rules say you have to do, and all that kind of. Is that? I mean, it, it, if the creative way to get around and duplex, they can. All we're looking at is to create separate ownership. Mm -hmm. So we look at it as almost in layman's terms. We say if it if you had a duplex there as ownership, one legal lot, and for whatever reason, hey, I want to be able to sell half of the duplex by itself, uh, you could condo it out, and then you could be able to sell each side separately if it conformed with zoning. And we don't look at that good or bad. If, if a master deed or declaration of covenants is filed through the <laughs> Register of Deeds office, we in mapping will map it according to what that document says. We don't make the determination if they can build on it or not. We'll say, hey, we will create separate tax parcels and you will get a tax bill for it, even though you may not be able to get a building permit. <laughs> this, you, you may not be able to answer this question, but I drive up Woodmont all the time. Is there even one house on any one of these size lots? I mean, I don't know of one. I, I mean, I wouldn't think so. I'm sorry, that was just curiosity. Yeah, no, I don't know of one. Is there anything that you would like to add that we my, should know that we don't know to ask? I guess one of my concerns is if, if we start looking at the horizontal property regime exhibit, the plat in that exhibit as a plat not like a subdivision plat that goes through the planning department, what repercussions would there be? Uh, I could then take my single family house and put a single unit condominium on it. And would that change the date of the plat? And then I wouldn't, does it in fact void, vacate, and supersede the original plat? I wouldn't think so, but my concern would be if I'm using the date of the new condominium as a plat of record and not, like in this case, the 1935 one, what other repercussions would there be going forward other than just setbacks? If I'm using a date of the plat created under the horizontal property regime, not through the planning department. Okay, I, I'm sorry. I'm just going to put you on the spot. Mr. <laughs> Herbert thinks that the lot, lot one, was created in 1935. Yes. Would you agree with that? Yes, I, absolutely. Okay. Don't go. <laughs> We're still thinking. <laughs> yeah, and I and I I get that lot one was created, and uh, I, I get that 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 point of view. But I also think that that in practice, when that happened, people didn't build things on it as if that were to be a single buildable lot, and so that's. And I don't know that other neighborhoods are divided like that. In, in your experience, is this neighborhood unique? No, I've seen other ones like that. And I, again, I don't know the intent in 35, but I've been told in other ones that they said they would put them into smaller sections like that, and depending on how much money you had. So if I can only afford two lots at that time, then I can build my house on those two lots. If I can afford three or six, then that's what I would buy. So it's kind of, again, we wouldn't obviously let them do that today, but in the 30s or whatever, here's the lots. How many, you know, how many do you want to buy? And then you would just construct a house on top of it, how many lots there are. I don't know if for sure that was the intent here, but um, it seems reasonable. And that, 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 that opinion, if you were to drive down that street, 
that opinion yes. would certainly you hold, could, you could go through hold some weight because that's how it looks like people we, right did, today yes. we'll see it and the lot will be bigger or the, the parcel so, will be bigger we look at the deeds and we'll say oh this one is four lots you know 12 13 14 and 15 16 then you know two houses down uh, the house is only on two lots or three um, it's just that's been built that way since um, you know the 30s or 40s what <clears throat> what in your mind would be the difference or is the difference between a horizontal property act and a horizontal property regime um, I always kind of assumed they were the same thing um, we the interchange I, we always do the act and the regime they, you know just the TCA 66 are you, you referring to the the TCA 66 27 101 versus the 201 uh, that's what I'm just wondering is uh, I don't I don't know the horizontal property act apparently it's the 66 27 101 but is there is the horizontal property regime actually a law my understanding yeah it's in TCA I'd have to you refer that one to Bill or I think the short answer might be if I understand your question the horizontal property regime is basically a land use concept that was put into law by the horizontal property act basically a name of a bill once it went through and became law I don't know I hope that's not too simplistic of an answer but I think that's what I understand your question to be and we make a distinction in mapping as if it's a lot in a subdivision we're going to call it a lot and we're going to have acreage associated with that all of these we refer to them as units and there's no acreage because we look at it as ownership as you know rights to you know to that we're not subdividing the dirt therefore we're not putting acreage on it if they wanted to subdivide the dirt and put acreage on it we would say that's a planning issue. You would have to go back through the Planning Commission. Do we have any other questions? Uh, I do, and you might not be the person to ask this, but uh, if, if this plan before, uh, if, let's say this were built, uh, would would there be a case to go back and uncondo? Uh, and if so, then you would, I'm assuming at that point, you would have to have two separate plats. I mean, what would be the process of that? Like, it, 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 once this were built and somebody said, uh, we don't want to be partners anymore, but we each want to stay here. If they wanted to terminate the, the, the condo, they would do a termination. And on our end, what we would do is if that document came in and terminated it, and I think all owners have to sign it, they can't have any other interest, it goes back to on the maps as lots one, two, and three, one parcel. And then we're stuck with, I don't know if these things are built or not, but um, you know. Well, I'm saying if, if they were built in this for a condo and then they said, uh, we don't want the, we don't want the association anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I guess what I'm asking is, would this would these then become two plots and, and it would might not be your it agreement. would refer it would, we would look at it as the three lots okay. and we see a termination of master deed and I think it's 66 27 109 or something they say hey if the owners own it and we don't want it anymore we sign off on it it's like it never happened again so on on the tax maps it's going to pop up as you know lots one two and three again uh, there may have issues with <laughs> having two houses on that <laughs> yeah. but uh, that's well, what that, it would happen <laughs> Well, would it be okay. possible or even allowed by law because would that not then make I, I the think in house that got the reduction in the side yard line suddenly was non complying or something right um, I don't know I don't know if it would be uh, <coughs> who would look at it legally if they filed it with the register of deeds office it would go through our office and we in mapping would make the determination is do both sides own it is their mortgage whatever hey if it's filed correctly and it says we are the owners of unit a unit B and I want to terminate this master deed they have a right to do it we on our end would make a new parcel of land be made up of three lots 
and we would probably caution, we would usually call the attorney or, or something, say, what are you doing? And we see that more, more frequently than you would think. And typically what they say, the attorneys we call up like, well, what are you doing? They're saying, oh, we're filing a different document for lending. And it'll come right back creating two units again. But I think they can do it. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't prevent them from doing it. But we would definitely uh, ask them, you know, what was the reason for it, and uh, let them know that there may be issues if they're not going to recondo it out. Further questions? All right. Then I think you have your uh, your. Right to rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. If, if I could respond to a couple of those questions, in, in the, the question you had, Mr. Harper, is correct. Under 6627109, you can terminate the filial state as it relates to the Horizontal Property Regime Act, and as long as all the owners agree to it, uh, and that doesn't prevent you from refiling it under 6627110 at some later date. But if you terminate it, you are going to have to. You're going to have to uh, execute deeds conveying property in order to get it terminated because it no longer is going to be under that condo association. So you're not going to be able to own it in that kind of context, which means you're going to have to put a, a property line in there. Now, whether it meets codes or not, that becomes another issue, but that, that's what you're going to be confronted with when you try to terminate these things. Uh, there was a question about the, the um, Attorney General's opinion. Uh, the Attorney General's opinion uh, was one that was pre presented to the Attorney General predicated upon an apartment complex, the one that uh, Mr. Herbert attached to his. It was wasn't dealing with this type of particular situation. It was one piece of property, apartment complex was on it. They wanted to con wanted to convert it to condominiums, and that was why he was rendering his opinion was, look, you can do that. It doesn't have to go through the Regional Planning Commission for you to be able to accomplish that goal, uh, which I think is, is right uh, for purposes of that particular fact pattern. It wasn't right for particular this particular fact pattern. Mr. Taylor, you had asked the question about Lot 1. I, I told you on the front end, if they want to build on Lot 1 by itself, we don't have an issue. We can't stop them from getting a 10-foot uh, reduction in the setback line. They can reduce it by 50%, but they can only build on lot one. They don't get to have their cake and eat it too by way of saying, we're gonna, the lot one always exists, so we're going to build on that and build it on lot two and a lot three, which is what they're doing. That's the reason I said they're getting a de facto subdivision of these lots, and they're, they're trying to say, no, all those lots currently exist. Now, as it relates to the question, uh, Joey, if you could put up that old subdivision plat. Sure. Uh, if you'll go back to the, the front page on that or whatever you had it, or down at the bottom here, can you blow that up? If you'll see that, that number two on that says that 75 feet front to be the minimum uh, for a resident, Minimum lot, for a residence. minimum lot for a residence. That answers the question of what they intended. You couldn't buy a 25 foot lot and build on it in 1935. So is your 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 now those premise on I, this? I, I want to point out the restrictions did expire in September of 1955. Down at the bottom, you'll see that. But that was the intent of the subdivision then. And when people bought it, that was what they understood that they had to have a minimum of 75 foot lot in order to build on it. It wasn't, I can build six individual lots here on 25 foot lots. Matter of fact, I've seen others in the area, and nearly every one of them are identical to this. They don't, you couldn't buy a 25 foot lot and build on it even in 1935. They all had 50 foot or 75 foot lot minimums for you building a personal residence on. And that's the reason that's what you see out there. You don't see any 25 because they, they were restricted by deed <coughs> for purposes of that. Um, that's the issue that we're, we're confronted with here. They've built this house, and then now they've come back and they say, well, we want to change everything by way of the configuration on the Horizontal Property Regime Act, and that's perfectly okay, except they're creating two separate estates now out of that one lot. Uh, which had a house across five of them to begin with in order to accomplish this and that's how they're backing into we get the 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 benefit of the lot that was created no lot number one under the 1935 uh, plat but it it doesn't exist for them to be able to build on that individual lot and if they want to build on six lots they can 
but there's a five foot minimum setback on either side, which means on those 25 foot lots, they're gonna have a 10 foot narrow building on the first lot, and they're gonna have a 15 foot narrow building on each one of the other lots. With, because of the setback, side setback lines require that. So it's not functional, nor would it be permitted for them to do that. So if, if someone had uh, replied to this uh, before, is it 98? Is that the, the uh, if, if somebody had combined uh, one and two in 94, some date before 98, what setbacks would they enjoy? If, if they had combined the two lots before 94, by way of coming back and resubdividing the plat, I would have, before 98, they would probably have an opportunity to do that. If they had combined them before the effective date of the act, because the act says anything, any plat that was up record before this date, effective date, January 1st, 1998, uh, gets the benefit of this lot reduction. But at that point in time, we'd be talking about a little bit different situation because you'd have a 50-foot lot that you'd be dealing with or a 75-foot lot, and the 10-foot setback on the side would not be the same issue, in my opinion. So those are the issues that we're confronted with because we have a unique situation. It's not the situation that the Attorney General was opining on. It's not the situation that, that you would typically see by way of, of uh, all these lots have normally been joined together because most people have built houses on them and then when they've conveyed them, they've conveyed them not as separate lots, they've conveyed them as one lot for purposes of conveying their house. Uh, so th it's a unique situation. It's not uh, abnormal in this situation by way of the uh, number of lots that were built that way or designed that way, but it is unique in that these lots have not been joined together and, and they pointed out the lot that used to be 11, uh, 12, and 13 and at least on the metro maps, uh, 11, 12, and 13 are shown as just one lot now. It's not shown as three individual lots anymore, 11, 12, and 13, at least from the metro map that I pulled up. Uh, so That's those were actually combined here. together. That's the original. Are you referring to the one across? Uh, uh, yeah, across Gracewood. Okay. okay. So it, it's no, they're not shown as 10, 11, and 12 on metro maps any longer. They're shown as just one lot there. You don't see the property lines on the metro maps any longer. Well, I guess, I mean, that, that helps with the confusion of the situation. <laughs> but, uh, because it, it does, again, not, not being an attorney or, or having to figure out how to tax or title or anything <laughs> like this, it, it seems clear from the notes that that the and that goes back to the question is 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 there any one is there any home built on one of these uh, lots as numbered and I don't think that, that is the case because it, no one has said it that they can think of that as the, being the case and then the the notes at the bottom do define a lot as at least three of these units so they're defining a lot that way. Um, and that's how I think sometimes of, as a lot, you think, well, a house is on a lot, but yet we know it's maybe legally made up of six lots or, uh, or in, in the administrative definition or whatever. I don't know that I'm ready to say legally because I don't know that's what we're trying to help, help kind of sort of figure out. And um, So, yeah, this I just that makes it... Yeah, it, 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 it does go back to... to to trying to use these terms and, and the way that it advantages the person that uh, is using them, and we got to figure out which one is right. All right. So I have a question. Uh, some one side or the other is is not going to get the outcome <laughs> they want. Uh, what what would be the next step in each of those situations if to Chantry Court. And, and has, to your knowledge, what does what Chantry Court have to say about this? Well, the, the, nobody's really ruled on this. This is such a unique issue. I haven't seen, I haven't found any case law that would be in uh, uh, applicable to the uh, situation. So basically what I think what happens here is if, if we don't get 
four votes out of the, the people up here, then we're going to have to come back anyway because we'd have to get four votes to sustain our um, objection to this. Uh, if that's not satisfactory, then my client can always take it to Chancery Court within 60 days on a writ of certiorari and have the Chancellor make a decision on this unique legal issue. And if we don't find the Chancellor's uh, opinion satisfactory, we can take it to the Court of Appeals and see if they uh, have an opinion on it because it would be kind of a, a question of first impression, I think, that would have to be addressed. It probably has some bearing in more than just, just one case. Uh, I'm, I haven't seen anybody else raise this issue, but uh, it is, is one, I think, is gives a basis for a legal definition of whether this constituted a new plat or not, and I believe it does, uh, when they start combining these lots in, in a different configuration than what they were originally platted. The, the correct answer was the Chancery Court has decided this, and this I would, is what I you would should love, do. I would have loved to tell, to tell you that, but if I, the Chancellor hasn't done that, you know, I've already been cautioned about misstating the truth. So <laughs> it's one of those things. Uh, but I haven't been it's able worth to find a shot. Whether, Yeah, I haven't been able to find anybody that's ruled on this particular issue, and it would only, it would only be of record uh, when we got to the appellate court level. It would have to go to the Court of Appeals and or uh, Supreme Court before it would be of record where we'd know about it. it is this this isn't unique to Davidson County or Tennessee? No, this is not. It's not unique to any place. But the the question is uh, that as it relates to the side setback line, that particular ordinance may be unique mm -hmm. to Davidson County. Right. Uh, and that's that's what's raised the issue here. Okay. It's not the overall structure, although that's a unique uh, uh, discourse in itself. The the the, the side back, setback line is really the only thing that's raised this particular issue that we're here today on. So it, that's, it's such a narrow issue, and it's, it's Metro's own ordinance uh, that gives the right to reduce it by 50%. Uh, I don't know that that's going to be widespread uh, with all the other zoning locations, but uh, certainly. And then you have to know something to raise it to begin with. So if, if um, let's just say that the property owner had, when the original property owner purchased lots, and I'm just saying one through six because I think that was on the chart. And that's, that's it. Had bought one through six. And when they bought one through six because they bought the three that they were required to before they would be allowed to buy anything, they went through the administrative step of combining it all. And now one through six is just one lot in 1935, which is what the house has been. And so... I buy that house and I tear it down and I build and I'm, and I'm allowed to build another house I could build it 10 foot from the street mm -hmm. and put it all the way over there 10 foot and that's no, no nobody disputes that and so I guess the question is how many units are you allowed to build and that that goes to a whole separate I mean, the, the whole, they're here because they want to build four piece, four homes on what they're saying is six lots and you're saying is one lot. And if it were combined into one lot in 1935, which it very well could have been, I, mean, I don't, maybe, uh, what, what could they build on it now if it were just one lot? I'll offer just a one house? When we say one lot, the 1935 purchasers of the properties, assuming it was one purchaser who bought all six lots, had the opportunity, like any other property owner through the years, to go in and have the that section of real estate replatted as one lot. Mm -hmm. Having not done so, the underlying six individual lots remain platted as six individual yeah. lots. Yeah, I understand that. So that's I'm kind of saying. the underlying template, though, when we talk about what could they build, a person could build one house that, you know, meet, meets whatever required setbacks at whatever year, but could fill up most of that space, could build... I'm just saying there's a difference six. between the legal definition or, or, you know, again, I don't want to say... When, when they, and the people that wrote that map right there that we're looking at use lot differently than we're using it now they they would not consider one through six six lots because they say you have to have a 75 foot lot which is is impossible based on their drawing so they're 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 defined they're not saying you have to have 75 feet of total lots they're saying you have to have a 75 foot lot which means that they're looking at a lot as a collection of these numbered pieces of property that add up to 75 or more so that's what i'm saying when they 
based on me, look, uh, my reading of the restrictions down there, it, they're thinking about a lot is at least 75 feet. That's how they think of a lot. Now, you know, if I go to codes to pay taxes or look at this, they're going, well, no, this is divided into 12. There, here's a string of 12 lots. But the folks that subdivided the property and put restrictions on it didn't appear to consider it that way based on how they define the requirements. Fair points all across the board, and I think I understand where you're going with that. I would note that these are deed restrictions that are noted at the bottom, and I think, I don't know if we're in a position to scroll down to those, but yeah. when Mr. Purcell and others talk about these, these are deed restrictions like you see on a lot of different subdiv subdivisions of property across the city, not as much in this part of town anymore because it's all developed out, of course. Right. But with that, the deed restrictions are... I mean, they're all significant, obviously, and had the effect of basically contract, I would say, including the 1955 cutoff, item number five there. But it, it's worth noting that that is not identical to platting, per se. Six lots platted. Deed restrictions, in this instance, okay. it said for X number of years, you got to have at least 75 feet, e.g. three, lot, uh, yeah. three of the platted lots. But it's not one and the same. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, so I mean, just I mean, I'm dense, and I'm sorry about being so dense about it, but it really is complicated. And so, tell me, at what point did they? And, I, and I've read the letter, and <laughs> I've heard a lot, so I'm confused again. At what point, in your opinion, did it become replatted when it became when the they, two H, the two horizontal? When, when they when they filed the two horizontal property regime acts uh, on these lots and they built buildings that overlap lot boundaries. I've, I've looked at that as a de facto subdivision, as a partition of, of, of number two for that purpose when, when they're crossing property lines. So if, if they're going to build exclusively on lot one as it existed on the 1935 plat, we don't have a question. They can get a 10-foot reduction in setback because that lot existed in 1935 and it existed before the, the 1998 uh, ordinance. Don't have a question. But my our position is that they can't bootstrap their way into that lot off of lot two and three and say, look, we're building on this when they're not building the building on lot one. They're building the lot on the building the buildings on lot one, two, and three. What if they had one horizontal uh, property regime association same it doesn't make any difference and because, why? because in, at that point in time they're they're reconfiguring this and that's my, my point is they're taking three lots and trying to reconfigure it into one lot and get the benefit of a lot number one on the minimum setback because it existed before 1935 or by from 1935 and I'm saying that's not the case what they've done is they've reconfigured three lots into this in order to be able to overlay this horizontal property regime act and build two buildings on it and they right. and and it's our position that they can't do that and get the benefit of bootstrapping their way into the 1935 uh plat using but the, the, the original the, 19th, the original owner though built over five parcels i understand and how he did that i'm not sure and and why why they did that back then i'm not sure the bottom line is in today's environment they will not allow you to build across property lines as a general rule uh, without combining them or replatting them or sub -sub subdividing them so that you don't have these encroachments going against uh, over property lines uh, for the mere fact that it creates all kinds of havoc in, in, in the, the property but that's kind of where we are is that it's not a situation of what the old owner did I was merely answering the, the question about yeah. why you don't see any 25 foot lots out there is because most of of them that I'm familiar with that I've seen out in the Woodmont area, the Belmont area, where they had these 25-foot lots, they had these deed restrictions in. People came and built those homes on them, and then they didn't come back in and tear the homes down that way. Uh, if they did, then they normally did it over the entire lot, whatever it was. Again, we're dealing with a very narrow issue here just on the side setback, is, which is the, is the problem. Uh, without that side setback, we wouldn't be before the, the board today. Right. Can I... But you use the word de facto sub Division, and my understanding is all subdivisions have to go through the planning department. Did this go before the planning department? It it, it, did. it went through the planning department by way, but the planning department is, uh, to a certain extent, bound by the state statute under the Horizontal Property Regime Act. 
So if you follow the state statute under the Horizontal Property Regime Act and you file the appropriate documents, which is the master deed and, and the declaration and the plat and those things that you're required, then you, the planning department, can't prevent you right. from, from condoing a, a piece of property. But, but, but I guess just my sole point is it's not really a subdivision because it would have had to have been ruled on by planning. Well, it, it, it should be ruled on by planning as it relates to the fact that you're combining lots, in essence, uh, because you're going to have one owner uh, uh, of multiple units that overlap property boundaries. And that's the, that's the, the technical portion of the argument. So, so why isn't your argument with planning? Instead of my, us, my, my argument is with planning. I just had that I appealed the the zoning administrator's decision on this. Well, I say planning, but I appealed the zoning administrator's decision on that. That's how we're here. But That's, he's the one that he's the one that issued the ruling that that I had to appeal from. Yes, but would you not have recourse through planning, saying, "Hey, this guy is doing a subdivision without your approval"? By your argument, well, that we would be in the same, potentially in the same thing. If, if, but I'd have to challenge planning because planning's not the one that made the ruling on this. The but but, zoning, but I'm saying I'm saying I'm not saying that planning has done something wrong. As in this case, you're alleging that zoning has done something wrong. No, no, I don't allege but, that zoning did anything wrong at all. I just uh, allege that there is a difference of opinion. Well, about uh, okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, like, I like Mr. Herbert. I don't ever we're, allege he does anything wrong. We're not going to kick the bastard out yet. but <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> but, I, but I'm saying, if you're saying it's a de facto subdivision, then you are alleging that this guy is uh, making a subdivision without... I mean, can the argument not be made that he is making a subdivision without going through the proper channels? It, and it, and, it, and it, you're, it, you're appealing here because this is the only decision you have? I, 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 it is this, that argument. I'm saying that he's he's created a plat by his Horizontal Property Regime Act, and, and it, that plat it, then it supersedes it because the plat is what controls the property. And is there no remedy through planning? Uh, not, not without planning making a ruling of some kind or description. And I, at this point in time, I don't know that planning's making any kind of ruling or... or um, issued anything as it relates to this uh, because I think it came by way of the fact that a building permit was requested by way of application for building permit which required the zoning administrator to make a ruling as it relates to the HPG and uh, the that was what the zoning administrator ruled on by way of saying I think it complies predicated upon that decision is what I, I filed the item A appeal on. Okay. Mr. Michael might be able to at least say more on that, but I mean that's that's basically how we got here. Okay. Let me one more time see if I can get my straight self straight here. Yes, sir, Mr. King. You are saying that they cannot go to the ten foot setback. My my position is that they cannot get the benefit of the fifty percent reduction in setback. So it's the the code right now, the ordinance requires them to have a minimum setback of 20 feet. But because of 171230C2, uh, there's a provision in there that says if, it, if the plat was in place before the, the, the end of the act, they can reduce that by 50%. So I'm saying they can't get to the 10% 10 10-foot 10 setback. They have to maintain a 20-foot setback on lot number one as it currently exists. This paragraph states a corner residential lot created by Platt prior to the effective date of the ordinance. And we're talking about this, this Platt was created in 1935, correct? Correct. Which is prior to that ordinance, correct? correct. May reduce the required setback by 50%. Correct. So how is it not? Because they're not building on just lot number one. That's, that's, the, that's the lot that was created before the effective date of the ordinance. They're building on lots one, two, and three. And they're trying to get the benefit of lot number one by way of it being a pre-existing plat, as opposed to the fact that they're consolidating three lots in order to do this HPG. And, and my, my argument is they don't get the benefit of that by way of trying to say it existed prior to the, the date of the uh, enactment of the ordinance, simply because they're consolidating these. They've actually created a different lot. So. If the one house that is there now, burned down, demolished, whatever, do they enjoy the reduction? 
if they rebuild a single house on these six parcels? Well, the, the, the house that's here, there right now is more than 20 feet away from the center. But if they tear it down and we, we want to build another house, but we only want to build one house on all six, do they enjoy the reduction? No. Why not? not unless they build it on, on that one lot. My argument is but, you've but, got six, but six individual on. lots that you've had. I, I understand, yeah. but this was the definition of this piece of property, whatever we call it, pieces one through six, was created before 98. Agree. And if I want to build something on that definition, I should enjoy the reduction in setback, should I not? I, I would argue that you don't get to enjoy the reduction in setback as it relates to lot number one by incorporating other lots into it. But it was already incorporated. It was incorporated no, pre-98. They, they bought six individual lots. That's the argument. They bought six individual lots. And if you're going to maintain that you've got six individual lots that you can do what you want to with, then you've got to do it on six individual lots. You don't get to, to pick and choose which ones you consolidate with but, in order to get the benefit of the pre-existing. But you were making the argument that you couldn't do anything on less than 75 feet. So it seems to me, by that logic, if I build anything on one, two, and three, I should enjoy the set no, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't making that argument. One of the questions was, why don't we have any 25-foot homes out there? I was merely pointing out the reason we don't is because we most of them have these deed restrictions in it that prevent anybody from doing that. It wasn't that I was making the argument that that you had to have it 75 feet. So, so in the answer to your question, this is a non real estate lawyer's view. Either lots one through six exist, or they don't. But what the developer wants is for them to exist, sort of. And that's where it's terribly confusing because if lots one through six exist as of 1935 and still exist today, then the reduction by half of the side setback would apply to lot one. That's it. If they want a side setback to be reduced by half, they don't really want it for lot one, which existed in 1935. They want it for a newly created thought, which is actually lots one, two, three, combined in space, in fiction, yet benefit from the lot one still somehow existing legally. Well, see, I have a hard time with that argument and that in principle, one through six, is one piece of property owned by one individual with one house on it. But that, that's it, not how the gentleman, that's not how the developer I'm, has I'm, argued it, nor has the gentleman from the I'm not city. arguing his point. I'm saying that if one through six is owned by one person and has one house built on it across these... Mm -hmm lines and that was created before 98 uh -huh. and I want to tear down that house and I want to put one back I I see a direct connection to that original definition those six pieces are one property with one house and I want to put one house back on it and I should therefore enjoy the side setback reduction so, so if so, if the owner had combined one through six into a single piece of property, one single lot, before 1998, is I, that what you mean? I don't. No, I don't agree with that. Because no, I'm just asking, is that what you're saying? Well, I'm no. I'm saying exactly what is there now is there now, and the neighbors see it as one property with mm -hmm. one house on it. Yes. Yeah. And under our code. If that house becomes destroyed or I take out a demolition permit and I tear it down and I want to build a whole new house, <clears throat> why don't I enjoy that 10% reduction? Because it seems to me under the definition of a piece of property defined pre-98, I should enjoy that reduction in the side setback. Is that incorrect? My, my opinion is it's incorrect as it relates to that lot. And that, that the issue is... So I've had one house on <coughs> these six individually numbered... What do we call them? Parcels? 
parcels. Parcels are as good as any. <laughs> so if I can't build a new one with that setback, then my house is an existing violation. It's what, what, what do we call that, Joey? Uh, what'd you say? Uh, yeah, an existing non conforming structure. Correct? No. Why not? I, I'm, I'm not sure how it became a, an existing non conforming structure. Because it's there now. If it's there now and it's, and it's not inside the setback line, it's not a non conforming structure. But it's, but it's by your argument, built across five pieces of property, it, it, five parcels. Yeah, and, and, uh, That's non conforming. Well, it, it probably is non conforming. Uh, it, but it's done out there. I don't know why, but the, a lot of people build across property lines for a number of years, and they're still trying to sort out some of those things where things are sold off in tax parcels. So that people all of know. these houses that are not built on a 25-foot strip of land that cross any of those are all non-conforming? They may be. I mean, if, if, you're, if your property law says that you're not supposed to build across property lines, and you're building across property lines, then it's non-conforming. Now, have people accepted that uh, in Metro? I can tell you they have, because I know a whole lot of property that's built across property lines from back in the 40s and 50s. But that that doesn't make it right. It just, it's acknowledged and nobody does anything about it. Most of the time now, you have people go back in and they'll file to have it reconformed by way of their subdivision plat, and they'll just restate it and say, look, we want to amend the subdivision plat, and here's what we want to do. We can put all four lots together, we're going to build a house on it, and everybody goes fine. But that's that's how it's handled in most cases now. It wasn't the way it was handled back in the in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Uh, they just built across the property lines. Okay. All right. Thank you. Have we, have we fully exhausted all our questions? <laughs> I would hope so too, because uh, we've got two more cases. So I'm going to move that we close the public hearing and go into discussion. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, before we do, uh, Mr. Purcell, do you have anything else to say in the remainder of your time? <laughs> no, I don't I want think, to. I think I've said it. Okay. I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Purcell. Sorry, I didn't mean to be rude. No, no, just... no. Look, it's, it's, I've, just, I've just got to be at work at 8 tomorrow. I think we're exhausted tomorrow. <laughs> Okay, so um, discussion. I'm not sure I disagree with the uh, with the appellant. <laughs> hmm? I'm sorry. I say I'm not sure I disagree with the appellant, but I think that maybe if you look at the letter of the law, then it would apply to. Parcel number one, I would think. But if you build over one and two, then you're not doing just one. So, uh, where's the line drawn? Uh, okay, I am going to be gosh darn happy if a judge gets his hands on this because it's a matter <laughs> it's a matter of first impression, and I'm all for that. So, so let a judge speak. But. And I actually am not sure we're going to get a four-vote consensus, which will get us to a judge, and that's okay by me. I, I just am going to have a hard time finding that the administrator acted in error because there are six lots. And we've heard that from the zoning administrator, we've heard it from the mapping, and I think we've more or less heard it from planning, which doesn't treat condos, condos as a subdivision. They haven't to date yet anywhere else, and this isn't the first one in the city. So we've got three departments of Metro all saying the same thing. Again, I'm happy if a judge gets it. I've got about nine friends or former clients sitting out in that group, so it brings me no joy, and I fully understand everybody's thought that they're gaming the system. So be it. I'm, I'm sympathetic to the neighbors because you're going to get a lot more density in there, and they didn't buy density. So I'm, anybody who wants to appeal this decision is okay by me. But I find it difficult to say three metro departments are acting in error. So if you and I disagree, we won't get four, and they can take it up to Chancery. And I will no, have my actually don't they have to come back here first, right? Sucker. Ah oh, no. <laughs> So we, we all just need to come to an agreement and vote on something, whether we agree with it or not, and get it to a judge. 
Let's be practical about this. <laughs> and then, that was in jest, for the record. <laughs> Talking to you. When you confuse me with your double negative, I don't know that I don't disagree. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I agree with Chairman. Uh, I think I think these appeals are are peculiar on the face of them anyway because they're the, it kind of goes in with the assumption that uh, you know especially with sign cases and when we're dealing with local law and state law that seem to conflict but not directly and even the Chancery Court has kept some of our separate courts have kept our decisions <laughs> in separate parallel tracks and we've yet to hear back. Uh, I very much want a judge to hear this, but I do, I mean, I just can't see that, I don't, I don't see the error in the decision. I, I, the arguments are strong on both sides and it's very complicated. Um, that's just sort of where I am and I'm not looking forward to hearing this again. And incidentally, if, if we hear it again, it is, it's a new case. Ugh. And, and it's headed that way. I think unless we talk about it some more and figure out um, a consensus on it, I, it, 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 it's confusing because it, and I've said several times today that it, you know, everybody uses their best argument, um, and and it, there's a lot of mixing and matching. Well, and that's uh, it is, and I didn't mean to be argumentative with Mr. Purcell. I, I I have been told that I come across as argumentative, especially when I'm arguing. But th the way I see it is, simply put, that the casual observer would drive by and see this as one one property. And the neighbors see it as a de facto one property. And he, uh, Mr. Purcell's uh, side, I, th I think, and he's not at the table to correct me, so I'm, I'm sorry in advance if I get this wrong, but I, I get that he is saying by taking one, two, and three and doing what we want with them, we are, they are uh, de facto uh, subdividing. But I, I, I was trying to, to get to the, to the point where, you know, and in, in that case, if it is a, a, a de facto subdivision, I can see the argument for not enjoying the rights that went along with the property pre-98, as the, the statute says. But I'm, I'm curious to know if if you only put one structure back and, and treat it as one piece of property that is a corner lot that seems to fit the definition and requirements to, in my mind, why would you not enjoy all of the benefits of the reduction in the setback? So to me, is, it, does it come down because we're dividing it into quote, two pieces? Is, is, that, is that the crux of the argument? And is, does that make a difference? What if it were five of the six? It, my, my argument's just exceptionally simple. I mean, because we're a bunch of laymen. I mean, I, I am a lawyer, but I'm a corporate lawyer, and I do some land use. And our standard is... Did Mr. Herbert act arbitrarily? We can throw that one out. Was he in error? I'm not sure we can say he was in error if he calls mapping and says, hey, is lot one, is lot one its own lot? And mapping says yes. And then he calls planning and says, hey, if we're building over one and two, is that a subdivision? And they say, no, we don't view it as a subdivision. How do the four of us turn to him and say you're wrong and you acted in error. And that is not that I'm not sympathetic with the neighbors. I don't think the neighbors bought in. You know, when they bought, they bought one lot. And do I think this is uh, real estate lawyers getting as much out of the land as they can inside the rules that exist today? Yes, I do. And I'm not trying to defend any of that. I'm just saying, how do we turn and say Mr. Herbert's in error? 
I mean, I, I don't care if a judge does. No offense, Bill, but um, I mean, if a judge does, that's fine by me. I, I just don't. I don't know how we do. Outside of a four to zero vote, right? <laughs> it's right. Like the reasoning behind it. Is like, yeah. I, I mean. Well, that that. When you put it that way, um, and, and, and again, I don't know. Yeah. Joey, I, I have a question about what R R ten. Yes. Tell me what what uh, remind us of R ten, and then what you can build in an R ten district. I'm talking about from a use standpoint. Yes. Um, R ten permits single family dwellings as a matter of right. R10 also permits duplexes with conditions. Um, it is a common misconception amongst virtually at least one person every day out of the 20 years I've worked for codes that R10 allows a duplex as a matter of right. That's not true. Um, to get a duplex, you have to meet certain conditions. Um, those conditions, first and foremost, are that that lot was created and of record prior to 1984. Uh, if it meets that, you can have a duplex. If it was created in 2000, you cannot have a duplex. Um, okay. And then it has to be 10,000 square feet. 10,000 square foot minimum lot size. Um, if you have a lot that was created anytime legally, because um, there's some dates in here, and I don't want to muddy the water, but the, there's some dates that the subdivision regulations were required to be filed via the planning commission. So does it, it specifically says the lot has to be 10,000 square feet? Yes, you have to be a, a lot of, of matching the table to have the lot area to do it. Now, if you create the lot... that's where my confusion is, because none of these lots are 10,000 square feet. Right, and if, if he were to build, as it relates to this case, if he were truly to build on all six lots, he's entitled only to a single family because they have insufficient lot area. Under today's code, right. they are they are legally created uh, in this case by plat, but throughout the county there are thousands of lots created by deed uh, at a time at which deed suffice. That's good enough. Um, so those are things our office has to check when people come see us for building permits. When was the lot created? How is it created? And at the time, did it have enough lot area? So, and then those things kind of start down a tree of. When it was created and how big it was depends on your side yard setbacks. And the council's recently amended those too that allow people to do three foot side setbacks in some instances or five. Well, I get, I get and that, that, that's really the source of the confusion because it, I mean, what, what's a lot? You know, and we're saying a lot's this number one, this 25 foot by 150 foot plot of land, but yet in R10, that isn't acceptable as a lot. It has to be at least three of these things to get to 10,000 square feet. I would say no. Um, because the 30, in our mind, if let's step out of this appeal for a minute. If, if you were to walk into my office and you had this plat in, that was legally recorded, um, by whatever means at the time it, you had to record it. When you say plat, what are you talking about? This drawing. One through six? Yeah. If I, and I've closed my drawing. Uh, but the drawing you saw with the yeah, yeah. one through six. If you came in with a plat and it was recorded properly, and I wanted to build a house on each, even though it was, had did not have the lot area required under today's code at the time it was created, it was legally done. It's grandfathered to lot area. Is not entitled to a single family residence on each? Okay. Can't build a duplex because I don't have my ten thousand, um, or I don't have. In this so you can't build a duplex. You must have the lot area and, well, remember I said duplexes are permitted with conditions. So the first condition is, was the lot created prior to 1984? Right. So taking the subdivision plat in question, yes, those lots were clearly created prior to 84. Now I look at the lot, does it have 10,000 square feet? I'm talking about all six, you know, individually. That's our discussion right here. So, but you're so you're saying that on all six you could build a, a duplex. You can build a single family. Or you could build a single family residence on every one of those. Right, lots. but you also could build on all six a duplex. As long as you had ten thousand square feet, we've allowed folks. Now, what do you consider one through three? These two, these two pieces of, these two, are the, is that a duplex? That's not considered a duplex. That's considered a plan, a PUD. What's, what what is this? What are these two things considered? That's a. I can't see what you're holding up, but is that well, just the, the the two the oh, and, and your um, little red drawing that has the two the two squares. That, and, that's a horizontal property regime. 
And, okay. And of those, those are... In, so it's not, not a duplex, it's a horizontal property machine, which is what we've been talking about. You're kind of starting down another path that deals with how we... Cla and, and I really don't want to... Let me tell you this. We report monthly to the Census Department, and you see on the TV, housing starts, and here's how many billions of dollars of houses were built last month. We report these even differently to the Census Department. They're treated as single-family dwellings for purposes of categorization for them. But um, I, did I answer your question? I, I don't want to yeah. get into testimony into this case. I, I'm trying to avoid that because I'm not a party to this appeal. Not directly. I'm leaving your way. Yeah, I mean, but that's that's what I'm. I mean, I'm just trying to figure out how to. I mean, I, I don't. You know, just again. To, well, your question. Let me let me phrase it this way. But for but for Mr. Sundock's appeal, I would have issued the permit. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, that's, I guess, that is that's true because we. But for this appeal, permits would have been issued on these lots, as you see depicted in that drawing. <coughs> I've read this thing every way you can read it. Upside down and back, it still says the same thing. <laughs> well, and, and I'll, I'll tell you that just, you know, on first reading and even looking at it, something about it just, it doesn't, there's something about it that just feels funny, but it, yet I can't, I'm trying to figure out what is it that allows me to say, no, this is, this clearly divided the property. No, this clearly, and it, it seems like there's, a whole lot of historical intent that never got codified or consolidated or written down and you know and that you know I mean I, 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 the argument of you know if it, you could only build on lot one I, I, I get but then I also and, and that and the argument was made well you can't cross property lines but this subdivision was built to cross property lines and so historically this subdivision was meant for houses to cross these lines and or, or they would not have sold three a minimum of three to build one house one clarification on that is the difference between lot lines and property lines and this may not be what you meant but the uh, lot lines is our one through six right. you see the long skinny line for each of those property line would be a conjoined piece of property owned by one person which apparently for a number of years was one through six right. so Property lines would have been the outside of the box, so to speak, yeah. with lot lines being crossed by maybe one big house or something like that. That may be too minor of a distinction, but just in no, case it helps. It is, and I think that the, the part of the problem is that I think I'll say I was going to say for the common person. I'll just say for me because I'm feeling fairly common in my my knowledge of this. But it it, it feels like that the common sense. In, in probably in most neighborhoods, not all, but most neighborhoods in Nashville, the property line and the lot lines are mostly the same. Uh, I would say a, a, more than a majority. Is that that fair? I think it's I rare that's fair. that you're. That, I mean, not uncommon, <laughs> but it's rare. And in this case, it's extraordinarily common. In fact, every every house in this neighborhood most likely is on multiple lots. And so you have the difference between the tax parcel, which was the one through six, and then versus the lots, which are are separate. And I and I guess I'm as much as I I'm struggling with it. I don't you know I guess it goes to the definition. I'd love to see it go to court too, but I don't let the smarter folks really come down on the on the right answer. But it just doesn't. I don't know. It's it's, it's hard. Okay, I'm, so the quickest way for it to get to court is for us to agree. And for us to agree, I know this is just one man's opinion, but if we have three metro departments that all think the same thing, and we have this being done throughout the city in other, th in other locations, then as, mud, as many friends as I have over in that corner, I still think it's incumbent on them to appeal it to Chancery as opposed to the people who are doing what's been done a lot before and us saying Bill's wrong. I, I, just, I just don't know where we say Bill's wrong. I mean, but yeah, my, my, and that's kind of where I, I'm, I'm getting to where I feel like I don't really like the development. I don't really personally like that they can do it 
but I can't. There's not. There's nothing clear cut to me that says that this this wasn't a legitimate interpretation of the rule. I think that's very fair. I think all four of us can dislike what's being built and still find it's within the law. And I think if we find with it's within the law, or in this case, we just don't find that Bill acted in error. I mean, that's our standard. Did he act in error? And then the appellant would still have the right to take it to Chancery Court. After a new hearing before this honorable board. Well, unless we all agree. I mean, if we didn't die. If, if, if the entire board agreed that the zoning administrator did act in error, oh, then no. that would be immediately appealable by, the, by any adversely affected party. Um, however, if the board... And Joey, procedurally, please jump in if I've got this wrong. If the board even acts unanimously today that the zoning administrator did not act in error, thus giving rise to... No, uh, that, that's over. Um, four affirmative votes grant an application. Four affirmative votes and then four uh, votes in denial of the... Yeah. Uh, well, the motion appeal. would be to deny. To yeah, gotcha. Deny. That's what I'm going for. Four positive okay. votes. Okay, so, so we're, appealable. We're, we're appealable no matter what if the four of us agree. And sorry to lawyer this just a little bit. Naturally, I would uh, discourage our board members from doing anything just so that something could get to court because a court would quickly say that is an arbitrary decision and punt it right on back with a big frowny face stamped on it. Um, so obviously, vote your conscience, vote your best judgment on your individual basis because we would not want it shot right back for arbitrary standard because it would be, absolutely. We can just be arbitrary, but we don't have to be capricious don't to get it bunt back. Arbitrary. Yeah. Zoning administrator, because these lots do exist today, even though something was recorded, it was a plat, but it was not change of the original plat, and that original plat still exists today. So I think the zoning administrator got it right, and I know he's yeah. surprised to hear me say that. Okay, um, somebody. Took my Bill's letter. Have you got Bill's letter anywhere? Mm. No. Here. Uh, I make a motion that I make a motion that the appellant's appeal be denied because the board finds that the zoning administrator did not na did not act in error nor did he act arbitrarily when he found that the corner residential lot number one was created by platt prior to the effective date of the ordinance we've got a motion oh i'm sorry i guess i wish i should wait till it's no that I, i'm curious about the wording of that yeah, I'd, I'd like to fix this. Well, uh, okay. Because well, your motion, well, let me, your, for, for purposes of your order, your, your order has to be in the form of you uphold the zoning administrator's interpretation or you overturn the zoning administrator's interpretation. Okay, I make a motion that we uphold the zoning administrator's, administrator's decision. I'll second. Got a motion, got a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes. Does <coughs> Who wants to go find David Ewing? He is. Mr. Ewing has departed. Oh, okay. Uh, he's not like starving in a corner somewhere. No, he's not. Cobb uh, he is. He has uh, informed me he has departed for the day. So we have four folk remaining. Well, I have good news for everybody that's here for the uh, CMT. If you came to hear good music, got good news for you. We're not going to sing, so you won't be hearing it today. <laughs> We'll call the next case, case 2014-38. Ms. Stacy Lane is the appellant, the Stutz Family Partnership, owner of the property at 2505 Eugenia Avenue, requesting variances in the required parking and distance to a residence in the IWD zone district to use the existing building as a doggy daycare, it says. The correct terminology is animal boarding facility. Referred to the board under section 1720030 letter B1. The applicant has alleged the board would have jurisdiction under section 1740180 item B. Guys, for you guys begin, I'm going to show the board 
uh, photographs and sketches and such, and then I'll turn it over to you. We do have opposition present. Uh, both parties will have 15 minutes to present their testimony to this board. Um, I know of one gentleman. Are there any other parties uh, present, either for or against this case, number 20, uh, 38? Four? Okay. Um, Ma'am, you'll want to come forward. Um, you do have a someone in your favor. They'll need to come up during your time. And there's a seat there. Please feel free to have a seat as well. Um, yes, at, at the table if you'd like. And Miss, are you in support as well? It's coming forward. Okay, please go ahead and have a seat at the table. Okay. And so we have four folks at the table in support. Before you guys discuss and, and talk, uh, you'll, each side will have 15 minutes to present their testimony. Let me um, go through the record for the board. The uh, subject property is located on the west margin of Eugenia Avenue, just south of Newsom Street. It is in the IWD zoning district. This use is classified as animal boarding facility under the zoning code. Animal boarding facility is a use that is permitted with conditions in the IWD zone district. Let me go over the relevant conditions for you that are at appeal here. These conditions can be found at 1716070, letter B. Um, animal boarding facility, and the issue here is no part of any building or structures is number one, in which animals are housed shall be closer than 200 feet, and no kennel run shall be located within 100 feet away from any existing residence. Um, the subject property which you see on the aerial photograph uh, is here, and the nearest residence is the adjoining property owner to the south here. This isn't... Oh, sorry. Thank you. I'm the only one looking at this. Uh, thanks, John. Now I can share with everyone. Okay. There's our parcel, south of Newsom Street, west side of Eugenia. This is the uh, subject lot aerial photograph, and the distance as discussed in number one is the distance to the nearest residence. Uh, this property is zoned IWD, uh, does have a legally not, actually it is a conforming use in IWD, sorry. Um, houses are allowed in IWD. This is a residence immediately south, and the uh, property owner for the parcel south is present with us today. The um, variance in is the distance to that residence, and reading again, letter B says that um, no part of any structure or building uh, in which animals are housed shall be closer than 200 feet. Obviously, that residence is within the 200-foot distance. Uh, additionally, the uh, parking required based on the uh, use is five spaces. The zoning code requires uh, for animal boarding facility uses. <coughs> Under 1720-030. Commercial uses, there it is. Um, and forgive me, I'll need to look that up off the website. I apparently have an older page in my book uh, that does not list that parking requirement. Uh, the parking requirement based on the size of the building would be seven, uh, providing on site five. This is the uh, subject property upon my visit out there, uh, looking at the structure from Eugenia. Uh, you see the residence that I discussed earlier is this structure here. The adjoining properties, uh, and better shot of that structure, and the adjoining property to the north is a commercial business, and the properties across Eugenia are also a uh, plumbing contractor, and I believe there's another contractor's office here and the subject property that you see here. But I think I'm going to leave this photograph up. Uh, members, I'm going to look up that code section that appears to be missing out of my book, and I'll get back to you on the actual number there. But with that, I'll turn over to the applicant first, and, and, and the parties present would identify themselves and, and begin your presentation to the board. Again, of your 15 minutes, ma'am, you want to save some of that for rebuttal after the opposition comes forward. And with that, I'll turn it over to you all. Hi, my name is Stacy Lane. I am the owner of Barker Lounge Doggy Daycare. I am seeking a zone variance for 2505 Eugenia Avenue. 
Uh, I've been running a successful business for six years already, providing a much needed service to area residents. So I've been doing this. This is not a new business, it's just a new location. Um, this neighborhood is zoned IWD and is comprised almost entirely of businesses. Uh, in fact, the owner of the house that is opposing to granting, is, sorry, excuse me, is opposed to granting me this variance is the only residential structure on Eugenia, all the way from Newsom Street, all the way down to Thompson, literally the only residential structure. Um, I reached out to my neighboring property owner and he expressed concern about barking. Um, saying dogs don't bark would be like saying babies don't cry. It's just not true. It's not true. They do. Um, what I can tell you, however, is honestly the barking is kept to a minimum. Not only is it an audio irritation, but it's a serious safety hazard in my line of work. When a dog is barking, it'd be kind of like me following you around work all day, poking you on the shoulder going, hey, 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 eventually you're going to snap. Same thing with dogs, so you can't have that because it raises the level of the group. Somebody's going to snap and you don't want that. So it's in my best interest, very much so, to keep the barking down because uh, it's a potentially dangerous situation for me, my employees, and the dogs. Uh, for that reason, excessive barkers are denied acceptance to bark a lounge. Um, if they become a nuisance and or a danger to the group, they're asked to leave. Uh, if, however, noise is a real concern. There are other businesses that could move into 2505 Eugenia Avenue that wouldn't even be required to apply for a variance. Um, they'd be far louder, far more consistently. Um, auto mechanics, manufacturer, excuse me, manufacturers, carpenters, music studios, those are just a few examples of way louder than a dog and daycare. Um, and I know what I speak of because the street that I'm moving from, White Avenue in Berry Hill, was, a, that was an IWD street and I was next to a house. And I was, except for the architect's office across the street, they were pretty quiet. But um, it was constant construction, constant semi-trucks, they were getting stuck in <laughs> ditches, beep, 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 when they backed up, you know, it, I was by far the, the quietest thing on the neighborhood. Um, and incidentally, my neighbors on White Avenue were residential. They, they actually were uh, a woman and her mother who lived in the house next to me, so they were residential as well, and they told me I was the best neighbor they'd ever had. Um, we had a great relationship, Christmas cards, the, the whole thing. Um, but because my business does involve animals, I have to be in areas that are either zoned farm or industrial. Uh, so my choices of location are very limited. It's very hard for me to find a place that, you know, has to, it's very particular. So it seems unfair that I should be penalized because an absentee landlord has chosen to maintain a residential rental property in the middle of an area that had changed, has changed almost entirely in the last 20 years. I hope you provide me with the opportunity to continue to operate Barco Lounge at 2505 Eugenia Avenue and don't let one individual's business of renting apartments prevent me from caring for a great group of dogs. Thank you. Can you tell me what you do uh, with your current business and what you have planned for this business to uh, reduce noise uh, inside? Do you have another sound baffling products and other products that you can use to, you know, keep inside or outside? I'm sorry. Well, I mean, out oh, outside. I, I, I guess tell me what what hours you allow dogs outside, and then once the dogs are inside, uh, which I assume is when they're not outside. <laughs> what 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 you do with your building to to assure that there, there's not noise outside when the dogs are inside at night? Um, when the dogs are inside at night, well, first of all, I do. Even though I board, I only board my clients, so I'm not a kennel per se. So I might only have two or three dogs. I might have none, but I, I don't have like the the amount of dogs I have during the day is not the same at night, and they're usually in my bed because it's kennel free. So we're all chilling watching TV. There's no noise at night. Weekends, same thing. Um, during the day, uh, I'm going to put a, a six foot wooden fence. I do have training techniques. If somebody is an excessive dark barker, we have timeouts, leash outs, um, muzzle therapy. Um, and again, like I said, if it keeps on, they're just not allowed to come back. So I do, I do do my best. Like I said, it's in my best interest too. I don't want to hear it all day. To be honest with you. So. So, I'm sorry. Did you say did, are, you're going to be living there as well? No, I do stay there when I'm boarding. I don't ever leave the dogs alone. Um, so I want to have like a room that I said, but I actually have an apartment in, in Creve Hall. So whenever the dog, there, the dogs would never be unattended. I guess. Is so, what I'm so saying. there are times when you'll be using this as a residence, just not your permanent residence. Uh, I suppose. Yes. Yeah. 
Mr. Chairman, can I clear up the record slightly? The staff code department would like to withdraw the parking variance. Um, the zoning code, uh, although it does not specify a parking requirement for animal boarding facility, um, talking to the zoning administrator, and, and I was advising him our, how we've done it. Years past, we've treated them like kennels. Kennels parking requirements one to four hundred. This building has two thousand and forty square feet, so five parking spaces obviously are required, and that's what's on site. I'd like to withdraw the parking variance portion of this. Okay, thank you. Anything else from the applicant? Okay, then you'll have eleven minutes and fifty seconds for rebuttal. Hi, I'm Manuel Zeitlin, architect, but I'm here as an architect advisor, but also as a client. Uh, we've been bringing our dogs to Barker Lounge for about three or four years, um, and I think your, your dogs are there also. Um, and, and the thing Stacy says is very true. She, it's a very professionally run, great place. Um, it serves the needs of a lot of residents in the sort of Hillsborough Village, Midtown, Creep Hall area. Um, and, and as she said, it's very limited to where you can put put these and, and I, looking at the zoning ordinance, you know, it's permitted with special special exceptions and one, special conditions and one of them is you've got to be a certain distance from residences and my sense is that that was intent, put in there when when this when this special uh, condition was, was set up, thinking about what happens when this borders a residential neighborhood. When you have an industrial district bordering a residential district, you, you need some ability to to, modif to moderate that. In this case, it's it seems like it's a situation where this district isn't a residential district. It's there there some of the houses. Have, a lot of the houses have been converted to commercial uses, industrial uses, and this is really the one remaining residential use um, in the neighborhood. And it, it just seems like that's not what the special condition was put in there to, to protect. It was to protect a bordering condition. Um, so I would urge you urge you very much to support. This because she had to when she sold her house she had to move and our dogs have been at home every day for, <laughs> for three so weeks. So they're having him crazy. <laughs> I'm Betty Elrod and as um, he stated, uh, I've been a client and my dog has been going to Barker Lounge for over five years and for five days a week and that's his home. He visits me on the weekends, um, teasing because again. Um, I can assure you too, though, that Stacy, as well as her staff, that they run a loving, loving, but a very disciplined daycare. And yes, my dog has been suspended. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I can say, you know, tough love. Yeah, ours had to get therapy, I think. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Well. I'm Sheila, I'm Stacy's mother, but I have helped run the daycare throughout the time that she has had the daycare. And I have watched her, when new dogs come in, I have watched her, if they're barkers, train them to quiet down by the methods that she she has used. You can do other things also. You can separate them. You can kind of put them aside for a while, but the time out and um, just constant working with the dogs on a one-to-one -one basis. Because she's privately owned, um, she knows all of her dogs and she knows all of their quirks. Whereas if you're not, if you're a franchise or, or the others, you don't really know the dogs. So literally when the dogs are barking outside, they might bark when they're playing like kids squeal, but otherwise they bark when somebody comes to the fence or when the, the big trucks roll up. Um, but they don't bark just to bark. She's been very, very good about teaching them. So I think that should be a great addition to the neighborhood. Um, she has great clientele. The dogs are well behaved. The clients are well behaved. So <laughs> most of them. And what, what are the hours of the general hours of operation? Monday through Friday, 7 to 6.30. Uh, nap time is 11.30 to 2. It's true. <laughs> really? Yes. Strictly yep. enforced. Yep. <laughs> a, a owner cannot even knock on the door during nap time. No. No visitors. Well, you'll wake them up. Exactly. Because <laughs> that's, that's good. I know. <laughs> what, uh, Council, what, what, what is our standard on this? I'm seeking a variance. <laughs> Just kind of flipping through some of that myself. 1740-370 is the review standards for um, variances. And 
you know, this is where you go through and try to make an affirmative finding on the question of are there physical characteristics of the property that merit this variance? Are there unique characteristics? Um, you try to confirm that the hardship is not, in fact, self-imposed, that financial gain is not the only basis for uh, seeking the variance, that this would not create any injury to neighboring property, that's subsection E, uh, that there's no harm to the public welfare and that it maintains the integrity of the master development plan. So those are the and items that you're considering when you review a variance request. No, no hardship? Uh, again, the hardship language is under subsection C, that oh. the hardship is not, in fact, self-imposed. And so when we ask the question, what is the hardship? Is it a physical characteristic of the property? Right. Is it a unique characteristic of the property? Those are some of the things that the board typically inquires about. Okay. Do, do we have to find a hardship, per se? You have to find a basis for a variance one way or the other. Um, okay. As the zoning administrator has mentioned to this board before and has mentioned to his attorney today, he's reminded me that under 137207, the Tennessee State Code, the Tennessee Code annotated section that deals with uh, certain decisions like these, there's the or other exceptional circumstances type language that gives you uh, a little broader discretion in terms of making a finding that justifies a variance. Okay, thank you. Where's your business now, presently? Um, I had to close while I waited for the appeal hearing because the people that bought my house, they'd given me as much time as they were willing to get. I had to be out of there on May 15th, so I'm actually closed right now. But she was on White Avenue. Oh, 20, it was 2517 White Avenue. I'm sorry. It was in Berry Hill. But with the same same zone district. Mm -hmm. oh. Exact. Not even just in Dives IW. Yeah, exact. Okay, let's hear from the opposition, I guess. Okay. Thank you. You have uh, eight minutes and nine seconds for rebuttal. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is James Smith, and uh, I am the owner of uh, the property at, 20, um, at 2507 Eugenia. And uh, I'm here because I received notice about this and uh, uh, concerning the property at 25. 05 Eugenia. I've been the property owner of this um, house for 20 years and uh, have had an enjoyable experience there and I believe that it by the way is according to my count only an approximation one of m maybe four or five other rental houses on the street and I think probably from above Woodlawn Cemetery up to Nolensville Road and from I-440 over to Thompson Lane whatever that area is called I think it might be Flat Rock or Woodbine possibly uh, there may be 10 to 15 uh, residences that people uh, own and live in them or that are rented for rental property and uh, the tenants are primarily um, hardworking folks in need of comfortable, clean, and affordable housing, which is conveniently located as this is, and it's been a good piece of property, and it's a, a really good basic house. Uh, I have several concerns about the requested variance, I think, which would directly affect me adversely and my tenants. First of all, as the photographs show, um, my house is only uh, 20 feet from the building next door. And there is a fence that is halfway, that comes up the, the left side and right side, almost to the front of the building uh, next door. And if dogs are, are allowed to use that as a run, that fence is 10 feet from the, uh, my house, and the back window on that uh, white frame house is actually a bedroom. And so I, I can't imagine the noise issues that we could be dealing with if the dogs are in the back or running outside uh, within uh, the, the wired area, of course, of the fenced areas. Um, it is my concern that even with the best noise abatement materials that, that there are, that it would not be sufficient for barking inside a building like this and for it to cut the noise sufficiently, and especially if the dogs were outside. And so that, I think, is a very realistic concern that I'm not sure how it could be dealt with. I received a letter on, uh, or received a letter dated May 26 from Ms. Lane. A copy of that letter, I believe, was included in your materials for you to look at. And she states that my hours of business are from 7 a.m. to 6.30 p.m., so even the minimal amount of barking would be while most people are at work. 
My concern about this is the present tenant has a job that requires him to work at odd hours. Often he'll leave uh, early morning, sometimes mid-morning, afternoon and night. I checked this morning, did a drive-by, and his car was there at 9 this morning. Also, I believe it was my previous tenant who worked at a restaurant in Green Hills. It required him to uh, go in it in the late afternoons, open up and help with prep work and see that the dinner menu was planned and served and the restaurant was closed down. And often he would sleep through the mid-morning, afternoon, maybe early afternoon, and go in sometime in the mid-afternoon. So my experience has been a number of the tenants through the years have had unusual working hours that are not predictable. And so the arriving of, you know, dogs at the premises at 6.30 and, you know, leaving by 6 or 7 at night uh, may be, you know, sound like an ideal situation, but it's not reality for me, even with the existing tenant I have. I think the situation caused by barking dogs in a building that's only 20 feet away from my house could be a serious problem. And I'm afraid that I may only discover how serious it is after this gets in place and then I have people leaving my property or not willing to rent it because of that. Another concern is that um, I could find the business hour, I couldn't find the business hours uh, except in looking at her letter it doesn't seem to mention, though, about her weekend and holidays provisions, which she's just mentioned, and I assume that there would not be any overnight boarding since it's referred to as a doggy daycare with hours from 7 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. Now there doesn't mention how many days a week the business will be open. I think she mentioned that before you here shortly a, a while ago, or what the average number of dogs would be that would be there daily and what the maximum capacity of that facility would be for dogs. Another concern I have in uh, paragraph three of Ms. Lane's letter to me, uh, she states, my expertise ensures that the dogs are well behaved, socialized, quiet, and, and parent as much as possible. They are dogs, close parent. And I, to me, that is one of the big issues here. Uh, we've had pets and dogs and cats in our family and birds and gerbils and all kind of things. And we've experienced with dogs, they have their own personality and sometimes there, there can be problems and they can arise pretty quickly and can be very serious. And so uh, I am concerned about this fact and that uh, despite the best of intentions, some serious problems could arise from this. Another concern is that my tenants may be disturbed or find themselves in a bad situation when they're coming and going, regardless of what hour it may be, especially during the morning hours, though, in the afternoon, when there may be a lot of traffic, and I'm not even sure what that may amount to. I'm concerned that dogs might bark at my tenants, they may growl, they may be threatening to the tenants. The worst case scenario would be if they broke loose and came and actually attacked one of my tenants. It seems inevitable to me also that when people arrive that they may want to let the dog out to walk around for just a little bit and it would be very natural that they would want to relieve themselves and my whole front yard and the entire yard is grass. This building, the entire front is asphalt and so I have a pretty good idea where that might wind up which I think could create a series of problems uh, that, that would be unpleasant to deal with at best and maybe problematic at worst. Um, my go goal continues to be, as it has been for the last 20 years, to be a good neighbor and a responsible property owner. I've tried to think of ways that this matter could be resolved so that everyone was treated fairly. However, it is my concern that in trying to help in this situation, that it may be to my detriment and I would find it difficult to continue renting the property to the current tenant and perhaps to find new tenants who would want to move in next door to a facility like that. And as Ms. Lane says and gives in the way of the assurances of w what can be done to help keep these dogs under control, I think when it's all said and done, again, we're working and dealing with pets and animals and their behavior and temperament sometimes is very difficult to control. And if a terrible situation were to arise, that would be something that would be a very, very serious matter. And I'm concerned about this and other issues that I've mentioned and I request that the board deny this appeal. So you don't see any uh, compromise there or anything? That you know, I've looked at that and I, I've tried to think in ways that something could, how something could be done, but just the noise factor, which we're trying to determine as best we can what may happen in some scenarios as we think through it. 
But in this case, it could become a serious nuisance. And despite the wonderful words of uh, testimony to support the success that she's had, Ms. Lane has had, and what a good job she does, uh, we're dealing with some things that are unpredictable and maybe unquantifiable. And um, it's, cur it's been used by me as a, as a residence, a rental residence, for 20 years. And uh, it's unthinkable that something like this could just come up next door overnight uh, when in the past there have been service companies based out of there and people that would have um, sales or going on from that building, sales and deliveries and those types of things, which seem to be a, you know, certainly a normal use. And um, But to answer your question, it's been hard for me to figure a way to resolve this matter. And what I stand as a property owner is if this passes, the next thing I may discover is you've got a nightmare on your hands. And um, I, I really don't know how to resolve it. Any further questions? Okay, rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. Joey, could you put the slide back up for you? So the, and feel free to add to this, the, the issues for rebuttal are uh, capacity, overnight, uh, hours, holidays, loose dogs, doggy waste, did I leave anything else out? I do. Yeah, I, I, I wish I'd beat on this more, but but I think we may need to review the physical hardship. I mean, the the, the physical hardship for of the land. I mean, the the, the basis of the variance. I, oh, and, and I'd like to give them this opportunity to do that in the rebuttal. You can ask them whatever you want. No, that's what I was going. That's really that's that's really the main the main point. Instead of getting into where their dog's going to you know go to the bathroom or a resident is going to have the police show up at night because of things they've done in the house next door. You know, those aren't things we need to be talking about. Um, I think the really main issue is just is just sort of the I think you use the word exceptional circumstances, and it's that that this is a neighborhood that has completely changed from a residential neighborhood to an industrial neighborhood, that when you look at the aerial photo, um, what you see are parking lots and trucks and industrial buildings. Um, so there, there's, you know, if, the, if we look at that photo and there were, it was full of residences, I don't think we'd be here um, asking for an appeal, but, but it's really a unique situation that there's one house left surrounded by a sea of asphalt and industrial buildings. And this, it's a, it's a, this type of use is a, is a hard use to place in Davidson County. There aren't a lot of options. And this is, you know, is an ideal street, it seems like, to put it on. So that, that's really the, the hardship is the difficulty to find a location. Um, and I know Stacy looked for a lot, you know, looked for a lot of possible locations and came down to this being one of the best choices, or really almost one of the only choices. So it's, it's, you know, it's really the question is, is a, is the intent of the special exception to deal with the residents that's remaining in a, in a totally industrial neighborhood, or is it really to deal with a situation where you're bordering a, a residential district and you have a lot of homes? Um, and that's, that's, that's sort of the thing I, I struggle with looking at. It just seems like, you know, looking at that, it's, it's no longer a residential neighborhood. And, and that seems to be the exception that it's, that it's a leftover use from a, a um, and, and I think in terms of a hardship from the, for the, from the residential standpoint, you look at, again, you look at that and my guess is that if he were to sell that property, the, the value of selling it for a commercial or industrial use would be a lot higher than the, the rental, rental income he's receiving from that, that property. It's a choice to keep it as a rental property. So what is the hardship? Well, I think it's more the, I think it's more the special exception. I think the hardship is, is the difficulty to find space for this type of use in, in industrial areas. Well, that's pretty it can only be industrial yeah. or farm. And, so, but but yeah. I, think, I think the hardship would have but you would have to be property specific. I think the, I think it's more this. I think it, I don't know if there's necessarily a hardship as compared to a special exception that that the the 
the intent of, and, and Joy, you might, I'm not sure if we haven't talked about this, but the intent of the special exception, again, seems to be geared towards a border condition against a, a, a residential district. And, and the hardship is, a, or not really hardship, yeah. but the special condition, the special unique um, conditions of this one is that, that, that it's no longer a residential district, but it's an industrial district. So it's remaining, some remain, single remaining residential use surrounded by other loud noise making, noise generating right. uses. But, but ironically, yeah. the applicant will be using this as a residence part of the time. So by your calculation, she's just doubled the amount of residents in the neighborhood. <laughs> How many dogs do you plan to have? Uh, I keep between 20 to 25 during the day. And then, like I said, boarding, because I'm not exactly a kennel. It's just it's just a service I provide for my clients. Sometimes I don't have any. Sometimes I just have one. And if I just have one, I'll take them to my house. And sometimes two if they're really good. So I, I don't usually have. The only time I do have more are would be holidays. And that's, but be, I, because I do all the boarding myself, I have a, a cap out, so would, I still wouldn't have like 40 dogs or something. It would still be at the most like eight or ten, depending on the dogs, on which ones. Okay, and then is there, um, I guess the 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 issues that um, that your neighbor had raised that I, I felt like were, sure. uh, I, I think they're all, all good points, and the ones that that were concerning me were the security issues and how do you keep dogs off of uh, off of his property well, and so are there things they're all that you on leashes i mean they have to they have to be on leashes coming and going um the car that he has said is that he provides a space for that you saw in the picture the black one on the left that's actually as far as the the people that own the building that i'm, I'm hoping to rent as far as they they've never given him permission that's actually their property so that's not really his space so that was the concern in his letter was that he would be so close to them, but he's not really supposed to be. So, I mean, I don't mind and I understand because the building has been vacant for three years. I don't blame him for parking there. I would too. But technically, it's not his property, and that that's what he was concerned with, the proximity between his car and the dogs, leashed dogs. I guess that's my point. If he parked on the street or the other side, that's, that's but, not it. But. but I think there, you know, in terms of conditions or whatever, I think there, you know, certainly can be green area provided on, on that site for pets to use on on property there is a requirement that, that our animals are leashed going back and forth um, I mean they're going 10 feet from the car to the door I don't see there being a lot of I mean and they're going to be at, you know in the in a yard all day so I, I don't I, there's not going to be excessive waste and I'm really really I, I, I pick I look out front every day and of course the back is every 15 minutes I use construction grade liners to keep them in it's never been I, I have a petition it should Please be take construction grade liners my, tell me what that means I'm sorry oh they're like the blackout kind of like lawn bags but they so there's never any smell no you're talking about what's happening you're talking when you're cleaning up waste in the back that you're right you're talking about she, okay. ba she bags up way. She just doesn't leave it yeah. sitting out. That, right. That's what I meant. I'm sorry. And then fencing, there's a chain link fence, it looked like, from the photo in the back. Yes. Is that, do you keep that or do you put no. something on the fence? I'm going to replace that. Um, what do you replace it I'm with? I'm replacing it with a six foot. I had somebody come by. I'm getting an estimate for that um, for a six foot high wooden fence. Okay, a solid, a solid so wooden fence. Yes, absolutely solid. So it'll create a sound barrier. Dogs can't get over it. Um, it's. <laughs> it's we learned I've, earlier. I've never had, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I've actually, I mean, I'm, I'm going to, it's going to bring traffic, it's going to bring customers, it's going to bring money. I mean, every, everybody's, I, I really honestly feel everybody's going to benefit from this. Like I said, I've been doing it for six years, and I did it really, really well, and really, really quietly, and really, really stinky free. I mean, I have signatures from from everybody, from all my old neighbors. And Joey, tell me, what are, um, I guess we've talked about this before, but, um, We've been here a long time. I don't remember much now of anything. But what um, if 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 there were dogs or loud noise of any kind? What's the recourse? Is, are there noise ordinances that apply? Yeah, I can grab that. Yes, is the short answer. Noise ordinance applies regardless of whether it's an IWD district or a residential district. That's prosecuted by uh, issuance of a citation and brought to Metro's environmental court. The attorney from the Metro Legal Department who prosecutes cases in that court is completely unreasonable and sticks it to them every time. <laughs> um, I'm there every Wednesday. Um, 
similarly dog off a leash is a violation of dogs running at large statute if the dog is off the property of its owner or the place where it resides um, off a leash and um, off the property off leash or not in the house or pen then it would potentially be subject to a citation for dog running at large whether it be out in the street whether it be in the neighboring property whatever the case may be also subjecting owner or person responsible for a citation whether it be uh, the operator of a, a dog care facility like this or whether it be the owner who shows up lets a dog out of the car and it runs willy-nilly not on a leash again you're potentially subjecting somebody to an environmental court citation so both noise uh, very little known fact you didn't ask but it kind of fits in here there's actually a don't poop in my yard ordinance for your dog oddly specific to dogs not to other genus and species <laughs> which i think would, that makes sense also but um people fail to clean up their pet's waste in somebody else's yard or on another property also potentially sex, uh, subjects them to a citation so there are a lot of remedies in environmental court mm -hmm specific to animals like you're asking but also completely separate and apart from animals noise violations and that's typically just for uh, whatever loud music in your residence but barking dog statute is yet another section of the metro code that's prosecuted on a regular basis in environmental court any other questions we, uh, this is for joy the it's it's supposed to be a hundred feet to the residential property or 200 feet 200 from feet. the it's measured from structure to structure so it's not property specific it's not it's, it's structure it would be easier if it were a property but the council chose structure so what are we what are we talking here well i mean based upon testimony of Ms. smith i think you're approximately 25 feet from the property line and i, I i'm making a, a, a presumption that the building's probably 10 feet from the property line her direction um, so you'd be looking at a 165 foot variance out of 200 out of 200 yes sir. any other questions you know and one one in terms of you know restrictions or whatever one opportunity might be to require them to seal off any openings on that side of the house and to you know insulate provide extra insulation in those walls and possibly even do some type of an acoustical barrier on the fence on that side of the property. I mean, I think those are some things that could help mitigate. I'm fine with that. Uh, mitigate the effects. Whatever whatever you need, I'm, I'm fine with that because I understand. I mean, I'm not unreasonable. Okay, thank you. Thank so, you. so you're going to put up a new fence? I am. I am. And that could be further away from side property than the existing chain link fences um, actually they probably they will because i'm not playing the the where the fence comes in towards the house that he owns that's actually these two weird kind of alleyway runs on the side that i won't be using i'm just using the backyard so, so it actually will be you could go away. straight back from the fence and get right. from the house and get further away mm -hmm. absolutely any other questions all right i'm going to move to close the public hearing discussion Both sides of the issue here have to be cognizant of the concern of the residents next door. Yeah, I, I'm often reminding myself that we're not a board of equity. Uh, so sometimes our uh, decisions appear to be unfair to somebody, but we're not really here to decide fair. Uh, and it's it's a big variance. Uh, and without hardship, I mean, I know that we don't necessarily have to find hardship, but uh, I mean, I have, I have trouble sort of blaming the, the people that are left there for being there. Yeah, distance variances, I think, are the hardship is tough because, you know, that, because, you know, the last distance variance I remember was the sign close to the residence, but the residence was a cemetery, you know, the residential zone. So it was like at the room, you know, and so there was, it basically said it passed the, this really didn't make a whole lot of sense test. And, um, this one's a little harder because 
it is right next door to a home, but it's also on the aerial view, um, you know, across from factories and other kind of, I don't want to say heavy manufacturing, but at least mid, you know, light manufacturing buildings and and that type of thing. So it it it, um, it it seems like the kind of place that you know would support the doggy daycare, but yet I, I don't having it next door is a, is a tough one. Um, yeah, noise. You know, it. I mean, I guess it could be a daycare center. It could be a. It could be it could be many things that would make more noise, but I do am sensitive to that and think that there should be if if this is granted have some of the noise abatement ideas that uh, that Manuel mentioned um, included, um, and I do think that there's ample recourse for any neighbor through through the noise and if it if it is troublesome enough then they can bring it back here and say no they're not I mean this is they're not they're not obeying the law right does it come back here does it go back just goes to environmental court if there are conditions that you put on a grant of a variance and those conditions are violated then it could potentially trigger an action back here at the board if somehow they're not following the terms of their uh, uh, variance granted by this board in a scenario like that. I mean I think we have we've received a lot of testimony that the uh, appellant does run a, a nice quiet business but yet we have legitimate concerns of the person next door and I think that those types of conditions would be important to give the residential neighbor uh, recourse if, if if there was a problem I mean I, I, I don't anticipate if I anticipated a problem I would say we shouldn't do it but the testimony is that we shouldn't anticipate a problem but I think there should be a plan B in case there is I agree. I agree with everything you're saying. I, I don't like problems that there are no solutions to. This one, I don't see any really good solutions to it. But uh, I think there are factors that could be conditions put on this, this property that could uh, avoid the problems for the next door residential property, such as. The new fence high enough, and I don't know if you can't make anything soundproof, but unless you put a roof over, and they can't probably can't even do that. But I don't see a problem with the dog getting loose. That thing, and that's a that's really not a, not a major thing. I think that maybe with some conditions, it'd be worth a try. One of the difficulties with this board is when it's down to four people, it really does make it very difficult in tough cases. David Harper, are you inclined not? I think county knows this. Yes. <laughs> this is what I do on a daily basis. Well, uh, I, I am inclined to vote no, which would immediately mean that they would come back and hopefully for a fuller desk <laughs> and only have to convince one other person. But, and, and that's what I'm not sure that's a terrible result to be to be honest. I, I, I can I could be almost convinced to vote either way on this one. Um, and it is tough with four people and to council's point, I'm not asking anybody to throw over their convictions because I'm not sure that's the worst result in the world to, to get here when there are seven of us. It wouldn't be heard again. Somebody just have to. You just have to have two other people listen to it, right? I mean, well, I mean, I think just one other, really. Yeah. If there's uh, in the event that only four people hear it and there's not four firm votes, we re-advertise and reset the case for a brand new hearing. Right. So, so we next it, available. It could right. be seven of us next time or six of us next time, and because I, I, I fully understand the plurality on this one. You know, I mean, again, it's difficult. I mean, I've always had dogs. I have a dog now. I had two recently, and and when my neighbor's dogs bark. It annoys me. I mean, you know, not not the occasional "Hey, you're home" bark, but 
what the hell is that dog barking at for you know the last five minutes and and I own dogs, you know, and, and I, I can see, and if somebody that doesn't like dogs or has a fear of dogs or, and there's a reason that we have this 100 foot, or I'm sorry, 200 foot thing. I mean, you know, if we were talking 100 foot, I mean, that's a lot harder, but you know, we're talking 20, 30 feet or whatever, that's that's close. I, I agree, and, and the special circumstances that I can find are, that this area is industrial and is making a lot of noise and will these dogs actually be louder than um, it's just the extraordinary nature of where the property sits that does not in any way say that there's not a residence next door I mean so I agree but I don't think the uh, property next door residence should be penalized because it happens to be an abundance of industrial things around there I think that like the appellant assistant said a few minutes ago, that opens the door for other uses for that property in the future. But I don't think, I don't certainly have the courage to say to him, you need to get out of the house business and get into the industrial business over there. I Nor do I. I mean, wouldn't even suggest that, but uh, that's a tough well, call. Well, we. we it's, it's quite, it is quite an. Joey, would. If we, uh, <coughs> is there is there any remedy around voting up or down? Uh, if we deferred and someone reviewed the record, could they vote on it at the next meeting? Could we all vote on it at the next meeting? Yes. If you defer now. If we defer the case, then people who aren't here, the, the three people that aren't here, uh, could review the case and could vote on it without us having to rehear it well, and re-advertise and represent the case. And if, if, if it were going to go to another hearing, meaning it didn't get four votes here, that would be in the appellant's best interest because that would be the fastest. I, I'm thinking it would yeah. since right. it have to I be re-advertised and they'd have if to it, represent. If it has to be reheard and, and, and the appellant has said that, you know, that, that her business is closed now and so time is of the essence for her, so this would be the if if we, if it had to be heard again, our deferral would be quicker. the quickest way for it to be heard again. Is, is that, that correct, Joy? Yeah. And when asked if they had discussed the issue between the opposition and the appellant, like they, they definitely had they email testified to that. Yes. Well, and it also gives them a chance to discuss some of the issues that were brought up. Insulation. I don't know if it has been discussed or whatever, but that's always a plus. But worst case scenario, uh, if, if it doesn't get four votes, it, it has to be resubmitted and it takes longer. Uh, it seems like a slightly better scenario is that more people can vote uh, and potentially they have another opportunity to talk and come to an agreement and further swing the vote for those of us on the dog events. So, so you were saying deferral to give I, them the opportunity? I to think I think that's the best because I don't see it passing, and I just think it's going to prolong the opportunity to get approved. I, I, yeah, because you're you're not inclined to vote for it. You're on the fence. We're inclined to vote maybe yes with pretty defined conditions, so it doesn't look like it's going to. Yeah, go and that as way. far as can, I mean, it would. It's <coughs> always preferable to me if the conditions are brought from yes the involved parties. Like, hey, we think we can live with this. Uh, I just think seven voices on this is going to do better than four, even if it causes delay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to make a motion to defer for the next two, two weeks. weeks and bring it back second on the agenda. Does, does that work, Joy? Certainly. Yeah, it's your your discretion. Okay. I'll, I'll second. second. Got a motion. Got a second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, 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 we defer, come back in two weeks. Uh, you'll be second on the agenda. Okay, last case. <laughs> Who deserved medals just for. I need a two, two minute break. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay, next case, you can come forward. I think we have two more. I'm sorry? I think we have two more cases.
Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, yeah, I'm sorry, didn't mean to yell. Yeah. Um, I got an issue with the deferral. That the, the opposition, <laughs> the opposition son is getting married that weekend and will not be able to attend on that Thursday. I can we can do to July third and the appellant. Okay. If you don't mind talk to if y'all are agreeable, we'll be fine with it. This one that I pitched a fit over that I'm sad I did and the last one had Maybe they can work it out before they come back and Actually, be on the consent agenda. I'm the engineer on both cases, so and we can hopefully keep them both short for y'all sake and ours. Okay. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Um uh, for the brief moment we are in recess. 41. Uh, yeah, just two seconds. Chairman of the board will uh, stand in a temporary recess since we only have three members. We have 41 and we have... As soon as Mr. King returns, we'll get started. 44. Oh, I thought 41 was on the consent. The uh, next case is case 2014 I've lost my spot. Uh, 41. Uh, Wendy Williams is the appellant owner of the property located at 1601 Fifth Avenue North requesting a variance in the required rear setback for parcel 5 in the R6 UZO district. Uh, they are combining two parcels and re-subdividing, um, actually combining three parcels and re-subdividing the lots, which would necessitate a rear setback on parcel 5. The appellant has alleged the board would have jurisdiction under section 1740-180, item B. Uh, applicant's present. Is there any parties uh, present opposed to case 41? Okay, seeing none. The, um, sir, you'll have 10 minutes when your time comes up. The uh, subject property actually deals with these three parcels, these two tracks and this track with the red roof building on it. The requests are to re-subdivide Sorry, I had video mute upon. Uh, again, there we are. The um, again, the uh, nature request deals with these three parcels here. The request is to resubdivide those three parcels to create a uh, more conforming lot on lot three, which you see here. Parcel five uh, currently has a two-level covered deck on the back of the existing home, uh, which this is where the variance is being created by this resubdivision of the lot. So it will be six feet at its closest point to the proposed new property line. This is looking at the uh, subject property from South Fifth Street, or Fifth Avenue North, excuse me. And then a view of the opposite corners, uh, corner opposite there, the adjoining parcel north, and then a view across Hume Street. This is Hume running this way. That's the view across from the subject lot on Hume. And then this is the uh, proposed creation of the new lot here, and the variance would be located on this two-level deck here. Okay, I'll leave that uh, photograph up. Or go, actually, I'll go back to the site plan if we can refer back to that picture if you need it. Uh, with that, I'll turn the uh, case over to you, sir. If you would, please identify yourself and make your presentation. You'll have 10 minutes uh, to present your testimony. I'm Jesse Walker. I'm the engineer on this project and, and the surveyor. And what we set out to do was take parcel four, which is a very non-conforming lot, uh, and tried to turn it into a conforming lot by taking part of parcel five and part of parcel 51 and adding those into parcel four. Uh, and basically what happened is by the time we got to the point of dedicating along the alley, dedicating a little out in the front, getting five feet off of the existing structure with parcel 51, the only way we could end up with 6,000 square feet, which was our goal, was to turn three lot three into a conforming lot. The only way we could end up with 6,000 square feet was with the property line as we proposed it between lot two and lot three. And that, in, in and of itself, that is what has turned and imposed this into a choice between tearing down a very nice two-story deck, which the owners clearly don't want to do, or offering, which we have done, offering to provide an equivalent setback of the entire amount that it would be even if we did shift the line over to where it was 20 feet off of that deck. We felt like that was a reasonable concession for us to be making. So 
although I understand uh, your concerns over the fact of whether this is self-imposed or not, I would argue that given our original objective, which was to turn this into a conforming lot, uh, it's sort of been imposed on us by the size and shape and the arrangement of the existing house on the lot and so on. Uh, the other alternative for us would be we could still make this lot three into a better lot but we have no way to get 12,000 square feet and meet the setback requirements for the existing structure there thereby creating two lots lot one which already conforms and lot two which already conforms and then lot three which would conform uh, so as a concession for that you know, we've offered to give the full setback, which would be 20 feet from the rear of the two foot deck and a five foot setback on the side of lot three by voluntarily shifting that line over there. And other than that, if if this doesn't go forward, the owners have, in, in my view, two opinion or two possible options. Option one, obviously, is to tear the deck down and let this plat be approved as it is. Actually, the plat's been approved subject to action by y'all. Uh, or removal of the deck. Uh, the other alternative they would have would be to come back to you and shift the lot line between lot two and lot three over into a manner where it would give the 20 foot setback, but it would turn lot three into about a 5,000 square foot lot. And so if we tried to do, if we tried to do that per se and meet the setback requirement for the dual deck, we would still have to come to this board and ask you to give us pr approval to have created a bigger but still non-conforming lot. So we, we need to come to you either way or not do a subdivision at all. So um, maybe we needed to have been here for that one instead of this one. <laughs> but but it, 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 in either case, we've attempted to come up with something that would be an amenable plan with y'all that would meet the intent of this setback and still allow us to turn three into a completely conforming lot. So planning's approved the subdivision just to, with us, contingent on us granting the variance? Yes. Okay. And if y'all don't grant the variance, we can still go to them and tear the deck off, which I don't think the owners are likely to do even in that situation, to be quite honest, or at least that's been their position with me up to this point. And so. is it the same owner that owns all that property? Yes. And it's not Wendy Williams, just for the record, by the way. So that that re, that remained from the original subdivision application when Wendy Williams did own this. But actually, the the owners, when it when it was applied, it was put down that way. It's just in in the paperwork here. It's not the way it really is. But, so mere technicality, I think. It, and is, that's all I got. Is there opposition to this? No. No. Have you heard from any neighbors or? No, we've had we've had no comments that that we're aware of. We're on the consent agenda. I believe Mr. Taylor was concerned about this, and I and I justifiably understand his concern. Well, I, and I am sorry you had to wait. Uh, that's this, okay. This amount of time. Actually, I, I, I'm representing the other thing, so I was going to have to stay here either way. Well, if you, yeah, you might as well get two for one if you <laughs> have to stay the whole meeting, right? That's right. Yeah, and that, and that was that was a concern. I mean, it, it, when I see stuff like this, it looks like, well, is this, you know, are you asking? It, it does it does seem um, very much self-imposed, but at the same time, it's gone through the planning commission and some other. Um, right. It's gone through a process that's evaluated it uh, in addition to us and. Right. Uh, and actually, till we got to the final final thing where we had dedicated a little alley and done a little of this and that, we we never were in non-compliance until right at the very end, you know. And then it was like, okay. So, All right. any other questions? I'm going to move to close the public hearing and start discussion. And I'm, I'm okay with. Are, are, are we finding a hardship on this one? Yes, we are. Uh, I'm going to make a motion that the board approve the variance because all of the requirements of MCL 17.40.370 have been met. The board finds that the unique characteristics of the property are the exceptional condition of such property would result in peculiar and exceptional practical difficulties to or exceptional or undue hardship upon the owner if we did not grant the variance. 
second. Got a second. Got a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Guys, give me one second to catch up to you all. Man, were you able to reach you. you again. Me again. I'm going to let him talk this time. Okay. Whew, if I can stay awake. <laughs> the um, last case for today's agenda is case 2014-44. You see the uh, subject properties located. Uh, this is Mr. Mark Hayes, the appellant, Mary Bates, the treasurer, um, trustee, excuse me, owner of the property located at 5616 Morrow Road, requesting a variance in street setback in R6 EZO to construct a new uh it says two-story single-family residence. I'll let the applicant describe the home. It, um, he describes it more of a story and a half. Uh, refer to the board under Section 1712.020. The applicant has alleged the board would have jurisdiction under Section 1740.180 item B. Um, single-family residence. The um, each side will have 15 minutes. We do have opposition present, and I do. I want to thank them for hanging around uh, for the full time. So, were you able to reach who you need to reach, ma'am? Oh, okay. Um, yes, ma'am. She needed to make a phone call, and I was not going to let you guys start without her being here. So she sat here all day. The um, subject property you see here is the triangle-shaped lot located here between Tennessee and Kentucky Avenues on the east side of Moore Road, just south of Alley 1207. The um, nature of the request, because Moore Road is classified as a collector street, a minimum setback in, for this zone district is 40 feet off the front. Uh, a 40 foot setback, the applicant's proposing a 20 foot setback, which you see here. Obviously, you see these, these other homes along that stretch of Morrow Road are illegally non conforming to setback, as you see the distances there. This is the subject lot of the property in question. You see the alley to the rear, and this is Morrow Road in this location, and those homes adjoining. And then views across the alleyway of the homes and the setbacks of those. And then looking west, uh, excuse me, east on Morrow back toward uh, White Bridge Road. Back this way. That's White Bridge Road. I'm going to leave that up there. This is, uh, with that, I'll turn the case over to you, gentlemen. Uh, if you would please identify yourselves and make your presentation. I'm Mark Hayes, and uh, for the record, I am actually the owner of the property as All well. Right. Um, so, uh, Mary Bates was the former owner. Um, so, yeah, I mean, basically, and I'll, I, if I can pass around this site plan with a little highlight, um, it's showing if with the current 40 foot setback, that's the size home I could build, which is 212 square feet. Uh, so, um, just considering, so I'm only asking for 20 feet. Um, especially considering the homes next door, as you see on the site plan, being so close to the property lines. Um, so the hardship is the uh, irregular shaped lot, just being a triangle lot, and as well as uh, the drainage ditch. Um, Stormwater has told me I had to be eight and a half feet off the top of the bank um, as far as uh, a setback on that. Uh, right side there if you're looking at the site plan and um, you know uh, building coverage ratio um, to the lot size is just a little over 20 percent uh, so I'm building a modest home it's uh, um, I do have the plans here too uh, it's a one and a half story I didn't want to build a two-story full two-story home because it didn't really fit what the homes next to it and across the street, you know, I, I thought that that would kind of stick out. So, one and a half story home, uh, it's 1426 square feet when you include the the half story upstairs uh, is what my plans plans would be. Do you have anything to add? I'm, a, I'm the engineer and surveyor. If you got any questions, I'm I'm here for that. You note on on there there are numerous items that are uh, adjacent houses. If you notice over on the left side, there's a house that's 15 feet off of Moreau um, that comes off of that side street there. That's about a 15 feet off setback. Of course, the house next door to us has has got about a two or three foot setback on the front. 
then it gradually gets better as you start going around Kentucky. But we do have a lot of precedent. And then in the upper part between Tennessee and the alley, you actually have two sheds in the back that are almost sitting on the property line. And then that next house up there, that's really not a front setback, so it doesn't really apply as such. But there's a lot of stuff that's really close, tied in on the road right in that area. Do, uh, are you planning on cutting down any of the trees or? In the front there? Yeah, it looked um, like they were on the road. No, I was just going to trim them uh, as needed to give a little visibility. Um, trying to get a handle on what the what this means on the... So those for, those trees are... Are they pretty close to the right of way there? Yeah, they all yeah. sit within the 20-foot setback, I believe, actually. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, maybe we'll hear from the opposition, and you've got 12 minutes and 34 seconds for rebuttal. Hi, my name is Shemaine Williams. I live at the property of 5614 Demara Road. Ms. Williams, is this your lot right here on the screen? Is this you? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, when I <clears throat> first looked at the house, they told me that I couldn't buy the land next to it because it had mercury on it. Could nothing be built there. And um, in 2010, we had a flood. And everything is coming from Tennessee to my property, from Kentucky to my property. Nothing but rainwater. And we have a creek right there. Once that creek gets filled, everything comes over my property. So if they build some there with the mercury up under there, Everything's still going to come to my property, and that's more money for me to dish out to. Who told you that you couldn't buy that lot because of mercury? Uh, the people that uh, I uh, got the house through, the mortgage people. That's the only reason why I got the house that I'm in now, because I have one neighbor and could nothing else get right there. Hmm. Not sure how to respond to that one. I, I, uh, <laughs> no, that's, an, that's another first that we yeah, had not heard sure. today's the day of the... Not sure I can speak intelligently to that one. Things we just <laughs> never heard before. <laughs> My, my, my name is Frank Eason. My main concern about the whole issue is flooding. Every time the neighbor who owned that property at first, she used to keep storage buildings over there. So when she had one over there, all the water when it rained would come to our property. Now it's gonna be the same way if you build a foundation now. The way that alley made, you seen it flat, but really have dips in it. And all the water runs down to this water line here right between our house and the house they talking about building. Well, our house sit up about two inches higher than that land. When you build, you have to make a driveway. That driveway is gonna make that water come down to our house with no problem, it's gonna come. That's reason they made her take all the storage out of there and she sold it. So, so your main concern is, is water is water runoff and that's something we can ask the engineer and have you talked with with the property owner and engineer about that? I have, just like I talked to the lady before who she owned it. Everybody talking about, well, I built a wall there. I, I said, well, I tried to. The city told me I couldn't. They saying the same thing. Well, we can build a wall and run that. No, you can't, because the city gonna tell you you can't. Is that, we, we got a lot of the folks that, <laughs> from the city that could tell us here, right? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, they're going to go through 
office management review committee hearing as well for something like that. If those guys say no, they say no. If they say yes, they say yes. But see, my main issue is when they did the creek, when the creek was already there, they put the wall up there. Everything is coming like this. Every time it rained, I had to go out there and rake my creek, I mean rake my drain out so it won't fill up my yard. Yeah. Ma'am, just so, both of you, just so we don't disappoint you here, um, I mean, and, and I'm really not being evasive here, we're the zoning appeals board and Metro has a bunch of departments. I don't know who handles Mercury. <laughs> I, I, I got no clue on that one, so I'm gonna plead ignorant. And then stormwater's not us either. There's a stormwater committee, but I do believe if they get, if they're granted and if they try to get a permit, they're gonna have to go through stormwater. But we're not those guys, you know. Okay. We, we just decide zoning and do they deserve a variance or not. So, it, yeah, if, if we vote to approve the variance, it doesn't mean that they get to go build a house now. Okay. They, they, they still have to go through the, the permitting process and stormwater has to say you're not going to flood your neighbor and we agree that it looks right and whatever else the people at codes tell you or, you know when you try to get your permit and they have to go through each of those checks uh, so and just if we approve this it, it by no means says they can start building it tomorrow well, that and it means we're not ignoring your issues Absolutely. we're just not the guys who rule on your issues because I, again, Mercury is a big bad deal. I don't know about it. Stormwater, I've got some experience with. Stormwater committee is a tough one. We're just not those guys. So, and we're sorry you had to wait so long <laughs> to get to this part of the conversation. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, any other questions for the opposition? How so, long have you lived in your house? Uh, uh, a week before Thanksgiving, it'd be 18 years. Do you remember the old Whitson Lumber Company up on California in 57? Yeah. Yes. Fine people. <laughs> I like those guys. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, did, did you say there, there, there was some storage structures, or people just stored stuff on they, this property before? They stored stuff on it for a little while, but it caused a problem, and they moved them away. Okay. But it wasn't like a building that was there? No, it wasn't a building. Okay. It was just like, um, you know what I'm trading, like you get off an 18-wheel right. or something like that? Right. Okay. But when they left them there, you can see if a house was there, how that water would actually run. And it was like one here, one here, one here, and then when that water come down, there's literally nowhere for it to go but in our yard. Well, we are all, especially codes, sympathetic to... Uh, Flood yeah, uh, the shock. is not uh, that deep, right? And that is how that works, right? They, if, if they would, as part of their building permit process, uh, the flood plain department at Stormwater has to review their plans to comply with the stormwater regulations. Those regulations are, are much tighter now after the 2010 the flood than they used yeah, to be. So, so they are that flood plain? Is yes. that something that? No, it's not. Well, the, the flood on, the, on their permit, and, and that's something the applicant needs to address on rebuttal, but we track the floodplain office to make certain that they comply with stormwater's regs as part of the building permit. Yeah, and I guess it, it, it'll it'll go through the regulations, but is that that's not something that they would notify the neighbors about. So no. is there a way to <coughs> is there a way to basically make sure that the neighbors have their voice heard on the stormwater sure. approval process? And, sure, and 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 my advice to you is to con it, over in the building next door where we um, where the permit office is, the stormwater department has an outlet inside our office. Come talk to them about your concerns of this process. That um, I don't know if their particular proposal requires a, a committee hearing like this one does, but it, residents can always go talk to the stormwater engineers about concerns about flooding and, and, and things on side property that, you know, that might be occurring next door to you as a part of their review of this. Sure, absolutely. You can come down and talk to them. Any other questions for the opposition? No, thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. 
uh, as as indicated by our eight and a half foot buffer there, we've already had preliminary discussion with Stormwater about this. That's that's how far along we had gotten to the point that they had sized the creek, asked me to go out there and do an as built of it. The lines you see there represent an actual field as built of that and it's not a creek it's a ditch it's not a blue water creek or anything it's not something that carries water at all times and i, I do i do understand her and concerns and invite her to put them on notice because we fully intend to comply with the stormwater regulations anyway and as indicated by the fact that we've already got stormwater stuff indicated on the plan we've already been discussing with them and so on have you heard any any word or comment about the mercury? Situation? Just today from them. It's the first, first comment we'd heard about it. In, in our documentation, when the lot was bought and stuff, nothing ever came up about it whatsoever. So um, so I'm not sure who told her that or, or what, that, what that was about. Any other questions? Then I'm going to move to close the public hearing, start discussion. Well, I know the the mercury and really the storm sewer or the storm water really isn't a, an issue other than the, the hardship that that setback would cause, which I, I would acknowledge. Although the mercury thing has been let out of the bag now, so it's on record, so somebody's got to check into it. But I guess that's about all we can do about it at the moment. But I really don't, I mean, given the the shape of the lot. I mean, I think they have grounds for the, the variance. I just uh, hope that, as I told uh, Ms. Williams, that everything is checked out along the way because we, we are all still suffering a little flood shock, I think. I, I know I was up in the middle of the night last night because <laughs> it was raining. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I think the, the variance that is, is reasonable, especially given uh, where the neighboring houses are and I think that's in the shape of the lot. Right. And I do think that, uh, I hope that the neighbors will go through the other agencies to address those concerns, which are really, I think, very serious and, and need to be addressed before something happens. But there is an outlet for it. And but just in terms of you know, what we're looking at today is just the placement of the house, where the house would be placed. And I think it's it's... <clears throat> It's a reasonable request on that regard. Mr. Chairman, can I also add, I, I just briefly, as there, all the parties step back, I, I'd recommended and the builder and the engineer are agreeable, the four of them all go talk to Stormwater together as a group and kind of get one on one table and look at it and their concerns too. I, I think that's a great idea. I'd like to move that the board approve the variance because all the requirements of MCL 17.40.370 have been met. The board finds that the unique characteristics of the property are both the odd shape of the lot and then the uh, wet water area. Um, so that's a motion. Is there a second? Do we need to put a footnote to that, that the requirement that they go together to... I am certainly amenable to that. So yes, let's amend for that. Okay. So as amended, we've got a motion. Have we got a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Any opposed? We are in recess. Congratulations. Thank you. Adjourned for today. Thank you.